Ladies and gentlemen, I will ask you to please all take your seats so we can begin. I would like to welcome everyone here and to start the day, I would like to invite Elder Ernest Arcan of the Alexander First Nation to come up and deliver an opening prayer. As he makes his way to the podium, I would like to ask our guests not to take any images or recordings during the blessing, please. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank Elder Ernest Arcand. Um, that, for being part of the smudge ceremony, uh, it meant a lot, and I very much appreciate it. And I think it's a very important message uh, that we can all take to heart to have open eyes, an open mind, open ears, and an open heart. It's a, it's a powerful ceremony, and it's part of the reason why we're here today. So again, thank you, uh, Elder Ernest Arcan. I would like to acknowledge that we convene on the traditional lands of Alexander First Nation, and more broadly on Treaty 6, which is also home of the members of the Métis Nation of Alberta, Inuit, and non-status Indigenous peoples. We recognize the long history and contributions the Indigenous peoples who have cared for this land from time immemorial to present. We are committed in the spirit of truth and reconciliation to working collaboratively to steward the land we share as we plan for a future for all citizens. And we acknowledge that we are all treaty people, bound to one another by the spirit and intent of treaty, as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the river flows. My name is Doug Griffiths. I'm going to be your MC today. Uh, some of you may have known me from previous lives when I was an MLA or Minister of Municipal Affairs. I just want to indicate that I have been through rehab. I am fully recovered. So I'm not talking politics today, at least not up here, maybe in the, by the coffee maker, catch me. We can chat. Um, I, I have worked uh, with municipalities now for 25 years. We have... Um, and then you may also know me from writing 13 Ways to Kill Your Community, which is not about how to kill your community. It's about the attitudes we have that sabotage our own success. And I always get asked, whenever I, wherever I am in North America, speaking or working with communities, which one do you think is the most important? Which one is the one way to most actively kill your community? And I have chosen different chapters over the years. But for the last several years, I have pointed out that the chapter Don't Cooperate is one of the best ways for communities uh, to sabotage their own success. And so I am incredibly excited to be here because as I traveled around North America, I have seen that regions, communities, municipalities that work together collaboratively to lift each other up, make themselves more competitive, make themselves more robust, and are able to compete with the rest of the world. And they're successful. But communities that do not, that think that those boundaries that separate us, that sometimes were drawn 100 or 120 years ago, we act like they are, are, are walls that were put up to separate us from our enemies. And the enemies are across those lines. Those regions, those communities, those municipalities are suffering and dying because they don't recognize that the world has changed and their cooperation and collaboration is how to adapt and change best because it gives them the economies of scale and the opportunities to capture all of those opportunities. So, a few housekeeping items. Uh, the washrooms are just outside. Um, a reminder today, please, that this session is not being live streamed, but it is being recorded, and the recording will be posted on the website following today's session. And also, a photographer will be circulating, as you've seen, um, and we will send participants a link to the photos after the event, so you'll have, be able to have a chance to look at them. And because social media is so big, no matter where you go, please remember if you're using Instagram or Facebook and you're posting pictures, please use the hashtags YEGmetro, hashtag YEGmetro, or hashtag Our Region, Our Future, so that people can, can locate um, our communications quickly. Now, I am going to invite three different people up to bring greetings and welcomings, and I'm going to start uh, with Mayor Choi. Now, some of you, as I introduce you, you're welcome to come up. Um, I, some of you know that uh, Mayor Choi is an entrepreneur and a third-generation operator, uh, owner of Bing's number one restaurant. It's been operating in Stony Point since 1970, but Mayor Choi 
uh, while operating that, became very interested in the future of the community and worked diligently on a number of initiatives to make his community stronger. Through that, he became mayor. He's been mayor of Stony Plain for four terms. He's one of the longest serving board members on this committee. He's been the board chair since September 2020, and he is a regional champion time and again, and it's been evidenced by the evolution of the Tri-City collaborations and partnerships that have been undertaken. So please, Mayor Choi. Thank you, Doug, and I appreciate that, and definitely you'll be getting my $100 later on today. So good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, as Doug mentioned, my name is William, and I am the proud mayor and, and the great owner of a restaurant in Town Stony Plain. Today, you know what, I am excited to see so many people here, but I'm also a little bit frightened. Frightened, you ask? 100%. You know, when I see you on the Hollywood squares or the Zoom calls and meetings that we have, we're all the same size. But in person, I realize how short I am compared to the rest of most of you. So that is why I'm a little bit frightened today. Right. Again, thank you, Elder, for, for the prayer and the smudge. And uh, welcome, Grand Chief um, George Aiken, Jr. Thank you very much, and definitely members of the First Nation. As you know, uh, you guys had calendar invites for this event way back in January. Yes, it was a good idea to get together right after the election so that we all get together and, and kind of get know who we are in terms of a regional family. However, that was not the case. As we all know, we've been dealing with an event for the last two years. I'm not going to name the event. I think maybe it'll go away if we don't uh, name it. But we are here today. We're here to look at some of the critical issues that are facing us as a region. Right? How do we view them through our municipal lens? We all know that we have potential as 13 individual municipalities. But what does it mean when we work together as one? We are in a unique position to be able to seize all the opportunities of each municipality and tackle those challenges that we face as a region. There is strength in number. It was proved yesterday. Mayor Young, I think, and Mayor, a couple other people were at uh, the announcement of the 65th interchange. That is a direct result of us hunting together as a pact. Not as 13 individual municipalities fighting one another for the dollars, but that was us 13 individual municipalities working as one to fight for what was best for the region. So with that, congratulations, Mayor Young. <laughs> right. And we have power. Within our 13 municipalities, we represent one-third of our Alberta's population. And we also contribute nearly $105 billion to the province's GDP. That makes the Edmonton metro region the fifth largest economy in Canada. Let that sink in. Edmonton area is the fifth largest economy in Canada. Right. That says a lot. That says that we know what we're doing and how we're doing it is correct. It's slow, it's thought out, it's purposeful, and it's by design. Right? When you look at some of the massive regions that are out there, such as you know, Toronto, Seattle, San Francisco, Austin, to name a few, those things did not happen by accident. It took years of planning, years of give and take. Sometimes you have to give a little more than you take. But it's always with a thought of making the region better. Not for me, but for us. Our residents do not see the borders that we have. I've said this many times. Stony Plain residents do not drive into Spruce Grove and get shocked because there's no electric fence there. Right? 
They will go ahead and use those services in Spruce Grove, Parkland County, Edmonton, the surrounding communities, because our residents will go where the services are offered, where the amenities are, and where the families are. That's how we have to think, too, as municipalities. Not just for ourselves, but what about the larger family, the regional family? It is complicated, it is difficult, and we will get our hands dirty. Some feelings may be hurt, but just to realize we're coming to a point where we need to be able to share those things openly with each other, talk about them, and resolve them, and then build our legacy. Our legacy of this region, one of the fastest growing regions in Canada. A collective effort to unlock the full potential of the Edmonton metro region. So on that, I wish you a great day. Please keep an open mind, listen, hear, and never be afraid to share your thoughts because that's what makes us stronger. We are stronger together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, never be afraid. Next up, I would like to introduce uh, Grand Chief Arkan Arkan Jr. Um, now, uh, this gentleman has a very extensive resume um, as Grand Chief of the Confederacy of Treaty 6 since January 2022, a Chief Alexander First Nation since September 2020, a former CEO of Fort Mackay First Nation where he engaged with industry leaders and helped put the community to capitalize on their economic opportunities. He worked with the federal government as the regional director general and served as the community development officer for Alexander First Nation in the 1980s. And he also is a staunch advocate um, for housing issues, for homelessness, for more programs and services for all citizens, for economic opportunities and for environmental issues. I would like to welcome up Grand Chief George Arcand Jr. Good morning, everyone. I, I just want to make it clear. Our elder and the things he says are not reflective of what Alexander <laughs> is promoting. I want to, uh, first of all, thank Ernest for uh, the opening prayer. It's. Uh, in, in our communities, it becomes really important for us to begin things in the right way. And it always doesn't work that way, but we try. Uh, try to do that every day for recognize the blessings we do have, but uh, really work towards uh, having resolve around finding and dealing with the issues that we need to on a daily basis. So it always helps to recognize that uh, we have the ability uh, through ceremony sometimes to make sure that we're forced to make decisions so it helps us move things along at sometimes a little bit easier but not all the time and and uh, but it's something we can rely on and something we respect and thank you uh, for sharing that today Ernest and thank you for doing that uh, for all the participants here as the Grand Chief of the Confederacy of Treaty 6, I want to take this opportunity to recognize that we are gathered on Treaty 6 territory. And as Chief of Alexander First Nation, I want to extend a special welcome to all the guests gathered here today. Mournville is our closest neighbor, and it's special to have this event here in our backyard. It's special because in Alexander, we are working hard to become part of the fabric of the region. And when we talk about being part of the region, inclusion becomes the biggest tool that we require to make that happen. I had an opportunity to be here during the inauguration of the town of Mournville's mayoral, mayoral 
event, and um, it is an honor for us to be here, uh, to recognize and uh, to be recognized, and also to send our greetings and support for the leadership of Mournville. Those events, while they're small, become the conduit for us to make the change we need to make, the inclusion, the activities that happen. The Confederacy of Treaty 6 right now is entering into a, a, um, new agreements and refreshing um, new agreements with the City of Edmonton, uh, the region in terms of some economic opportunity, which I'll talk about later today. But those kinds of uh, conduits are the change that will make all of us I think and ensure that our lives are better in our region. We've got to think that the region is not just the people who visit, it's not just the people who are here now, but it's for the people who've been here before us and the people who are gonna be here in the future so that we always keep in mind that we're here just to make things better for the people in the future, our children, your grandchildren. And if we think like that, we'll have the ability to ensure uh, that we're leaving a good road and a good track for everyone to follow. So I wanna welcome all the members of the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Board Today is going to be a great day for building relationships and getting to know our neighbors just a little bit better. Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grand Chief Archon. That, those were inspiring words. We are building a road and a pathway for future generations. Thank you so much. And finally, I would like to introduce uh, Mayor Borsma who is the mayor of Morinville here. Um, some of you have known that he's participated extensively within his community, being president of the Morinville Chamber of Commerce, uh, past president for five years, a member of the Sturgeon County Economic Development Advisory Board. He has been assistant district, district governor for Rotary 5370, as well as the past president of the Rotary Club here in Morinville, and president of the Modular Housing Association. All will also being partner and chief operating officer of Pleasant Homes and now serves as mayor, I would like to welcome up our host for today, Mayor Borsma. Thank you, Doug. Um, I still remember <clears throat> when you first came to speak to us at the Legion here. I uh, appreciated that time. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of my council colleagues, um, I thank you for joining here. And I would, first of all, ask for my council colleagues to stand up and uh, acknowledge, uh, let you be acknowledged. I think it's important that we acknowledge uh, the people that make us great. And uh, it's what we do here in Mournville. And as a team, we want to move forward. So thank you. I also want to thank you for coming to Mournville. I know you came from different ways. I've heard some people say they came through 642, they came Highway 2, or they came from the back way from 28. And uh, we have an amazing community right here. And um, I want to welcome the region to our town. Also want to acknowledge that we are meeting on Treaty 6 territory. I want you to understand that Mournville is dedicated to the spirit of Treaty 6 and is honored and it is respected. Our council is proud of the relationship that we've created. We are committed to strengthening our relationship with Alexander First Nation and other regional partners and you'll see that throughout our years. Participation of all chiefs, 
mayors and councillors with us today speaks volumes to the collaboration of this region. As you came in, I hope that each one of you grabbed a beverage. We have a special partner that brought those in today, and that is Nourish, and they're downtown. If anyone wants to ever come into town for a ride, um, grab one from Nourish. And um, so they're a local business, and it certainly is gonna help kickstart the day. Please feel free, to, like I said, to stop by any time. It's energizing to see so many gather to learn more from each other and to explore new opportunities. And also, we need to understand that as we learn, we're also creating long life friendships. For me personally, it has been a steep learning curve. These last six or seven months, and one of the biggest learnings I've had is just how important EMRB is to our communities. It creates endless possibilities. And how important it is for each community to be successful because of EMRB. Regional thinking allows us to explore cost-effective opportunities to benefit our taxpayers. Residents do not always see borders, as Mayor Choi so well said earlier. Working with the EMRB and local municipalities, it has provided new and diverse ways to work together. I want to thank our team in Mournville. I know there's a lot of background work that has happened here, and I want to thank each one of them for putting this together. I want to thank all the administration at the EMRB office for putting this together. And again, thank you. And I'm looking forward to a great day today. So with that, I can't wait to get started. Thank you. Now, to begin, um, it's important that we all understand this, as our introductory speaker said, that in order to know where we're going to, it is very important to understand where we've come from. We are building a legacy for generations to come, but we also, from this day, are building upon a legacy of hard work from a lot of people within the region to get to this point. It doesn't happen magically, and it does not happen overnight. So I would invite you to now join us to watch a video about the region's road to success. If history tells us anything, it's that by working together, we are better positioned to seize opportunities and address the challenges of a growing and integrated region. Municipal growth management boards are well understood to be an effective way to position regions like ours. We have a long history of intermunicipal collaboration, and our journey began when we started seeing massive uncoordinated growth caused by the oil boom. The region's leaders came together to form the first Voluntary Planning Commission. Established with the best of intentions, it was not binding and therefore lacked authority. The McNally Commission determines that the piecemeal pattern of development is inappropriate. The first mandatory regional planning body is born and restructured to focus more on the Edmonton metro region. The province dissolves the commissions and transfers all planning authority back to individual municipalities. With no organized planning effort, there is a gap in the regional planning policy, resulting in considerable uncertainty and a period of uncoordinated growth. This led many of the past members of the Edmonton Metro Planning Commission to form a voluntary intermunicipal agency, which became the Alberta Capital Region Alliance. Mounting evidence suggests that a provincially mandated regional approach to planning may be needed, prompting the province to commission two independent reports. Both reports conclude that strengthening the region is not a choice, but a necessity. Premier Stelmack establishes the mandatory Capital Region Board to develop a long-term integrated growth management plan. The Capital Region Board delivers its award-winning updated regional growth plan. The province reduces the number of members from 24 to 13, and the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Board emerged. Our 
region is home to 1.4 million people who live in 13 closely connected municipalities. We are among the youngest and fastest growing regions in all of Canada and are expected to nearly double our population by 2044. The EMRB's collaborative approach sets the stage for developing strong and vibrant communities, for leveraging collaborative expertise and economies of scale, for ensuring sustainable agricultural development and the ability to connect virtually, for creating a network to move goods, services, and people within and beyond our borders, and for attracting talent and investment to ensure our prosperity. With more than 2 million people counting on us, the EMRB has a vital role to play in planning for future generations. Thank you very much. That was an amazing historical video. And now it's time to talk a bit about the future and about the current situation. So look, uh, this region is incredibly diverse. A lot of people seem to think that working together means that we lose our identity, we lose our uniqueness because we all have to be identical. In fact, it's the opposite of that. What makes regions around the world successful economically to attract new people is the diversity that they celebrate between the different communities, but still working together to work on that attraction uh, to bring people together. It makes us stronger. And I know it's, it's hard to work together sometimes, and it's especially difficult to work together and to collaborate if we don't take the time to learn about what's important to each of us, where our strengths are, what challenges we have, and what each of our visions for the region are. Each board member and the Grand Chief will address the full group in smaller groups and deliver a presentation with insights on their respective local realities and priorities now. We often think we know our neighbors. We take for granted that we understand where they're coming from and what is important to them, as well as the challenges they're facing without actually asking them or truly listening to what they have to say. These presentations will foster a better understanding of each other at a regional level and develop an appreciation for each other's realities, our priorities, and our challenges. This will help us to understand where our opportunities might be and how we can use our collective strengths to advance the prosperity and quality of life for all of our residents. And that's what this is about. It's not about titles, it's not about egos, it's not about our small groups, it's about our collective residents and making sure that we leave a legacy of prosperity for generations to come. Now I'm going to invite board members up in small groups. The first two groups will be three each and they will be doing a presentation that, and I'm, I'm Asserting this authority as the MC, they will not be longer than 10 minutes. <laughs> and um, uh, you will talk about the common threads, and then I'll be able to ask some questions. So as I introduce the, each of the first three panel members, please make your way up. Up first um, is the Sturgeon County representative, as well as the Strathcona County representative. That's, that's where I live. No, just... Yeah, and the town of Stony Plain. If those three uh, representatives would please make their way to the stage. All right, wherever you're comfortable. So, who's going to begin? Sturgeon, Sturgeon. County. Correct? Excellent, yeah, okay. absolutely. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Um, I think I will use the clicker here. Hopefully I get this to work. Tech support is horrifying for me. I was sweating when they were trying to get the sound on earlier, so. Um, good morning, my name is uh, Councillor Kristen Toms. I'm a second term councillor with Sturgeon County. Mayor Natu sends her regrets today. Unfortunately, she's battling everybody's favorite plague right now. So uh, you get me today. So I'm really pleased to be here to share a little bit about uh, our municipality. So as a short summary on what Sturgeon County is, when you look at the fact sheets, 
We are, of course, located in the north segment of the EMR, bordering the cities of St. Albert, Edmonton, Fort Saskatchewan, the town of Bourneville, and Parkland County. Sturgeon County is about 214,000 hectares in size, which is more than half a million acres. We are home to about 20,000 people and to a lot of hard infrastructure. Most notably, we have nearly 2,000 kilometers of road to service. I'm proud to say that Sturgeon County enjoys today a diversified economy and that we've worked hard to establish ourselves as an internationally competitive municipality. Sturgeon County recently updated our corporate strategic plan to a plan on a page concept, moving away from the previous 27 page document. We decided we'd actually like people to be able to read it this year. Under this four year plan, our municipal organization has established five community outcome areas, plan growth, environmental stewardship, collaborative governance, thriving communities and operational excellence. The county's very concise and targeted strategic plan provides administration with 10 strategic priority actions to undertake. This reflects thoughtful direction, addressing economic, environmental, modernization, and community well-being efforts. Like all municipalities, Sturgeon County has a number of priorities and opportunities that we hope to realize. This includes supporting an energy ecosystem approach and a clean energy transition. The county has been dedicating resources to advancing the hydrogen economy, noting the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub, Canada's first and largest hydrogen node. Our organization is prioritizing managing our ESG approach, recognizing all of this work is critical to ensure capital investment is coming into the region. As we all know, this is the reality of investor expectations today. Another priority is filling capacity at the Alberta Industrial Heartland. We've implemented the Heartland Incentive Bylaw. It's been in place for about a year. However, it takes years to build out industry and this opportunity is one that continues to be of great importance. And finally, we have prioritized advancing overall economic opportunity, value add ag sector support, Sturgeon Valley build out, Villeneuve Airport, and more. Excellent, thank you. Well done. Do I have to be done? <laughs> no, oh sorry, you're not. You said finally, so I thought, wow, that was well, short. No, <laughs> but you know what, I, I am a woman, I'm not done yet. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna go back behind here. the curtain. Okay, I'm gonna let you know when I'm ready. Okay. Perfect, thank Perfect. you. Thank you. <laughs> we have a relationship now, he's fine. Yes, we He's do. good. <laughs> <laughs> Sturgeon, okay, okay, enough, everybody settle down. I know we're all very excited this morning. Sturgeon County's ecosystem approach. I previously mentioned that Sturgeon County was taking an ecosystem approach. This is a conceptual framework that addresses our organization's undertaking of environmental, social, and governance outcomes, the ever famous ESG. The ecosystem approach is a systems-based way of thinking that, break down, that breaks down all of the connected work our organization is working to advance. We are identifying components of a broad system and identifying where our sphere of influence lies. An ecosystem approach allows us to realize our objectives by ensuring we remain conscious of the physical landscape, but also those elements that ultimately influence how that landscape evolves <clears throat> and realizes successes over time, including economic success. The things that will help influence the physical landscape are policies, people, community, and institutions. So this is an illustration of what I mean by an ecosystem approach, it's connection. All the elements that come together, connections that you can see and those that you can't see, that ultimately will enable us to realize goals such as economic opportunity. What you see on the screen now, this is representative of our top physical layer. This is what you can see when you look at the landscape. But as I just mentioned, there also exists many critical layers underneath, things we need to pay attention to and address to keep the ecosystem healthy. I'm talking about, for example, the social elements of how people interact with each other, government policy, indigenous inclusion, and more, an enhanced involvement of women in diverse industries, better government frameworks, all of these components will support the ecosystem. Close. <laughs> you take all the time you need. You're, you're being very patient, thank you, I appreciate that. I really like you this. You must this have been married for a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
While there are a number of exciting opportunities for Sturgeon County, we're still facing some serious challenges as a rural municipality. So one of the number one pressures I will point to is the fact that Sturgeon County has about 20,000 people spread out over 2,000 kilometers of road. Our organization faces low population density paired with high servicing costs, leading to significant infrastructure demands. As you can surely appreciate, this is an incredibly expensive endeavor. Besides roads to build, rebuild, maintain, modernize, we also have bridges to worry about and drainage. With Sturgeon County's flat landscape, draining issues have plagued us for as long as I can remember. We currently have a $75 million drainage master plan. Sturgeon County had been a have-not municipality in the region for a very long time. Now we have to play catch-up on our major local and regional infrastructure. Broadband is a good example of this. Another pressure Sturgeon County faces is related to providing funding support to other jurisdictions for municipal services. Noting we have different service levels and resident expectations as a rural municipality. There are other points on the screen, however, I will end this slide by noting our economic development pressures. We have a need for a new business park in underserved areas, while avoiding fragmentation and conversion of land, as one example. So, if you want, and this is my final thought slide, Doug, thank you. <laughs> if you want to boil down three final thoughts about Sturgeon County, I leave you with this. Sturgeon County is still playing significant catch-up from a financial and service level perspective. We are busy trying to make up for decades of not being able to do things appropriately. Our organization has prioritized an ecosystem approach focused on a clean energy transition and digitization efforts, and our community is committed to regional priorities and collaboration. Thank you for your time and attention this morning. I feel that there is great value in these opportunities to learn about each other's municipalities and the realistic challenges and pressures that we are facing each day. Ultimately, despite our differences, we are stronger when we work together to address these challenges as a region and take advantage of opportunities as a region. We all benefit this way. I look forward to the rest of your presentations on your respective. And Doug, you may go now. Thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate Anytime. that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Just the okay. Mayor Franks from Strathcona County. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and uh, thank you, Morinville, for hosting Mayor Simon. Uh, really d impressed with the history and the uh, architecture in your town. So I uh, took a little tour around today, and uh, you got great things to show off. So we should actually go down there at some point today if we can and take a look around. But I also want to thank our councillors that are here today, Councillor Parks, Nelson, Hartwick, and Harvey. They're hiding in the back, but you can corner them, and they got all the answers of what's happening in Strathcona County. So uh, Strathcona County, I should probably advance and get to our slide, there we are. We are home to about 100,000 people and thousands of businesses and agriculture, a lot happening out there. Like you, we serve with the idea of providing municipal services at the highest possible level and we want our community to be proud and uh, respect the decisions that we're making. So we balance uh, offering services to our residents um, in the here and now, but also laying the groundwork for economic growth. That's, it's, it's always difficult. I know you go through the same thing. Our strategic plan, probably pretty similar to yours. Municipal excellence, responsible development, healthy and safe communities, economic prosperity. Municipal excellence probably is the heart of all that, although these, we don't prioritize these four, but that's very important, of course. The significant thing there is we had 12 of these uh, strategic initiatives, I think, in 2017, and we boiled it down to eight, and now we're down to four, so maybe if we keep going, it will get it down to one, but it does help us to focus, and underneath them, there's sub-priorities. And all this gets rolled into a corporate plan and then to de department plans and ultimately into individual performance plans, so it, it's driven right through the organization. And we have many tools to help us make decisions. One of them, I'll just mention priority-based budgeting. It's not the be-all and the end-all, but it is, is, is useful. So one unique thing about Strathcona County is we are both urban and rural. That has uh, many opportunities that goes with it and also many challenges. 
and our size is about 1,200 kilometers uh, in area, which in itself is very much an advantage. It does give us many options for residential growth. It gives us many options for uh, agriculture opportunities, uh, for industrial opportunities. So uh, we value all that. Sure Park is the largest uh, community within Strathcona County, it's about 70,000 people. And then there's eight hamlets, which range in size from a few hundred all the way up to our Drossen, which our host is a member, uh, uh, resident of. And uh, there's a goal there of about 7,000. We have some really interesting recreation uh, building going on in there and some, even some commercial now. So that's gonna be a sizable community in the not too distant future. All this uh, area and land and people and community served by a council of nine of us, and we try and strike that balance between urban and rural and making sure everybody is satisfied. And that, that is the challenge because there's an expectation across the entire community, for example, that service levels will be 100% equal. That's really not doable. So the rural side um, is, uh, one unique aspect I'll mention is the southeast portion is the uh, UNESCO biosphere and it, it's been recognized by the, by the UN, so very unique uh, area out there. Uh, what Strathcona County did 70 years ago was it took an opportunity, it took a calculated risk to invest in industry. Built roads, built utilities, built fire halls and because of that calculated risk we now benefit today from, from the growth of industry. Um, and then we did it again 20 years ago with Albert Industrial Heartland. So the, these, are, the, these are risks you take. There's a lot of investment that goes along with that that you don't know if it's gonna pay off or not, but uh, it's worked out for us. Our budget, very similar to yours, probably the top five, like you have, we have. Fire and ambulance, police, transportation, RPC, Recreation, Parks and Culture, and Transit. That's where the dollars go. The risks. Um, you know, I think our entire region's doing very well and there's huge upside. I think we all have great opportunities. The risks to me are the provincial government, what's it gonna do? The federal government, what's it gonna do? And the economy, what's that gonna do to us? <laughs> we can't control those things. We're doing very well within Strathcona County. I know you're doing very well within your communities. These are the risks that we have to manage. And that's why one of the reasons we highly value EMRB, and I'll talk about that in my last slide. The opportunity, Strathcona County is constantly looking for uh, good residential development. We're always looking to improve investment readiness and we're always looking for opportunities to attract investment. That's a big part of our DNA. The regional priorities with EMRB, to me, you know, it's really important that we continue to work together, that we, we have vigorous debates on growth and servicing, then we make our decisions and we unify and we approach the provincial government, the federal government, and uh, make sure that they understand we're working together. So thank you very much, Doug, for hosting, and that's Strathcona County. Thank you very much, Mayor Franks. <clears throat> Mayor Choi, the town of Stony Plain. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate that. Let me get this working. Here we go. Stony Plain. As you can see, just before I start, I want to make sure I induce members of council because uh, I need their vote. So. Uh, as a good mayor knows, it's, it's never a one to six vote. It's always, it's good to have seven nothing. So I have uh, members of the council, is uh, Councillor Loins, Councillor Meyer, and Deputy Mayor Plechko's in the audience, so. Thank you. Okay, this is Stony Plain. You can see that beautiful. Just a little slideshow of what happens in Stony Plain. That is me, you already seen that, you guys see me too much, so we'll just skip that quickly. In terms of a municipal profile, um, many of you do not know that uh, we have, uh, our area is about 35 square kilometers, which was the biggest region in the Tri-Region Urban Center until Spruce Grove annexed more land. So just a heads up, Mayor Gamble will be looking out for more land in their future, so we can get that number one ranking again. 
Right. We have an operating budget um, of about $43 million, uh, similar to smaller sized communities like us. We have a uh, revenue which is 38, as you can tell if, if you're good at math. Uh, we're actually losing money. But <laughs> don't, don't, that's a little accounting joke, you guys didn't get it, but that's fine. <laughs> that's amortization, amortization and all that stuff that, that nobody ever gets. <laughs> okay. A uh, majority of our uh, tax revenue is uh, from the residential assessment. Uh, when I first got on council, our assessment was a 90 uh, residential, 10 uh, commercial and industrial. And from that time on 2012, we've had a big focus on getting the residential uh, a little bit further down so that we can actually provide more services for residents. Uh, we introduced a few new policies that made that possible in terms of focusing on building an environment for economic growth and for a business community to, to flourish. Okay. We also have a um, borrowing capacity. Uh, our council just the last term uh, put a cap on there. It's an 80% uh, debt ceiling out of uh, what the uh, provincial government has uh, their criteria is because we want to make sure that we as a town are financially sustainable. Uh, that gives us a little second look when we hit, hit close to that debt ceiling. Boom. Uh, we are, so pressures. Definitely there is pressures being one of the smallest uh, neighbors within the tri-region. Uh, we find it hard to match Spruce Grove and Parkland County one for one. So when we, t when we talk about um, regional challenges, initiatives, it's not about equality, it's about equity, right? The ability to pay. Right? And looking at usage. Right? So the challenge that we have in terms of our growing communities is a rec facility, water and storm, which we all deal with. Infrastructure, many of our communities are at the point where the original infrastructure is ready to fall apart. So those are huge challenges, but we need to work together to, to take care of them. Right. So definitely risk is the environmental uncertainty, as mentioned by Mayor Frank. We don't know what's gonna happen. We had two years of a, a huge economic downturn. Then we were hit with COVID-19. We don't know if the investors will come back and at what pace. Right? Definitely the provincial and federal governments, we rely on a lot of their grant funding to operate. Right? The downloading of services. Next thing is the environment. We all in our communities have witnessed that we are experiencing the one in 100 year weather patterns more often than not. When we say one in 100, it is more like one in 150 now. So opportunities, there are a lot of risks, but there is opportunities mentioned by my previous two speakers. Is collaboration, is working together to challenge and face those challenges together so that we can provide those services and meet them. There is opportunity for growth in Stony Plain. And we're okay not being the big boy in the, in the pond here. We understand what our role is in the EMRB. We understand what our role is in terms of economic development. We are the sub-secondary market. We will provide that quality of life for your workers, your businesses. Okay. Strategies and priorities comes down to community development. Council focuses a lot on community, community development. Because if we're not doing this for our residents, then who are we doing it for? Infrastructure renewal. If we don't have good roads infrastructure, we won't have residents to do anything for. 
and economic de development. 75% of our workforce works outside of our community, which is hard for single families, lower income earners. So that's something that we need to address in terms of our community. Regional priorities, we need to work together as the sub-region and also the greater Edmonton region to invest, to attract investment, coordinate infrastructure. And I'll highlight a little, that a little bit later on because we definitely need to coordinate how we build and spend our money in infrastructure projects. Okay. And definitely, Stony Plain has a lar large history and community. We are uniquely Stony Plain. We focus on the roots. We're committed to be acknowledging who we are. We take pride in our agriculture roots and our urban up growth. And you can see that this is uh, our police station, an example of committing to work collaboratively together. Some of the projects that we're working together as a tri-region is the Highway 28 realignment and construction. It has huge impacts to all three of us. And here is the best looking council you've ever seen. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I, I do have a question for you guys, um, but I, I just want to walk through a little bit about what we heard. I, I found it very interesting. I've, I've really only in the last few months really started to learn about systems uh, thinking and systems uh, changes. Because uh, a lot of times we want to change what we're doing and, and we work really hard at it, but if our systems are set up and they don't change, then we wind up back in the status quo. We become very frustrated. So you need to change the system to get the results that you want. Um, and, and I think it's incredibly important, the system that's set up for the region to help make sure that the, the change is transformational and we're prepared. And then uh, the, uh, the notion, um, I, I know you talked about playing catch up. Um, it's, it seems to me being in a community like Ardrossan that's gonna grow to 7,000 people, holy smokes, I only think there's 600 people there now, I need to, need to find a parking space before it fills up. Um, but you're always trying to play catch up, whether you're just starting now needing to invest to attract new people or new people are coming. So, so um, that's critically important. The, and then um, Mayor um, Franks, you talked about risk, and I found it very interesting that when you talked about risk, when the, the original investment in economic development within Strathcona County was an undertaking that you took, but the industrial heartland was more of a regional um, participation and growth, and, and I think that helped, um, uh, like insurance, to, to spread the risk over a larger region, which helped add some stability. And then, um, Finally, you guys talked about collective lobbying and the need to address um, your issues together as an entire region. When I think about systems thinking and trying to play catch up, and I think about um, the risks and trying to mitigate those, and then, and, and then trying to work together, it seems to me that, I mean, besides you guys working together, one of the values is making sure that you can lobby the provincial and the federal government collectively on the challenges that you have and the opportunities you face. What gaps are there right now that you would identify that the province or the federal government could step in to help support the region and its work in growing? You have 30 seconds. No, just joking. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start. So first off, they need to uh, approve our ramp. We've done that. Uh, that has not yet been approved. It's been in the minister's office for about six months now. And definitely provide that funding. I think um, yesterday we mentioned uh, a return on investment. The dollars that the provincial government is investing in the MRB is a huge impact in the return on investment for them. They're using our plans to help them plan the capital and play the political games, and I think that needs to stop. I think they just need to fund us properly so that we can actually provide the services that we're designed to do as a growth, regional growth board. Excellent. So for us, I would echo Mayor Choi, is having a consistent funding source that we can rely upon coming from the feds or the province. If you look at everybody, every new government that comes in provincially has to have their spin on something. So, you know, getting rid of the MSI funding, um, and they need to be aware of how we manage our budgets and our priorities. If I look at the rural municipalities, 
like policing costs were passed down to us. They were passed down to us three or four months after budget and they went, surprise, here's a giant bill for you. Uh, we don't have a ton of extra money to pass down, so I think there needs to be greater understanding between the various levels of governments of how we go through our processes so we can appropriately support each other. And like I say, a consistent, stable, reliable source of funding as opposed to just constant everybody putting their new stamp on something and swapping it around. It's, uh, it's a little uh, messy. <laughs> I, as former Minister of Municipal Affairs, agree. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I uh, EMRB's done a very good job of um, being part of the solution to the municipal government, uh, to the provincial government's uh, challenges, and I think that is very, it's been a good tactic the last four years. I think we should continue to do that, to be political but not overly partisan. And I know there's a role for that in certain communities for sure. There's very strong arguments. For us, we're, we're doing a lot better than CRB for one thing. And if we continue to show that we're working together, that we're unified, and I think the base of that is gonna be for us to continue to have uh, good leadership by Mayor Choi and have vigorous debates and then come up with decisions. And then when we go to the provincial government, if we're not there for a handout, but actually as a solution, uh, it's gonna take us a long ways. Yeah, excellent. Okay, excellent very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will invite our next three panelists up. Um, these, thank you, yes. I would like, thank you. And thank you for your patience. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. I would like to invite up the City of St. Albert, the City of Spruce Grove, and Parkland County representatives, please. As they make their way up here, I, I'm going to make another observation. Uh, and this, this applies to our American counterparts, too, because I've, I've made this observation quite a, quite a bit lately. We tend to focus on federal issues these days and consider the federal government so important, and I'm not criticizing them. And next up is the provincial government, but it's important for us to remember that hundreds of years ago, a hundred years ago, all across North America, we first had communities that came together and supported each other and networked and built, and that, out of there, came provinces, and out of the provinces came Canada. And I still testify that the most important job on earth is ensuring strong communities. So I agree with the three that, that previously spoke, making sure we have proper financing and funding to, to ensure the success of our communities is critically important. Ah, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we will start with the city of St. Albert. Excellent, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Kathy Heron. I am the mayor, proudly so, of the city of St. Albert. I have with me Councillor Wes Broadhead at the very back. I've got Councillor Ken Mackay over here. And my, I don't want to call them newbies anymore, but I have two new councillors. So it's nice to see new councillors uh, taking interest, Shelley Bermansky and Mike Killick, catching up fast in the municipal government world. So I'm going to take you on a little uh, tour of the city of St. Albert and talk about some of our challenges and opportunities. So is this working? There we go. So we have a population of about 68,000. I always say we are the second biggest city in the region. I know Strathcona is bigger, but they're not a city, so I can proudly say we're the second biggest. Uh, that was about a 4% growth since 2016. So we tend to be slow and steady in our growth, which, is, which we prefer. It's manageable that way. Uh, this, is, this number does not include um, the recently annexed lands um, from Sturgeon County. So in January 1st of this year, um, an uncontested annexation was approved. Thank you to my neighbors to the north for, for making that happen. We were facing a lot of growth pressure, so we now have another 1,500 approximately hectares in our city, and uh, we're going to be looking forward to responsibly growing on that new land. Um, we have an operating budget of about just a little over 200 million and a capital budget of 80 million. Um, one thing we've always been quite proud of, although I don't know how long it's going to last, we have one of the lowest uh, debt per capita in the province. So it's about $668 per person, and that's for, so that's, when I say lowest, those are for cities with a population of about 30,000 and um, more. We have an 80% tax or limit on our, on our debt as well, and uh, I think in the future, given some of the funding constraints from the province, we might be borrowing more money. We'll see. 
I have no notes here. We did want to show this slide. We, we quite often show this slide as a, um, a comparison. I don't know if you can see it up there, but this is really the blue lines are the residential side of our assessment and the green would be the non-res side. So St. Albert's about third highest. So these are mid-sized cities. So we have about 80% of our taxes coming from residential assessment and 20% coming from um, the non-res. And you've got Fort Saskatchewan way over on the other side because they have M&E on, on their side. But I <laughs> so for every hundred dollars that you, all of us are filling up a public works truck with diesel, you spend a hundred bucks. So in St. Albert, that hundred dollars, eighty dollars of that is borne by my residents. But if you go to let's say Leduc, only sixty-three dollars are borne by residents. So there's a lot of pressures on our residents to cover the costs of what we're trying to do in, in our city. Uh, this is totally different slides than you sent me, Trevor. <laughs> I, I can work on. I'll just wing it. Uh, so um, we'd like to also talk about a little bit how we're doing on our density. Uh, when the growth plan was approved a few years ago, uh, we were already. We were already on our way. We, we ch made some changes to the land use bylaw um, to allow for some of the home housing types that have back alleys. That was made a huge difference. We have zero lot lines now included in our community that are just starting to get built. And so these are really think important things for the region because, of course, the growth plan is a guiding document, but something that our community very, very highly supports because uh, we recognize just north of us in Sturgeon County is fantastically perfect agricultural land and we want to preserve that and so we are doing our best to, to uh, grow up instead of out and then just last year last term we approved a big development right on our river valley that is going to be beautiful if any of you have ever been to St. Albert and gone to either Buco or 19 or Deluxe Burger it's, it's a development called Shop Subujo and, and Botanica so it's going to be very similar to that just north and it'll be probably even more dense. These are our largest assessment uh, uh, contributors. So we are proudly home of Alberta's Booze. AGLC Distribution Warehouse is there. Uh, I did the ribbon cutting shortly after I was elected mayor and I said this is where I will hide in the zombie apocalypse. It is massive and it is every, pretty much every drop of booze that comes through Alberta goes through that warehouse. Then we have our mall that's got a, a big assessment and then we have Uline Distribution which um, is new to our community. And I, I need to thank the region for that one in many ways because Ray Gibbon Drive was part of the transportation priorities that we would prove and send to the province. The province honors those priorities. They have now twinned Ray Gibbon Drive. And as soon as that, it's a cost sharing 27 million with uh, St. Albert and 27 with the province. As soon as that was approved, Uline came to our community and brought in $90 million in investment. So it really, really shows how tr investment and transportation will be good for our community and the entire region. Some of the growth pressures that we have are obviously balancing the taxes that our residents are bearing. Um, we, we're trying really hard. We were at 70-30, I think, when I was first elected, so we're now at 80-20. We're pretty, pretty pleased, or sorry, the other way around, 90-10. And now we're at 80-20, our goal is 70-30, and, and that new annexation lands will probably help with that. But our residents, um, we say, are unapologetically demanding of services. We have some of the highest service levels in the region and uh, it, we, we have to pay for it. And so the biggest demand right now that we're hearing from our residents is want a new rec center and then we have to um, we have to cope with the fact that we don't have a lot of industrial or even commercial land. So a lot of the land that's in St. Albert now is zoned for housing. So what we need is serviced, shovel-ready industrial land and um, we're working on that. Uh, there's a business district to the west called Lakeview and it's going to have some significant investments that are required and um, we're actually kind of hoping that maybe the CED will be, this will be a good place for collaborative economic development to do a little test run. Uh, we also have high off-site levies. I think when we were at the Delta doing this with just the mayors, some of the municipalities was talking about how fast they were growing and it was almost unsustainable and one of the suggestions was, well, raise your off-site levies. <laughs> well, we, we can't do that in St. Albert because they are probably the highest. And so we're looking at things on alternative servicing, et cetera, to, to try to make the pipes and the ground a little bit cheaper. 
And then, of course, we have aging infrastructure like many of us. We uh, instilled a 1.5% tax levy. Um, we call it our RMR levy on every tax bill for probably the next. Our, our assessment departments in finance is telling us 20 years of that levy, but we're going to see what we can do otherwise. <laughs> Uh, so I talked about the biggest risks are the missing industrial and commercial opportunities. So we've had people knocking on our doors. They want to come build in St. Albert. We have, we pride ourselves on low um, red tape. We call it green tape in St. Albert. We have a low uh, business tax, but when they come, there's nowhere for them to land. So we miss out on these opportunities. Um, there's erosion of traditional revenue sources, which was just talked about. The 25% reduction in MSI is going to hurt all of us. And then, of course, the pandemic has hurt our uh, commercial and retail sector. Um, untapped opportunities. I, I wanted the regional and sub-regional um, stuff to be right at the top of this slide. And so we, how we can um, do re revenue generation regionally and how we can share costs. And uh, so we're looking at non-traditional uh, venture partnerships, including with First Nations and Indigenous groups. Just recently, uh, Landrex, one of our big developers in, in the city, partnered with Fort Mackay. And uh, that, that investment is going to get a, a mixed-use development going much faster because of that capital. So that's a great partnership. And then uh, we really, I, I met with Mayor so he just two days ago, and we really need to start working on our affordable housing supply in St. Albert. And I know Edmonton is facing huge pressures. And so the offer is always there that we want to have some sort of agreement to build in St. Albert and take the pressure off Edmonton. These are our priorities from last term, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over them because th they are changing quite quickly. We, our council is working on new priorities. One of them is going to be our downtown core. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we have a downtown in St. Albert. It's historic. It's full of arts. It's on the river. It's beautiful. It's just quite empty uh, after 5 o'clock, so we're going to work on our downtown. And So these are our top three regional priorities. Uh, regional transit implementation, this is, this is going to be key to the region. Of course, the Be Ready or Be Left Behind report talked about how it's imperative. It's, not, it's, not, it's, it's unsustainable to have different transit systems running in, in a region as big as ours, so we're, we're really pushing ahead. And of course, we all know Wes is the chair of the Regional Transit Commission and working hard on that. Collaborative economic development, <laughs> yes, clap for Wes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is, is a priority for us. It was you know, something that the mayors did last term and we're just starting to, to iron out how that's going to look and work on that. So we, we would welcome a pilot in St. Albert or anywhere. And then we also need to work on some enhanced housing options. So that's, that's St. Albert in a nutshell. We're pretty proud of it. It's historic. It's the oldest um, non-fortified community in Alberta. And uh, there you go. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, Mayor Heron, yeah. I just want to, if yeah. if there is an apocalypse and and we and, can go to the, yeah. can I come? Yeah, I'll open the doors for you guys. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. But we have to limit it because I've been in there. It's big, but there's still only so much to go around. So <laughs> get on the list early, folks. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Heron. Now, Councillor McDonald, Spruce Grove. Thank you, Doug. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Reed McDonald, and I am proud to present to you this morning as the deputy mayor of the amazing, growing city of Spruce Grove. Mayor Jeff Acker is unfortunately available for today's event and regrets he was not able to speak to you this morning. I also bring you greetings on behalf of my council colleagues uh, in the room today, our councillors Danielle Carter, councillor Stuart Houston, and councillor Aaron Stevenson. Uh, note for Reed, just read off the page, do not improvise, <laughs> just read the notes, don't screw this up, good luck. Oh, sorry. Um, on behalf of my council colleagues and our city administration, I would like to thank the EMRB for hosting this session today. I, I did try to rope uh, semi-retired uh, former mayor of Spruce Grove, Stuart Houston, into presenting today, but I am deputy mayor, and as you all know, uh, Stuart is rather shy. So, <laughs> I'd also like to thank, uh, to my left, uh, uh, my regional uh, colleague, uh, Mayor Alan Gamble, I'll be with you for the next 18 minutes. I've recently agreed to annex some of uh, Alan Gamble's time. So uh, enjoy, uh, and let's get started. So it's a great opportunity where we can all come together today and learn about our region and neighbors and work together to find common ground. And with that, I would like to provide you with some insight as to why the city of Spruce Grove is the best city in the region and why we were chosen to host Rogers Hometown Hockey last week.
Spruce Grove is located 15 minutes west of Edmonton, is home to nearly 40,000 residents, and is one of the fastest growing communities in Alberta. Let's be honest, we're basically 40,000, so we're growing by approximately 10% in the last five years. Phenomenal growth, and as some of you may have seen, uh, Councillor Stuart Houston does like to share that we generally lead the, the region in, uh, in new housing starts. So some of you might have seen that slide before. We're very proud of that. We're a fast-growing community, lots of young families, and uh, one of the largest demographics in Spruce Grove uh, is those under 10 years old. So we're very proud of that. We're also home to a wide range of commercial and industrial businesses, with new and exciting locally grown businesses opening up on a regular basis to serve the residents of Spruce Grove and the surrounding region. To provide our community with an exceptional place to call home, the City of Spruce Grove's annual operating and capital budget expenditures total approximately $126 million. These funds go toward providing core services to the residents of Spruce Grove, as well as amenities and facilities that our residents desire, such as the Tri-Leisure Center, which we partner with the Town of Stony Plain and Parkland County to complete. That's a real success story in terms of regional collaboration, the uh, Tri-Leisure Center. I encourage you to visit if you haven't been there. Spruce Grove has always emphasized social and physical well-being for our residents. Our council has reaffirmed this commitment through our strategic plan, which is set to be released for final community input next week and will also be reflected in the upcoming renewal of our municipal development plan. Simply put, Spruce Grove is an amazing place to grow a family, be an active member in the community, and be provided with the varied supports that are necessary for everyone to thrive. As mentioned, Spruce Grove has grown and continues to grow at a rapid rate. While this growth is, of course, more than welcomed, and it is promising for the city of Spruce Grove's future, it presents us with several fiscal challenges and realities that our municipality must address. These challenges include, but are certainly not limited to, delivering core services, such as waste collection and snow clearing, providing excellent recreational and cultural amenities, and serving a growing community with increasingly diverse needs. Beyond the fiscal challenges presented by growth, we are also constrained geographically by our neighbours to the west, Highway 16 to the north, and the Wagner Natural Area to the east. While Spruce Grove has expanded its geographic boundaries to the south through an annexation with Parkland County, this land is anticipated to largely address growth pressures within our commercial and industrial sectors. As our residential development continues to grow at a rapid rate, we will have to look for opportunities to grow up in and, when necessary, out as a community, which is a policy area our MDP will seek to explore. The majority of us in the room, if not all, can relate to the first identified risk, which is long-term predictable funding from other orders of government. Without going into the details, as we are all aware of the challenges that this poses, our hope is that municipalities within Alberta will be given financial assurances that enable us to plan and budget as effectively and efficiently as possible. Our residential to non-residential assessment ratio of 1.46 to 1 is currently imbalanced disproportionately toward a residential assessment base. As this is a risk to our long-term financial sustainability as well, efforts are being made to address this imbalance through strategies that promote industrial and commercial development. The last point is something that we are all in together, which is addressing climate change and improving the resilience of our respective communities. The City of Spruce Grove is committed to doing its part to address the impacts of climate change and mitigate against future impacts. Earlier this week, we approved our 10-year Climate Change Action Plan. Through the Climate Change Action Plan, we will work to adopt recommended mitigation actions within the plan, which will help reduce Spruce Grove's greenhouse gas emissions. One of Spruce Grove's major challenges is the CN Railway running east to west parallel to Highway 16A, as it physically divides our community in two. The CN Railway is a very active railway, so conducting, connecting from one side to the other of our community can be quite challenging. As our community continues to grow, investment may be required to alleviate some of the pressures that this piece of infrastructure places on our community. Speaking of infrastructure, significant investment to service new residential, commercial, and industrial growth continues to be a top priority for our community. But I'm pleased to share that we've already taken important steps early in this new council term to invest in our industrial area by servicing and bringing online new industrial lands, which, much like homes in Spruce Grove, we know to be a very in-demand product. Providing additional cultural and recreational facilities 
such as the new Civic Center that we are currently exploring, is an example of the investments we are hoping to make in our community to meet the needs of our residents. In a similar vein, we have been in partnership with the Town of Stony Plain and Parkland County to meet the needs of some of our most vulnerable residents, low-income seniors, through the Meridian Housing Foundation, which provides attainable housing options to residents within our respective communities. The three municipalities remain committed to investing in this need and have all recently passed unanimous motions to fund the municipal capital portion of a proposed housing facility for seniors within Spruce Grove, which will provide an additional 102 units of housing. There are several opportunities for growth and development at the local level, some of which we have highlighted here. Over the last several years, we have invested in infrastructure improvements within our city centre to enhance the public realm and built environment through street streetscape improvements and park revitalizations. As we wrap up the installation of fibre optic capabilities to all homes and businesses within Spruce Grove, we as a city are in the early stages of exploring the value of developing smart city strategies that will enable us to harness the power of data to inform decision making and improve how residents interact with and experience the city they call home. Through our MDP, we will be exploring potential opportunities as to how and when development of our recently annexed lands will occur. I've mentioned this a few times already this morning, but our MDP renewal is a crucial priority for the city of Spruce Grove. The MDP will explore and try to answer the questions of what does the city of Spruce Grove look like 10, 20, 30, and even 40 years from now, and will include policies, directions, and actions as to how we can achieve the intended outcomes. As we continue to grow, attracting investment and expanding and diversifying local employment opportunities is of importance to the city of Spruce Grove and its residents. The Myshack Metro Ballpark is an exciting and great example of how we as a city have been supportive in advancing this development, which will add additional employment opportunities and represents how we are actively trying to diversify investments that are being made in our city. From a regional perspective, the City of Spruce Grove remains committed to the uh, Edmonton Metropolitan Transit Services Commission, and we are eagerly anticipating the results of their bottom-up costing project. The work of the Solid Waste Collaborative is also of interest to the City of Spruce Grove, as we see great benefits from the work of this collaborative, and we are currently looking forward to how our regional solid waste data will be streamlined. And last but not least, something we all like talking about, intermunicipal cost and revenue sharing and partnerships. All jokes aside, we believe there are benefits working together as a region, sub-regions, and between municipalities. It's why we're all here today. As our work together continues to grow and evolve, discussions and frameworks associated with cost and revenue sharing will continue to be part of the discussion and decision-making process. And we look forward to ensuring that each affected municipality is treated in an equitable manner. In closing, I would like to thank the EMRB and the Town of Morinville for hosting us and bringing us together today. I would like to thank all of you for letting me share a little bit about the city I love, call home, and am proud to represent as Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Reed. Uh, Mayor Gamble. And I, even though he said he was annexing your time, you got, you got your time, don't, don't worry about it. Thank you very much, MC Griffith. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Mayor Gamble. Thank you to the EMRB for hosting this event. Special thank you to Mayor Borsma and to Grand Chief Arcand for welcoming, welcoming us to your home to share this space and this day with you. Also, I'm going to say the Oilers will win Game 7. Calling that out right now. <laughs> One of the major challenges for myself is consistent to this morning, the volume control for Zoom and Teams meetings is always a challenge for all of us. So. I'd like to introduce to you our council who is here today. We have our Deputy Mayor Kowalski, uh, Councillor Kabasiak, Councillor Weedman, and Councillor Hoofsloot all the way from Tomahawk, longest drive. I'd also like to welcome our administration, Ms. Long, Ms. Abig, and Miss Larissa, who I just met this morning, don't even know your last name, just your first name. <laughs> I 
So just for opening, here's our annexation plan. You see the city of Spruce Grove and the town of Sconey Plain right in the midst of us. <laughs> Parkland County is a diverse community of over 32,000 people extending out to the Pembina River on our western border. Stony Plain, Spruce Grove, Paul Band First Nation, and several summer villages are located within our borders. And we have close relationships with our bordering neighbors, including the Enoch Cree Nation, Yellowhead, Brazo, Lac St. Anne counties, and of course, our EMRB partners, including Edmonton, Strathcona County, Sturgeon County, and Leduc County. We have a proud agricultural heritage with more than 670 active farms across the county and other important economic centers including the Atchison Industrial Area and historically the Trans Alta Mines and Plants. We're also home to many treasured natural assets and amenities such as the Wadman Lake, the Chicago Lakes and the Pembina and North Saskatchewan River Valleys as well as Bing's number one and Bing's number two in Spruce yeah. Grove. Moving to our municipal budget. Financially, Parkland County is in a healthy financial position and we're continuing to manage our resources carefully as we diversify our large assessment contributors. We don't show this slide often to Spruce Grove and Stony Plain. In term, well, we do hear rec center, and we've heard that a number of times today. In terms of growth pressures, our focus is on how Parkland can best invest our available capital to have the greatest impact on economic diversification to continue transitioning away from coal-fired energy. That said, we're sensitive to balancing new growth with other priorities, such as the protection of prime agricultural land and our rural quality of life in a complementary way. The county is moving forward with strategic investments such as funding the development of broadband infrastructure, investing in the Atchison business area, developing trails throughout the county, and supporting initiatives in the hamlet of Wadman. This investment will be $51 million in total over five years. The Atchison Business Park will receive $18.5 million in funding. The county said this investment will open up over 2,000 acres to stimulate new investment and generate additional tax revenue for the county. The hamlet of Wadman will receive also $18.5 million for in initiatives geared towards improving Wadman's recreation destination potential. This investment will be informed by public engagement this summer and may include upgrades to the existing facilities and infrastructure, park and beach improvement, and wastewater facility upgrades. The county will also invest $8 million in broadband for improvements to internet connectivity across the region. Lastly, $6.25 million will be invested in trail development across the county. A trail master plan is being developed as a guide to annual trail development program. For Parkland, our top challenges include getting the province to commit to funding critical infrastructure such as the twinning and rail grade separation upgrades to Highway 60 and safety and the quality improvements to Highway 628. This is linked to our need to continue attracting investment to support Parkland's economic transition away from coal-fired energy as we need infrastructure to support new growth. As we attract investment in the areas like Atchison, Wadman, Entwistle, etc., limitations of existing infrastructure systems, including water, wastewater, roads, and broadband, continue to be a challenge. Another area we're working on is expectations from residents around servicing levels. New residents who are used to living in urban municipalities are often surprised that we're not able to provide equivalent levels of service. And while we're working to enhance services where it makes sense, ongoing communication and education in this area is important to setting realistic expectations. The biggest risks to Parkland County currently are 
provincial decisions that result in the downloading of both work and cost to municipalities, such as the RCMP policing cost model, which has been consistent, and the failure to follow through on commitments from previous administrations. Financially, our biggest risk is changing plans from our major assessment contributors, such as Trans Alta's decommissioning of their coal-fired plants, especially when they come with limited or no advance notice. Finally, land use planning issues and provincial constraints can threaten our up-and-coming development projects, such as the Wadman Waterfront Development or the new Meridian Business Park concept. Moving to opportunities, some of the opportunities that we are very excited about include our main economic development focus for parkland is ensuring the full build out of Atchison. Currently we have 420 businesses employing over 10,000 people. This will be done through critical infrastructure investment. We will also be activating new employment areas like the new Meridian Business Park especially as the Atchison industrial area is quickly trending towards the full build-out. We're also looking to improving recreational amenities and access to our natural areas like the Wobman Lake area and exploring opportunities around the reclaimed trans Alta mine lands. Tourism is also a growing focus for us and we plan to leverage our exceptional natural assets by building on the numerous tourism opportunities throughout the county. Strategic priorities. The county's first strategic priority right now is economic diversification. To support our transition away from coal-fired energy, we've taken great strides down this path already and have experienced some exciting success stories such as the Champion Pet Foods Plant and the upcoming Amazon Robotics Fulfillment Center. Next is streamlining our operations and systems. Parkland has been working to modernize our organizational systems and processes to be robust and efficient, and we've come a long way since this program was implemented in 2018. We're also looking at significant changes within our structure by conducting an organizational review this year, as well as a land use bylaw optimization process. Third is continuing the effort to become a more customer focused organization. This is an ongoing initiative that started with the centralization of customer service and continues to be a priority for all departments as we improve processes and tools for staff and the public. Priorities for the region. At a regional level, our first priority is collaboration with our tri-region partners, Spruce Grove and Stony Plain, on shared priorities in advancing the tri-municipal regional plan implementation as well as collaboration with our rural partners on sharing best practices and advocating jointly. We also value collaboration within and between municipalities and business communities to focus on investment and growth in the commercial and industrial sectors. Third, it is important to us as a region that we're able to offer well-planned and managed communities that promote well-being for our residents and visitors, which include recreation, culture, and social services as and amenities. We're also a proud partner of the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Board, and I'm very proud that we have our representatives from the First Nations here today. Takeaways. Our top three takeaways we'd like everyone here to understand about Parkland County are, first, the accelerated phase out of coal-fired energy has had a significant impact on our budget, and the county has had to make some significant changes in its programs and services to ensure sustainability. We have a plan to replace our revenue streams through focused economic development and diversification, and we've already seen great success in this but full replacement of revenue in this area will take time. Second, we are committed to supporting success across the region. 
We're looking forward to working collaboratively to ensure efforts aren't duplicated and decisions can be made from a holistic and strategic viewpoint. Third, in 2021, we experienced the dissolution of the village of Waban into the county. This process was challenging, costly, and resource intensive, and support from the province was minimal. However, we have some very exciting plans for our newest hamlet that we hope to unveil in the future. I missed the slide, but there it is. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a pleasure speaking with you today, and on behalf of Parkland County, we look forward to networking with all of you later today and thoroughly enjoying the day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all three of you. I have a question before you go. You don't get off the hot seat that fast. Um, you all discussed um, some of the challenges, the need to preserve agricultural land, to grow up rather than growing out. Um, you, you talked about housing diversity and affordability issues, so you're trying to focus in the core. And of course, we have beautiful communities all throughout the region that, that more and more people want to live in, which increases the need for housing inventory. But it also, you all mentioned, it challenges your tax base because you are over-reliant on a tax assessment from residential. And so you need, and you all talked about this again, economic diversification. How does the region help address the need for more commercial and industrial development in urban centers? How do you, how do you expand that partnership um, to ensure that every community is sustainable um, without necessarily the conflicts about revenue sharing? I know you talked about revenue generation in collaboration. How, how would that work? I can go, and I think everybody's going to know I'm going to talk about collaborative economic development. It's a, it's a plan that we came up with last term. It essentially will allow um, each of us to invest in each other's communities, and then when, when that non-residential uh, tax base is realized, then we share that revenue back. So it's a voluntary uh, a collaborative that we're working on. The, the fine details are still being worked out, obviously. But um, that is one way. That's that's absolutely one way. And then I mentioned it a little bit in my in my talk. Is the pressure ends up in Edmonton on housing, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to take care of our own and build our own affordable housing. So I think all levels of government need to participate in in that su subsidized support of housing, and so and that includes the municipal level. So I think we all need to be donating land, such as Mournville did to the Jessica Martel House. Those kind of examples I think are important in taking the pressure off of Edmonton. I'm sure Amarji would be very pleased with that. <laughs> I don't know if you guys want to. I'm not seeing any notes for this. <laughs> um, at the risk of speaking out of turn, I think it really just comes down to partnerships, uh, not just with other neighboring municipalities, but uh, partnerships with industry. I think there's a huge opportunity there. Um, insofar as we've talked today about downloading of costs from the provincial government, um, I, I think there's an opportunity there for private industry to, to play a, an important role in terms of economic development as a region. And uh, I think when we can sell our region, uh, Parkland County and Stony Plain, uh, you know, we can, we can bring in private money, I think, to help advance some of our, our regional goals. I think that's a huge opportunity. And then, as I mentioned, uh, our MDP, uh, that will inform uh, affordability of housing. It's an area of great concern to our, our current council is uh, ensuring that those most vulnerable in our community, um, those at risk of losing housing, those who can't afford housing, as we've seen, assessments have gone up significantly, I think about 6% this past year, and housing is becoming less and less affordable. So it's an area of significant concern as we develop our MDP. Um, being creative, I think, in terms of the housing supply and the housing stock is very important to us. Uh, and of course, as we've all talked about today, uh, easing the split between uh, commercial, industrial, uh, and residential tax base continues to be a focus for us. As I mentioned, we're, we're bringing on more commercial industrial land so that will uh, certainly assist with that. Thank you. If it was a tough question, I was going to get Deputy Mayor Toms back up here to <laughs> simmer you down. But with this question, when we talk about economic... <laughs> Uh, your question related to economic development, first of all, I, start, I believe that that starts with the 13 municipalities and our First Nations partners that 
we need to develop and look at the overall area structure plan. So when we have a region where we are expecting a million new people to arrive here over the next number of years, there has to be an accommodation for residential support, for business support, while maintaining our agricultural identities in the rural areas, as well as paying particular attention to our environmentally significant assets. So it has to be, in, in one word, it has to be a balance. But we have to ensure that as a group of 13 municipalities that we properly plan land use. In municipalities, that is our biggest role, is to plan land use. So for example, Parkland County, we're a, a big supporter of economic development within our Atchison Business Park, but we know that that will fill up. So we will be, and I said it four times, Meridian Business Park, we will be looking <laughs> for your support in the area structure plan so that we provide the expansion and availability to properly plan for future expansion residentially for business and industrial as well as particular attention to agriculture and how we protect prime agricultural land and how we protect our environment. Thank you. Excellent. Brilliant responses. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Nice job, guys. Awesome job. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a break for 10, 15 minutes, 15 minutes maximum. I'm going to give you a warning. I think there may be smoothies still outside, so please go help yourself. There's snacks in the back. There's coffee and water over there. And I want to issue a challenge to you. A lot of times we show up at these events and we sit with the same people we always know and we have the same conversations. Mix it up. Get to know each other a little bit better. This is about regional cooperation and collaboration. And I'll see you back here in about 15 minutes. All right, ladies and gentlemen. I am so glad that the conversation level got so high. I was actually speaking in Ontario at an event for some northern municipalities night before last, and there were 150 people in the room, and I felt like I was at a Seattle Seahawks game. The noise was so high because we, oh, we've been so desperate to get back to have face-to-face -face conversations and talk to each other, and I have to admit, it's nice to see things below the eyes. I'm, I'm really... Happy to see smiling, not that far below the eyes. No, 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 Christina. Oh, everything's, I'm, I'm going to be in trouble by the end of this day. No, I mean the smiling faces and to, to I, I recognize people now by their eyes, but it's nice to see that they're happy to see me instead of wondering what's under the mask. It's important. So our next group is going to come up. Uh, I would like to invite the representatives from Treaty 6, the town of Morinville, Leduc County and the city of Leduc to join me on stage. And I am so excited because I, I think we, we have some news. So welcome. Come on up. All right, welcome up, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Chief Arcand, if you would like to begin. Great. Thank you, uh, and good morning again, everyone. Um, not to downplay any of our uh, activities here today, but uh, last night we got a call that the uh, Pope has uh, committed and, and, and will be uh, coming to Edmonton. Uh, so I'm going to be asked to do a press conference at noon, uh, a little bit of a scrum, so uh, I'll make sure I talk about the ERMB when we talk. <laughs> I can't believe I actually got to operate this thing. Uh, the Confederacy of Treaty Six Nations was created in the spring of 1993 with the purpose of serving as the united political voice of those Treaty Six Nations who are signatories to Treaty Number no. 6 for the continued protection of the fundamental treaty inherent and human rights of the treaty peoples of those nations in Alberta. 
The Confederacy of Treaty Six Nations is dedicated to ensuring that the terms, spirit, and intent of Treaty Six are honored and respected. The rights of the Treaty Six First Nations to self-determination must be honored and respected. There are 17 members of the 17 members of the Confederacy of Treaty Six, stretching from Coal Lake in the northeast to Ochis and Sunchild in, in the south. Each member nation is unique in its size and challenges. Within the Edmonton, the Edmonton metropolitan region, there are three First Nations, Alexander, Enoch, and Paul First Nation. As you can see in the map, Alexis and the four nations of Musquechis are close neighbors to the region, but all of the nations in the Treaty 6 access services and in municipalities in and around Edmonton. So if we were to uh, take away some of the boundaries, uh, many of the First Nations in, in Treaty 6 continue to use Edmonton as a hub for activities uh, and services for many of their communities. We have about 50% of our uh, members live off reserve as an average, and I would suggest that 50% of them uh, probably live in the Edmonton region. We have pressures like yourselves. Indigenous people are the fastest growing population in Canada. This means that our communities experience immense pressures to keep up with the growth of our population. Such pressures include housing, access to water. We must contend with limited land base, maintain infrastructure such as our roads, a lack of jobs and the delivery of services such as education and health care. As our population grows, the demand for education, social and health services can create challenges within our communities. As a result of this growth pressures, we see many of our people leaving our communities for yours, for opportunities for education, jobs and housing. We know the, the intergenerational impacts of residential school systems and other colonialist policies have resulted in, in over-representation of Indigenous people in the justice system and child and family service system. This over-representation is a problem and working to resolve these issues that cause these outcomes will take partnership between our neighbours and all the outcomes should be brought to different levels of government to ensure that we are not upholding broken systems. In addition to these systems, we know that the current health care and education systems are not serving our people well. First Nation people are forced to straddle this line with the federal and provincial jurisdiction that causes inequities in health care and education. As our population continues to grow, these risks need to be addressed to set our people and communities up for success in the future. As mentioned previously, each nation within the Confederacy of Treaty 6 has unique challenges, but also it means that they have unique opportunities. The size and location of individual communities provides them with different opportunities. For example, Enoch's proximity to the city of Edmonton affords it opportunities for partnership and collaboration that may look different than, say, my community of Alexander, which is located about 35 kilometers northeast of Edmonton. Some potential opportunities that may exist that have not yet been tapped our tourism. Nations such as Alexis, Enoch, host large powwows. 
these powwows bring people together, dancers, drummers, and visitors from across Canada. These types of events may, may be great for tourism and different opportunities. We also need support from our neighbours as we take more control of our health, social and education services. Regulatory and economic certainty is also our proposed priorities. We understand that in many of the communities there's issues with um, low-income housing, there's issues with our services being taxed all the time in terms of uh, operational uh, concerns, and many of those are because of our people. We want to be part of the solution and not always be part of the problem. I would say, as a confederacy, our nations have three primary goals. The first is to shrink the gap. We need to work on the systems I mentioned before to close the education, social, and health gaps that exist between our First Nation and non-First Nation people. We need to actively work to rebuild systems and do things differently so the First Nation people have the same opportunities to succeed as their non-native First Nation counterparts. Our second priority is to build stronger relations with our neighbours. All of our communities border, border other municipalities that our members access. It is important that we have strong relationships with our neighbours to ensure our members feel safe and welcome in your communities. And you need a stronger relationship with us as our members contribute to your economy every day. It's a win-win for all of us when we get along. Finally, our last priority is economic development. We want to be active partners in economic development and opportunities. The four nations of Enoch, Alexander and Paul and Alexis have actually created a partnership the First Nation Capital Partnership to invest in economic opportunities in the region. The Confederacy of Treaty 6 is in the process of creating a business alliance amongst all Treaty 6 First Nations. We intend to announce in June uh, the Treaty 6 First Nation Business Partnership that will undertake and work with industry partners and tried to rebuild our economy in the Treaty 6 territory. Our view is that as you identify your budgets, uh, we see a lot of similarities in terms of the challenges we have. We still need to provide roads in our communities. We still need to provide education systems. We still need to provide uh, all the services that you talk about. Uh, the problem is, of course, uh, we do not have the same tax base as yourself. So we have a, a different kind of challenge that needs to be uh, corrected, and we need to ensure that we close the gap quicker, uh, the same way you talk about uh, ensuring there to be catch-up stuff in terms of your infrastructure. We need to do... Um, many of those things, and we need to do it with our own source revenue. I believe that the Business Alliance will start to create an opportunity to deliver economic and regulatory certainty in the region, and also I believe that it's a new way for us to bring new capital into the economic fabric here in Alberta. Many of our uh, communities have their own source revenue and many of our communities have been uh, building uh, investments for a long time. Uh, we've never seen the uh, Alberta economy as a potential area for investment, uh, but now we see the importance 
of investing with our neighbors. I hope that meetings like this, where the Treaty 6 First Nations can be involved, and again, I thank uh, the Chair for the invitation uh, to the Confederacy and all of the uh, First Nations that were invited. And I think as we continue to have these meetings, we'll continue to have more uh, people from uh, Treaty 6 uh, coming to these sessions. I'd like to just recognize uh, three of my council members who are here from the Alexander First Nation. We have uh, Chris Arcand. Chris, you want to stand, please? Uh, Marty Arcand and uh, Kevin Arcand. And, and it's, not, it's not a rule in our community to have Arcans all the time on council, but uh, we are a dominant family in uh, the Alexander First Nation. And uh, like many, uh, many of you, uh, the families play a big role in our politics uh, as things go forward. So again, hi, hi, thank you uh, for inviting us today. And I look forward to uh, this information and this session this afternoon. Thank you very much, Grand Chief Arcan. I, I do want to say I, um, I, I am so excited to hear that the Pope is coming to meet and talk. Um, I know that, that him arriving does not make anything go away, um, but healing begins with the recognition of what yeah. happened, um, and that's what pulls us together. So congratulations on your patience and your dedication to make that happen. <laughs> Simon. Thank you. I'll start off with, I know I mentioned earlier for, that we have a whole table here full of councillors and I wanted to first start off by recognizing them. So uh, Councillor Richardson, Councillor White, Councillor Defoe, Councillor Belanco, Councillor St. Denis, and Councillor Ann Halliger. They're all here and I appreciate that. As many of you already know, um, you're kind of in the town of Mournville right now, and um, you've driven one of our roads to come in here. Um, our area of Mournville is approximately 11 and a half kilometers square, and our total population uh, as of 2020 was 10 and a half thousand people. We're sitting right around 11,000 right now. Um, and as I know in EMRB, we're always told that we're a city. Um, I don't think so, um, but um, we're right at that uh, cusp right now. So our, um, we have grown a lot um, since 2016. Uh, we were sitting somewhere around 9,800, um, so we're seeing an increase of at least 8%, uh, which is amazing for a smaller community. And um, so we do have that small town feel within our region. Um, I know there's a lot of people that have driven around today and we have some of the oldest buildings here, so we are one of the oldest towns uh, within Alberta. Um, so that's uh, always something that I like to see when I drive around and see some of the rebuilds that we're doing and ensuring that that town feel is actually um, put through. So some of the growth pressures. Um, We've got some replacements to do. Um, Mournville um, has two new schools in the past two, last years, uh, St. Catherine Takawitha Academy and the Four Winds Public School, which I was just in the other day and I was always surprised at the uh, size of the new schools and how they are different from when I went to school. Um, but this development has also been a massive economic driver um, and because of that, we've actually seen new home developments come into the community. Um, and we just finished another uh, one uh, the other day for, as council uh, to put together, so that's great. Um, in addition, we also see a growing retail sector. Um, I know that some of you have seen the house on um, 100th Street and 100th Ave on the corner there. It was totally rebuilt. And we're starting to see that constantly, um, you know, upgrading of our corridor. Um, we've seen, uh, most recently, the Atlas crossing on the west side of town, 
if you drive out straight under the overpass, just before the overpass, there's a brand new, and it's, I believe that is now full. Um, and we also see the maturing of down con downtown core. Um, we've just had a couple of new businesses open up with our community there. Um, so again, with all the newness that's happening, I really appreciate our community stepping forward and moving forward uh, to um, reconsider some of the, sometimes people just want the newness. And I think sometimes we just need to get into town and actually look at what we have, what are the sources, what are the resources, and move that forward. And I appreciate our residents uh, for being able to do that. Uh, we are f a face with maturing infrastructure, like every town that's our age. And uh, with the decrease of MSI funding and other support, it is a burden on the town. And we do not have the reserves, a lot of times necessary, to fulfill all the wants of the community. So challenges and investment needs. I think I heard a lot of the challenges and investment needs from other communities, and I don't think we're that much different than any other community within the Edmonton re uh, you know, region. So um, Morinville challenges, investments. Um, part of it is that we have uh, a community, and I heard it said earlier, but we have high level expectation. So we see our community leave, they come back, and no different than we want that food cooked when we get home. Uh, we want our streets repaired. We want um, all these things done exactly like we think we have wanted done. We also, um, and, and I appreciate that, but at the same time, how high can we go with our tax levels in order to meet those needs? Um, so those are the challenges. Um, so municipal, municipality risks. Similar to our neighbors again, the reduction of MSI grants. And I heard earlier again, but I'm gonna specify it again, the RCMP cost was certainly not something that was just an expectation to this last council. So our council then has it, and it actually impacts the operation. It, op it, it impacts everybody's tax base. And that's an important aspect within our community. So for our budgets, we've actually had to reduce the budget in order to pay all these bills that are stacking up. Um, and at the same time, make sure that our level of expectation is still met from the residents. Um, Mournville will continue to strongly advocate to work regionally regarding shared services, which I see is so important to try to get that level back up. So shared services is a very important part of our efficiencies within our community. So we have some untapped opportunities, which as a business owner, I always look at, and as a mayor, I just, I just love to tackle that. I think that's a great item that we have, op untapped opportunities. Um, with over 50 acres of public and private lands available for sale, lease, or to be able to be developed along high traffic and high visibility corridors, Warrenville offers great opportunities for investment, whether small or large. We're positioned on a Cana, Cana Mex corridor linking Canada to Mexico through the United States. And I know we don't think about that. Well, I think those thoughts need to come into our area, even with um, the region, is that we are on that corridor right now and we have access. We have access to road, rail, and also to air services, as explained earlier by Sturgeon County. We have a younger age demographic with above average household income, and I really appreciate that about Mournville. We know that there's a certain amount of income here that can actually forge this community into the next century. It's attractive to franchises. Um, the town of Mournville has urban amenities with small town lifestyle that attracts an educated, skilled, and motivated workforce. Strategic priorities. Our council has just completed the new strategic plan. We just put it through the vote uh, last Tuesday. And this plan has been a huge learning curve as we have four new members and we're all committed to the process, every one of us. And I really appreciate that about our council, that we worked hard to get this completed along with administration. 
And we have determined that Mournville is a community that will, with a small town feel, we all feel proud to live, play, and participate. We are an inclusive community. In a community that prioritizes the safety and well-being of residents and businesses. We are a community focused on improving its financial health while de demonstrating value for its money. Very conservative when it comes to just why are we spending this money. As an environmental steward, as an em environmental steward through collaboration, innovation, education, and implementation. We have a diverse economy with thriving businesses, quality jobs, and growing businesses opportunities. We are a trusted and valued partner in the regional and community stakeholder collaboration. We want to ensure that we collaborate on economic developments. Top three priorities for the region. That intermunicipal collaboration framework is a very important aspect of us, uh, of our community. We want to make sure that we are um, shared investment for shared benefits. We have regionally, we do have beneficial developments within our area. And we again collaborate economic development. And with that, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh -oh. Okay. Forward for some, backward for others. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name's Tandy DeBlanco. I'm Mayor of Leduc County. Uh, and I want to start by just saying you never know where a conversation's going to go. About three and a half years ago during a break, uh, Karen Wichak and myself were sitting down and talking about the differences that exist in the, in the members of the EMRB. And sort of out of that conversation came this notion of sharing our municipal realities. And if you take a look, and there's a great summary of everybody's in the folder on your table, but if you take a look, the operating budget differences range from $20 million to $3 billion. Mm -hmm. Just with the 13 communities. So it shows that we are very diverse and our ability to contribute and our ability to work together is different for all of us. This one? Sure. All right. So what do you know about Leduc County? Leduc County, of course, is in the southern part um, of the region, and we've had a small increase in population from census to census, uh, from about 13,100 to 14,000. We have, like all rural municipalities, a very strong res, non-res breakdown in assessment, and that's, of course, because we're a real, rural municipality and we don't have a lot of people living where we are. Going the wrong way again. So what are some of our growth pressures? Um, I think one of the things that we found, although you could see that our, um, we're, our population went up, it's going up in our country residential and in our urban growth uh, uh, areas beside the city of Beaumont, not out in the rural areas. And so one of our pressures is really about rural depopulation. And I remember listening to Doug one time talk about commu uh, complete communities and you need to have a, a past and a present and a future and a whole bunch of things to create a, uh, a community. And what we're seeing now is that because we have one farmer where we used to have 15, um, the need for those smaller communities, the villages and the towns in Leduc County um, and in other areas to provide services is shrinking and shrinking. And if I'm having to drive into the city of Leduc or the city of Edmonton to get a part for the tractor or the baler or whatever that, I might stop there and get something to eat and do all those other sort of things. And so what we're finding is that rural depopulation is, going, is an issue. And um, once a, a small village gets to a certain size, sometimes they choose to dissolve and become a hamlet again, which then becomes the responsibility uh, of the rural municipality, and it creates some significant issues. So that's one of the things, it's good, and it's, but it's not happening where we need it to have. Um, we heard the other two, or the other three uh, rural municipalities talk about farmland, and you'll hear me talk about it a lot, partly because I'm still an active farmer, um, but partly because I am just passionate about 
the need to preserve our prime farmland. And what we know, of course, is that people lived in started towns where the land was good to farm, and so there's always the, the need to expand onto that land is putting pressure as well as the, our desire to try and save it for uh, food producing land, what it, which it is. Um, I had an interesting conversation with our MLA, Mark Smith, a couple of weeks ago, and he's been working really hard uh, to look at diversification into hemp and looking and trying to work with in Leduc County for hemp diversification and was asking if I knew any farmers who would be interested in, in, in seeding hemp this, this year. And, and my first thought was, I hope every farmer is seeding canola and wheat because there's not a seed going in the ground in the Ukraine. And although hemp is a great crop, I think we need to be refocusing on how do we best use that farmland. So I'm going to get off that, that uh, right now and go on to uh, growth and development. We are having a lot of growth uh, pressures actually when it comes to warehouse and logistics and that's a good thing. Over the pandemic in 2020, our uh, new area of NISCU, North NISCU, just adjacent to 41st Avenue, actually grew by 52% partly because we were ready. We took the time, we had it zoned, we were shovel ready, businesses could come in, and we, we saw the need for more and more warehousing. As the airport grows, as the cargo ability at EIA grows, so does our ability to host that as close as we are across the highway from the airport. So we're continuing to find ways to help that uh, grow. And, and I, used, I think I used the term in February the big unknown, and I'm still, it's a bit of a cricket in the room, is where is agribusiness going? And why isn't landing here in the Edmonton metropolitan region? Why are we not hosting more canola crushing plants, fractionation for uh, pulses, all of those sorts of things. I hear some of them are going down to the Calgary region, but we need to become more active about getting that whole notion of agribusiness going, and Leduc County's working hard on that, and we'll have to continue to work hard on it as a group. So when we look at our assessment base, what are, what are, we, what are we drawing from? The NISCU Business Park provides about a third. The Edmonton International Airport about uh, you know, 15%, and then way out in out west, much like uh, Parkland County, we have uh, Capital Power, uh, the Genesee generating uh, station using coal currently and still to generate electricity, but uh, making the switch over there to um, natural gas in the next little bit. So those were where we get our uh, bulk of our assessment, uh, our assessment money. So what are our challenges? And you've heard this, you've heard this, you've heard this. It's about infrastructure. And it's trying to keep up. We have over 300 bridges and 1,700 kilometers of gravel roads to maintain in the county. And a lot of those roads are still the old just raised roads where we pulled up the soil and we put some gravel on them. And so in a, re a wet year like we had two years ago, uh, we saw significant deterioration of those roads and added, um, investment in them. Um, we did, however, or we are, however, working really hard and have started the Spine Road. And this is a really important road for the region. It will run, and you can see on the map, it will run north to south from 41st Avenue all the way down to Airport Road. And now with the announcement of 65th Avenue, we'll be looking to expand to there um, as an alternate two things, an alternate road to uh, Highway 2, which becomes very backlogged. Once industry and, and the economy picks up again, we know what that looks like. But it also allows the county to open up new areas for industrial growth to the east. And so we're working on that. We were able to fund uh, the, spi the Spine Road internally by the county through our money we received from the, um, just the Canada Coal Transition Fund, which had to then reinvest into infrastructure. And so uh, we took the money that we got from the phase out of coal in the West End and in, are investing it to ensure that we have a future for in industry um, in our central area. Broadband, and we heard, I think we've heard all the rules talk about the broadband's challenge, so I won't talk too much about that. We know, and we learned through COVID, we learned through the pandemic, that if you have three children trying to do homework and you're trying to get online to do a Zoom meeting, you better not try and put the, the video on because it isn't going to work. So we need to find a way to make that be a utility like power and gas so that everybody has 
um, adequate and uh, the right type of um, ability to access that. We also are trying to, to figure out how to manage those new technologies like drones. We now have drone delivery and, and uh, the county funded uh, the pilot at the uh, airport around dr drone delivery. So what does that look like? And what do we have to change? And what does that mean for infrastructure? And what does that mean for other ways that we interact? So we're still trying to figure those types of things out. Um, our challenges in Leduc County, and, and as you all know, EIA is um, in the county of Leduc. We are the municipality in which it resides. Um, and really one of the biggest things is to continue to attract those new flights to EIA. We heard uh, just a couple of weeks ago from the airport that they were able to recover 54 direct flights that they had lost during the pandemic, uh, partly because of the uh, money that we had put in to the, um, and I've just lost the name of it, what is it, Bob? The Air, Air Services. Opportunity, Air Opportunity Fund. Thank you, I knew he'd know. See, that's why we always go on together. <laughs> the Air Opportunity Fund. Yeah. And again, that's critically important because it's for your residents to be able to have ease of travel. It's to attract head offices to Edmonton and the region, and it's also to, also to ensure that goods and services and people are able to move around the region. Um, we continue to see the encroachment uh, of non-agricultural developments onto agricultural land. Again, critically important that companies take the sober second look, that, that take the time to actually engage with municipalities prior to uh, putting you know, offers or deals onto land so that we can provide perhaps alternatives that, that, that isn't prime farmland that we need and we will continue to need to grow our food. Um, and we're also, and I mentioned this a little bit before, the fiscal viability of smaller urban centers with the county, within the county. Uh, Leduc County puts about $3 million out a year in rec uh, cost shares across uh, the county, and we continue to work with our smaller communities on some of those harder services like fire um, to in and uh, joint emergency services to ensure that those smaller communities are able to stay viable. Because the longer they stay viable, the easier it is for us to continue to have that collaborative activity and, and provide those opportunities for people to live and work in the county. Uh, opportunities. Agricultural intens intensification supply chain development. And as you can see, we have about 50 different types of agricultural products coming out of the county, uh, like sturgeon, like parkland, like Strathcona. Uh, that, is a, that is our second biggest industry. We rely on that a great deal. And again, we need to be really mindful. We need to figure out what the gap is about why secondary egg produ production is not landing in our region, whether it's in Mournville or Strathcona County or the city of Leduc or Devon, it doesn't matter. The closer it is here, the easier it is for our farmers to access, the more likely that type of activity is going to continue. You know, really, if you build it, they will come, and I guess that you have to have a little bit of, of work on the, on the back end too, but we need to be thinking about how do we get that happening? How does that become an advocacy effort for this group? Um, again, uh, oh, I've got to do this, I think. Um, I talked a little bit about the warehouse logistics uh, and storage and if the whole notion of supply chain components. Uh, we are exactly on planes, trains and automobiles stealing Leduc City's uh, little adage that they always use and it makes it easy to move goods and services around the region from the airport onto our high load corridors and we need to be mindful of protecting those as well because we believe that we will have uh, in Leduc County, um, as the heartland continues to grow, a key opportunity to do that advanced manufacturing, to be able to create any types of modules they need and move them to the area as long as we maintain those key transportation areas, um, which is what we're sort of aiming to do. And uh, we are currently in the process of revisioning our old NISCU, so you know the NISCU area that has all the, the pipe yards and kind of the empty, we've actually done a new um, structure plan for that and some new zoning so that we'll be ready 
for the businesses to come in when we're ready to do that type of advanced manufacturing. Uh, much like everybody else, the county's been working on strategic priorities. These are from our last council. Our new ones aren't quite ready, but really looking at that agricultural innovation and support for local food. We need people to know where their food comes from. We need people to be accessing those local areas uh, for carbon footprint and all of those sorts of pieces. Uh, maintaining and enhancing those transportation systems that we need, again, for business industry and for our uh, residents. Uh, continued economic development, uh, the leadership that happens at this table, the discussions that happen at these, these tables, the decisions that happen at these tables impact us all in a positive way and we need to continue to work on those types of, of activities. So we're going to continue to work on those relationships between municipalities. Uh, I think we did 15 ICFs, IDPs, I think it was 15. Um, happy to do them good opportunities to talk. Not a lot of change when we did them because we have good working relationships, but it really brought, brought to the forefront how we work together. We need to continue to collaborate um, and look at the EIA and Villeneuve Airport as being drivers, economic drivers, and we cannot turn our back on them. We need to continue investing as a region in those areas. And again, um, protecting that uh, prime farmland, uh, through ramp implementation. We know how important that is, especially in the world um, that we're living in now. Things you should know about us that despite the airport being a, a main contributor, by the time we pay our bills at the airport, we're getting about 10% of that money back. Uh, like most of you, we've been hard hit by the uh, oil and gas sector downturn, but I'm finding it harder to turn left when I leave the office out of NISCU, so things must be picking up because there's way more traffic in there now, so we are seeing that resurgence. I heard uh, something like 6,500 new wells maybe being drilled. You might, you can debate that's good or bad, but it is jobs for, for our residents. And again, uh, this one was very, very um, sobering. Uh, we've lost 23,000 acres in the last five years due to annexation for urban growth. And everybody has to grow, but that's a lot. That's a lot of loaves of bread. So uh, with that, thank you very much for the opportunity. Sorry uh, if I went over 10 minutes, but uh, that's Leduc County. And now the city Leduc will stand between you and lunch. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, we have another group before lunch. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. Let's, don't, not don't, you. you're not getting up yet. Just be patient. Grand Chief, our I know you have a press conference now. If it, you can excuse yourself any time, it's a, such an important subject. So, sure. Thank you very much, and just know that we're all behind you and with you in this. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bob. Thank you, Doug. So, and again, uh, Simon, this is an absolutely amazing facility. Thank you for getting us out here. I think that's one of the things that I really appreciate the most about EMRB is it forces us to get out and actually see all the amazing municipalities that are in this region. You know, sometimes, you know, we sort of get stuck with, uh, you know, like uh, Councillor Houston from uh, Spruce Grove, where he thinks that the only really good place in the region is Spruce Grove. But, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but we know that there are a lot of amazing municipalities here, so. And, and the other thing I want to throw out to before I start is um, County of Leduc, um, again, really good partner. Um, whenever we do the, because uh, Leduc uh, sports tourism is a big part of us, and when we talk about the, uh, the uh, rec share agreement that we have with them, it always amazes me that um, there's very few other communities in, in Canada that have uh, such an agreement. So it, it is a, a tribute to Leduc County that they do realize that their residents use our facilities and then and, and they're willing to help contribute to that. So. That'll be maybe the only good thing I say about Leduc County today. <laughs> no, that's not true. Anyways, uh, on to Leduc. So, uh, as many of you know, Leduc is located directly south of Edmonton. Uh, we're within the county of Leduc, so that means that we don't have to do uh, 15 ICFs, we only do one. So, we appreciate that. And again, we neighbor with the, uh, the International Airport, too. And Edmonton, compared to Calgary, Edmonton will never, ever match the passenger traffic that Calgary does. Calgary, you know, has established itself as a major hub, uh, but Calgary will never, ever match Edmonton when it comes to cargo. And that's one of the things that I think Leduc County and ourselves have both uh, really taken advantage of, and we know um, 
Edmonton International Airport is the shortest route over the poles, and they've established themselves as the uh, first place that um, any planes coming from Asia, um, the first stop is at EIA. So that's really uh, something that we've been trying to take advantage of. Our uh, city covers approximately uh, 4,300 hectares, or 43 uh, square kilometers, or 10,600 acres, and we are home to more than 34,000 people, although, again, that's a, an old uh, estimate, or old survey. So for 2022, our operating budget is approximately $107 million, and our projected capital budget for this year is about $25 million. And our current borrowing capacity is about $81 million, leaving about 55% available to our provincial limit. Although we do have our own um, City of Leduc limit, which is at about 75% of our borrowing capacity. Oops. How did I do that? Hmm. He's watching a YouTube right now. <laughs> yeah, I want to get my name in the news again. <laughs> <laughs> So our total assessment is just over $6 billion, including uh, $11 million for machinery equipment, which we do not tax. In addition to our residential assessment, our three largest non-residential assessment contributors are from industrial, oil and gas, and large retail sectors. Our, our goal, oh, let's go there. So our goal is to currently we sit at 67% uh, residential and 33% non-res. Our goal has always been 60-40. Um, during uh, the COVID uh, and with all our residential growth, it's been very difficult to achieve. But again, uh, that's one of our goals. Like most municipalities around this table, um, we are all um, experiencing growth pressures. And uh, I don't think that we're any different than any other municipality, and that's something that we're gonna have to deal with. When we talk about uh, challenges, uh, while the City of Leduc benefits from proximity to EIA, and we continue to support their 24-7 operations, this unique geographic location poses some challenges to Leduc's growth and development. The city uh, has been impacted by the Provincial Airport Vicinity Protection Area regulations. Uh, it restricts our land use and has forced our city to sprawl. So instead of one fire hall, we have two and soon we will have a third one just because we have to keep the 10-minute uh, response times. We've been working with the Edmonton International Airport and Municipal Affairs to change some of the restrictions and we're hopeful that the minister will be signing off on the new AVPA legislation soon, which will allow our city to grow and redevelop while still maintaining and supporting the 24-7 operations of EIA. And AVPA has made it very difficult. In fact, we can't meet the uh, growth requirements of EMRB. So what's going to happen with some of these restri restrictions being uh, changed is it's going to allow us to redevelop our downtown and there's going to be new residential areas that previously weren't allowed to be residential. I'm very proud of the steps our council took during COVID. It has positioned us very well to take advantage of the growth uh, that we're going to experience during this term. It's going to be a major challenge dealing with the potential growth. The way things are going, we are going to experience the largest growth in residential, commercial, and industrial properties ever in the history of Leduc. And it's a great challenge, but uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you right now, it's also a little scary, because you have to be ready to handle all that growth. So, one of, the, one of the opportunities that we had, and again, I want to thank all the mayors in the room for signing uh, the letter of support. It worked. Um, it, yes, it's, it's great. I, I think that's, that's uh, just one indication of what uh, the EMRB can accomplish uh, when we uh, put all our uh, efforts towards a project. And I, I, I look forward to making sure that as a region that we, we start to help and also advocate for projects in our region. So the QE2 uh, 65th Avenue interchange, uh, it'll open up the South Airport lands and it'll also open up North uh, Leduc lands for development. Uh, the project is a collective win for our region. It's projected to generate $600 million in investment growth. It'll create 470 new construction jobs for the next three years and 4,300 permanent multi-sector jobs. 
It will provide enhanced trade opportunities to help Alberta's economy by increasing exports to international markets by 4.5% and to the U.S. markets by 1.3%. So we just recently uh, completed our strategic plan and the, uh, our focus areas are a city where people want to live, work and play, a city with a plan for the future, an economically prosperous city and region, and a collaborative community builder and regional partner. Leduc's priorities are further developing our relationships and continued better regional planning, finding better solutions to our common problems in a collaborative environment, so dealing with solid waste, regional transit, collective economic development, and rural broadband. And while we've been fortunate enough, uh, TELUS is uh, just completing their investment in our community, so our residents have access to high-speed uh, broadband. Uh, the problem is, is that many of the people that live around our community um, do not. And just as Tani said, is during COVID, um, it was a struggle for uh, even some of the mayors to be, even be able to participate virtually with the EMRB because they just don't have good broadband. And so we see that it's important. Uh, though our rural neighbors, they recreate in our community, they shop in our community, they go to school in our community. And so it is a priority with us to try and help uh, develop rural broadband. And again, I think one of the ways that we'll be able to achieve this is through the EMRB. Supporting the long-term economic prosperity and livability of the region and ensuring that the region is a global competitor through the work of organizations like Edmonton Global. Okay. In case you've missed it, here's a few things you may not know about Leduc. So the city of Leduc has long been a complete community. We are not a bedroom community to the city of Edmonton. Significant employment opportunities exist within the city of Leduc and the surrounding region. In fact, 60% of our residents work in Leduc and the surrounding region. Leduc has invested heavily in sports tourism. Our Leduc Recreation Center and William Lady Park facilities are amazing. We pride ourselves on hosting best ever events. We are five minutes from the Edmonton International Airport and have 3,000 hotel rooms within 15 minutes of all our sports venues. The last year before COVID, we hosted 150 events that brought $10 million into our community. Two years ago, we built a beautiful new clubhouse at our golf course, which allowed us to host the uh, U18 Women's National Golf Championship last year that brought 400 visitors to our community for a week, benefiting our hotels and our restaurants. We also hosted the Rogers Hometown Hockey and uh, I just have to say the home talk, uh, hometown hockey staff were quick to point out that we had way more people attending the Spruce Grove, or, or attending than Spruce Grove, even though Leduc has a smaller population than Spruce Grove. <laughs> <laughs> and again, we love competing with Spruce Grove and all the great communities uh, that we have in the Edmonton Metro region. We have over 80, 80 kilometers of multi-way that people uh, from around the region come to enjoy. In this year's budget, uh, we've... Uh, included funds to build a new West Campus Recreation Center that will be adjacent to a new public high school which will be breaking ground later this month. As I said earlier, we are preparing for one of the best years ever, and as you've heard today, that seems to be a common theme around all the amazing municipalities in the Edmonton metro region. We're also, uh, as Tani was saying, you know, we, we need to start looking at attracting more agribusiness here. And again, uh, one of the, I think the best kept secrets is that we are home to the Leduc Food Processing Center and uh, Agribusiness Incubator. And uh, it's, it's one of the largest facilities of its kind in the world. And you know, it's time that we start partnering with it and the University of Alberta to take advantage of that. Our council looks forward to working with all of our regional partners, and we know that we are stronger hunting as a pack. Thank you. Thank you to all of you very much. I was, I was um, very impressed and very excited to hear of, of the discussions about regional collaboration um, around tourism, because um, an example I've seen many times, PEI has, one of, has three of the world's top 10 golf courses. And I was there and saw three of those golf courses all in one brochure. And I remember asking a friend of mine in PI, why are they all marketing together? Aren't they competing? 
And he said, uh, we only have 135,000 people in PEI. Those golf courses wouldn't be viable with just us. We need more to come to PEI. We need to grow the pie. But they're not coming for one golf course, but they'll come for a week to two or three golf courses. And so we recognize we need to work together. And so talking about tourism, um, leveraging agribusiness development and drawing more in, even the Canamex Trade Corridor, a friend of mine in Texas, Michael Reeves, some of you may have met him, used to be the executive director of the, the Canamex Trail. He's a funny man. He's like five foot two, votes Democrat, loves ice hockey, and doesn't have any guns. And yet he lives in Texas. It's kind of ironic. But he's a, he's a wonderful person, Said, told me once that it took, if you brought goods from Texas up the Canamex Trail to Edmonton to the coast and you were shipping stuff to Asia, it was six days faster to do that than it was to go to San Francisco and try and go overseas. And we don't leverage that infrastructure enough. But we've talked a lot about agriculture already. The question I have for you guys is about social issues. On the rural side, we have rural depopulation, um, protection of agricultural land, environmental issues we need to address, which I still think are, are also social issues. And on the urban side, we have lack of housing, lack of affordable housing, capacity issues for delivering services, as Chief Arcand mentioned, and growing wants and expectations, which are very hard for us to deliver on. How does the region, how could it work better together to address some of those social issues? And just as a caveat, I just came from a jurisdiction in the United States that's working on regional collaboration, and one of the smaller communities on the fringe said, we don't want um, uh, subway, uh, light rail trains and buses to come out to our community because that will bring drugs, that will bring homeless, that will bring impoverished people, and yet it's still an issue the region has to address and address collaboratively. So if I, any of you want to address that? <coughs> I can go on. Um, so interesting. Uh, question and, and one of the things that Bob, I know the City of Leduc and myself and Beaumont and uh, the Leduc Housing Foundation works uh, really hard. We all contribute to it. Uh, we all pay, pay a requisition to it and started out really just looking at seniors and seniors housing and has now expanded into affordable housing um, in the City of Leduc. It, it, is, it is a struggle. It is hard um, to gain support in a lot of ways for that. But we also know that, again, a, a community isn't complete unless you can make sure that, and I think you said at one time, if you can't find the type of housing you want, then you're homeless, right? And, mm -hmm. and so that, I, that struck with me for a long time because we don't think about it like that. But I think that we can work together, um, and it seems to work really well sub-regionally. I don't know what it, how it feeds up to the regional table, but I think that if we continue to address it sub-regionally, because what, what we know and what we learn by looking at some data from Leduc Foundation is that there's a lot of farmers who will retire to the city of Leduc for two or three years in a house and then transition into um, uh, Plainview or one of our lodges and, but they're recorded as being from the city of Leduc then. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand the mobility. We need to understand where people want to go. And so I think that's one of the ways sub-regionally that we deal with um, some of those social issues, especially around um, affordable housing. Still, still an issue out, out in, in rural Alberta. You still need to have a car mm -hmm. to live in the country per se. And that changes who you attract to come out there as well. Thanks. Thanks. I think one of the biggest things is that we do have, you know, even in smaller towns, we have social issues like that, where there's homelessness and stuff like that. And I think our community has done a great job. Uh, we have Paul Crosskoff Place, for example, which was built by a housing foundation. And it's actually a net zero building that we built. And um, I think it's great. I uh, believe there's somewhere around 40 uh, units there that are able to be house or residents. Um, and we do get people from outside. We also, uh, which I think is, is awesome because I spoke to Grand Chief um, George Arkan Jr. about this and this is our Jessica Martel Foundation. And I think, you know, when we talk about um, homelessness, that isn't just for families, but it's also for mothers that um, may not have a place to live in their own homes. Right. Um, so those are important factors. And uh, I know that within our town, Jessica Martel houses many of those needs uh, be it male or female. So I really appreciate that. And I think we have to ensure that that fabric is built throughout the Edmonton region. Excellent. Yeah, 
I agree. The probably homelessness and affordable housing is probably one of the most complicated and it's probably one of the most important issues that we have to deal right now. And I think that this might be something that as a region that we can deal with. Um, I think we have to advocate because normally it isn't um, a, a municipal responsibility. It's usually a provincial responsibility. But uh, if we don't do something, um, I think there's a lot of families right now that are only uh, a paycheck away from being homeless. And I think that uh, it's a bigger problem when they do become homeless to solve. And I, I think so, uh, I know in the city of Leduc that that's one of the things we're looking at is ways that we can, um, with rent subsidies and, and helping out with utilities. And so, you know, we're gonna really need to wrap our heads around this uh, because like I say, it's one of the most complicated things that I've ever uh, had to look at and our council's looking at. And I think that as a region, um, we can certainly uh, come up with some solutions that will help us out with that. Excellent. Thank you very much to all three of you for, uh, all four of you for joining us. Thank you very much. We have one more panel um, before lunch, so please bear with me. Uh, I would like to invite up uh, the representatives from the city of Fort Saskatchewan, the city of Edmonton, the town of Devon, and the city of Beaumont. All right, Gail, we'll start with the uh, city of Fort Saskatchewan. Sorry, I just have to get organized no here. No uh, Let's see. Not technically. Ah, there it is. All right. So for everybody sitting here, and I know we are between lunch, and I just wanted to tell you, they just passed us a note and said, by the way, remind them that there's a test after this, after lunch. So on your tables, if you haven't been paying attention, there is a book with all of this information that has been provided. Not really. So now that I've got your attention, and I will try and talk fast because we are between lunch. Um, so the city of Fort Saskatchewan. Um, so I, what I like to always talk about, um, and as you look at our logo here, I'm always very proud of the Northwest Mounted Police that we have, and I'm just going to take one minute for a short story. So I just want everyone to picture. Um, in 1874, Inspector Jarvis, along with 20 of his men came along the North Saskatchewan River and they came upon a Métis settlement and that is where they decided to establish the fort on the North Saskatchewan River. And through their winter, the Métis uh, Indigenous people who lived there, they were the ones that helped them survive, helped them to build the fort and because of that, Fort Saskatchewan grew and became what it is now. So as you can see, we're uh, 27,088 residents, and uh, just a second here, sorry. 27,088 residents, uh, 5,782 hectares, and yes, we have a very nice healthy budget, and that is primarily due to the growth pressures that we have been experiences experiencing. So as we talk about the growth that Fort Saskatchewan has had, yes, we did become a village in um, 18... 1899, a town in 1904, and a city in 1985. And the city started to ex uh, have extreme population growth. So we were built on law and order. We had the provincial jail, but then in 1952, Sherrod Gordon Mines uh, started in Fort, uh, Fort Saskatchewan, and later Dow Chemical. And of course, then it became the start of the Heartland Industrial Area, where we are very prosperous when we talk about this. So since 2000, we have continu continued to see high population growth rates, and the census said that we've grown over 12%. 
Now, uh, us, like a lot of the other cities, are also talking about the fact that the census numbers are a little bit n incorrect. So most of us will be doing our own census next year. And, you know, we're very pleased to say that our growth is connected to the heavy industrial um, heavy industrial that we have in the heartland. It's because of Dow, Dow Canada, Shell, IPL, and we anticipate the fort is still going to welcome many new residents well into the future. So challenges and investment needs. So when you think about Fort Saskatchewan, we're snuggled in between Strathcona County, Sturgeon County, and the city of Edmonton kisses us uh, to, the, to the west, just across the river, just a tiny bit. But uh, because of that, we have a Highway 15 and 21 corridor that runs through our community, and it really is a spine road, and it provides the critical access to Alberta's industrial heartland. So this is one of our pressures that we have. Now, for a lot of you, who, uh, who have been around for a while, you'll remember the conversations that we had about NERC or the Northeast River Crossing. And for at least for a decade, uh, we were talking with the provincial government about building another bridge that would connect from, from the north to the south. Um, unfortunately, that was cancelled due to politics, but at the end of the day, we were very pleased to actually get the... Um, Highway 15 bridge announced, which is going to provide us a lot of benefits. So given um, we don't have conclusive data on, on exactly how the new bridge is going to impact mm -hmm. our, our, our traffic counts, we know that there is going to have to be modeling, additional modeling done, you know, to assess these impacts. You know, currently we have assumptions, but you know, as time goes by, you always have to ensure those assumptions are complete. Um, our city manager, Troy, who's sitting over there, continues to tell me that uh, we are going to have to, um, at some point in time, if, if we don't have other roadways that are built, expand our, uh, our, our um, highway corridor to four to six lanes. And the cost of that is $120 million. So if you just think about that, as a municipality, it's something that we can't afford by ourselves. And that's something we will be seeking the region to help us with that. You know, we continue to say what drives our success is the industrial hub, and it has been created in the Alberta's industrial heartland, and that does continue to attract uh, economic benefit, not only to Fort Saskatchewan, but to the heartland region, our partners, but also to the entire province of Alberta and to Canada, because we are the largest Petro-Canada hub. So like many of you, as we have the growth that we have, uh, everybody's been experiencing, we too have the same, same problems. We, um, uh, we also have a very young population, and over 50% of our population is below the age of 35. So there's a lot of babies being born and a lot of parents saying we need more amenities within our community. And that's something that our council is very conscious of. So of course, currently we're talking about, you know, at our council, what do we have to do to provide the quality of life for our citizens? And not only that, be able to maintain these amenities and be able to afford them. So we know that there will have to be additional investments into our recreation. It's just how we figure out how we're gonna pay for it and, um, you know, get the support of not only our community, but actually the sub-region as well. Because we do support Sturgeon County, north part of Sturgeon County, many of their residents come to Fort Saskatchewan for their recreational needs. The other area that we struggle with, like many people, is neighborhood revitalization. And we all know that there's ongoing maintenance that's never ending for our existing neighborhoods. And we too also see our, our, our older neighborhoods uh, depleting in, in the number of people that are living there. We have a lot of people that are just one, one person or two people living in these, and we would really like to see the infill and more families uh, joining in there. But uh, we take a lot of pride in the work that we're doing with our neighborhoods and trying to revitalize them. So what are our biggest risks? 
So I know many people talked about, you know, we all have the similar ones. But for me, because I uh, live and, and are part of the Alberta's Industrial Heartland, to me, we say climate change is real, but the federal regulations are something that's having a huge impact on the industrial heartland. We, we talk about the fact that we want to grow and attract new businesses there, heavy industrial, but we also have federal reg regulations that are making it more and more challenging for this industry. So that's something that we all have to be conscious of. But really what I want to focus on here is even though their regulations uh, are challenging to us, our heavy industry in our region is really being innovative to ensure that we're able to pivot the technologies to be responsive to these challenges. Just think about it. Dow, Dow Canada recently announced the world's first zero ethylene cracker, which is going to, uh, which will decarbonize 20% of their global uh, global ethylene capacity. Lindy is preparing to produce LNG, a transport fuel, which is 40% less carbon intense. C Celio transforms landfill waste into uh, renewable fuels and conventional diesel. So our industrial partners, if anybody's talking uh, about what's going on, you need to ensure that we are being innovative. And the one that I want to throw out there, because I get annoyed quite often, is the fact that our industrial partners want to be part of the solution. But when we throw plastic out there as being toxic, that upsets me. Or 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 foil foreign ugh, sorry foreign oil that is allowed to pass through our coast because it labels our partners as the problem. Our partners are not the problem; they're part of the solution. So when you're making your decisions at council, remember that there is a circular economy that's happening with plastics, um, and our partners are being very responsible. And I've got studies that will talk about those one-use plastic bags that are actually two-use, and their carbon intensity is far less. So that's my vent. Um, so uh, the other, uh, the other um, one that we had is when we talk about it's easier to develop greenfield, greenfield lands. Well, that's what our rural partners are talking about. We need to get back and get in and start doing more landfill. With the rapid growth that's coming, it's not always about looking out to say where the next area is going to be developed. It's about looking inwards and say, where can we redevelop those lands? And I think that that's something that's very, very important. And one thing that we really talk about at our, our council is the fact that as part of this development, we want some of our affordable housing done done within the context of our downtown, which really is the heart and soul of our community. The other one that we've all talked about, of course, is the unpredictable funding from the provincial government. And we all talk about that, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But we have the same impacts as everybody else as when it comes to the funding with MSI. And you know, with each of these grants that we get, we know that we have to pivot. And I don't want to be critical, but yes, when the RCMP said, or the federal government said, we're going to pay for RCMP or they're doing negotiations, our city manager was very proactive. He said to our council, this is like a slow train to come on council. He said, if we don't start putting money aside now, then we are not going to be positioned to be able to fund that. And we don't want to leave ourselves in a position where we don't have the... Uh, the ability to pay for that if that happens. We hope the federal government will come through and actually start uh, maybe paying for that contract, but uh, at the end of the day, it's always about being proactive. So uh, some of our untapped opportunities are that we are pivoting with heavy industry, and as I indicated before, some of the innovation that, that I've talked about, so I'm not going to go through those again. But one of the ones that we're very proud of is that we are partnering with ADCO um, in 2021, and they have announced Fort Saskatchewan will be the first hydrogen blending project where natural gas 
containing 5% of uh, hydrogen will be included into 2,200 of our homes. And then they hope as the pilot continues, this will continue. And uh, this is something that, as all municipalities, we can look at as an in innovation to reduce the amount of carbon. So let's just talk about Fort Saskatchewan. Here's one that I'm really proud of. From one end to the other end of the city of Fort Saskatchewan, it's like a bookend from the River Valley trails. So it's another untapped opportunity, and when you live on the banks of the North Saskatchewan River, of course the opportunities are huge. And we took the uh, advantage at our West River's edge through COVID to build this beautiful skating trail, uh, skating pond, uh, to build uh, skating on our ponds, the trails, and you know that's something that was just really, really welcomed by our citizens because we were able to get hundreds and hundreds of people out there and out of their homes and uh, that really improved their mental health. So many things make us unique and I've talked about all of those things, but what really makes us unique is the fact we're an urban municipality with heavy industry. And I don't see Kathy Heron here, but yes, on, on her graph that shows that's what makes us unique, those three charts. So if you go back to those, um, that's something that we're very proud of. So we are an urban municipality with heavy industry, uh, uh, heavy industry that's just located to the east of us. And we are part of Elbridge Industrial Heartland that I'm so proud of. And it has taken us 22 years to get to the point that we are. We have tremendous assets that we're very proud of. And I'm going to say that, you know, um, with the truth and reconciliation that we have, our council has committed to continue to, to bring more of the history back so that we can talk about you know, where we came from, the Métis village, the people who are in our community. As a reminder, that is where we came from. We just didn't pop up as a hamlet somewhere else or a village somewhere else. We joined an indigenous community and they're the ones that helped us survive and thrive. And that is something that, you know, we're very proud of. So we do have, now we do have, uh, as part of our guiding document, our historical guiding document, we did fund a fort for Fort Saskatchewan. So we actually do have um, a replica that we invite people to come out. But in our guiding documents, it also talks about the fact that we do need to uh, have um, um, an indigenous component to this and uh, at some point in time I'm hoping that we will actually build the Métis community that, that actually existed there before. So I always encourage everybody, there's lots to see and do in Fort Saskatchewan. We're very proud of our community and we're very proud to be part of the Heartland, Edmonton Global and EMRB. So thank you, hopefully I talk fast enough and I'll pass this on. <laughs> Good, thank you Amberjee. Do I click next? You bet. No? One more. Keep going. Yeah. One more. There, there, we go. there you go. All right. First of all, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to share a bit about the city of Edmonton and learn uh, each other's realities. But I want to start by saying that uh, we also hosted Rogers Home Down Hockey. <laughs> But I, won't, but I won't tell you, I won't tell you how many people attended it. I'll keep that secret. Uh, uh, Simon, thank you so much for hosting us. Uh, you know, uh, you gave us a couple of brilliant people from your community to us, uh, Lisa Holmes, my chief of staff, and also our consular colleague, uh, Aaron Rutherford, who, uh, was, who grew up in, in your community. So uh, I wanna also ask my consular colleagues uh, to please stand up and be recognized for being here today. Councillor Knack, uh, Councillor Rutherford I mentioned, Councillor Tank, Councillor Cartmel, and uh, we had other council members, oh, Councillor Wright, Councillor Wright, and we had other council members who came, but they had to leave. Nine of us out of 13 joined you today, and really speaks to our commitment to the regional partnership. So, uh, yeah, please. <laughs> All right, so who are we? To tell the story of Edmonton, I will start by sharing some statistics. The uh, city of Edmonton comprises 765 square kilometers and a population of a million people. 
uh, our tax base, you can see here, is uh, capital budget is about uh, uh, $3 million billion, as well as our operating budget is uh, uh, as well as $3 billion. Uh, these are our neighbors. Our immediate neighbors are Enoch, uh, St. Albert, uh, Strathcona County, Parkland County, Sturgeon County, Leduc County, Devon, Beaumont, and Fort Saskatchewan, along with Edmonton International Airport and Edmonton Garrisons and our capital budget I already talked about. Uh, and similar to the region, uh, Edmonton is also anticipating significant population growth. Our city plan sets our direction for growing from a 1 million to a 2 million people within the current boundaries. To accommodate this, our city plan puts forward a new strategy to shift the focus of much of this growth from greenfield to infill development. Where, uh, whereby 50% of our new housing units will be added through infill. Uh, city plan also moves Edmonton towards 15 minute communities where everything you need will be within that travel time. This new approach will uh, result in more efficient growth as well as create a city that is more inclusive and welcoming. Challenges and investment needs. Achieving the vision of Edmonton outlined in the city plan within the context of the metropolitan region will come with challenges. We want Edmonton to be an attractive and inclusive place to live with future face facing employment opportunities, a vibrant downtown, social supports, affordable housing, and recreational cultural experiences. Addressing social issues such as houselessness, the opiate crisis, and transit safety are high priorities that need to be addressed. Together as a region, we, will, we, we are working to attract business investments while locally we support existing businesses in the recovery from the pandemic. Reducing Edmonton's carbon footprint through investments in transit and energy efficiency with the target of being a net zero carbon emission city by 2050. So risks, uh, no different than the risk you have identified. Uh, funding policy and legislative decisions of other orders of government will affect the projects and initiatives the city undertakes. Uh, as an example, all Alberta municipalities are grappling with a 25% uh, reduction over the three years, uh, beginning in 2021, uh, in the Municipal Sustainability Initiative Fund. That is a vital support for core infrastructure that we would have to uh, deal with now. While we anticipate uh, prosperity coming to Edmonton and the region, it is crucial that it's distributed in an equitable manner. Our city needs to be prosperous for all of us, not just some Edmontonians. We have seen a doubling of houselessness in the past two years and are also experiencing a crisis of drug poisoning and overdose. These social issues pose a greatest risk to our economic growth. And I was very pleased to hear some of the ideas from uh, other mayors how Edmonton can seek help from, uh, by distributing this burden across the, across the uh, region as well as uh, working together in the area of affordable housing and support of social housing. Uh, Edmonton also needs to shift away from more inefficient growth patterns to make better use of the land that we have. Without changes in our growth patterns, uh, we would find ourselves again with the land supply issues. <clears throat> opportunities. While there are challenges ahead, there are also great opportunities as well. Our city is privileged to have several strong relationships and partnership with the municipalities, nations, institutions, community organizations, and stakeholders. Working together will help drive better outcomes for the residents of Edmonton and the region. We need support from our regional partners to help us build a better relationship with the provincial government. To ensure that future prosperity does not leave anyone behind, we need to ensure marginalized communities and all Edmontonians are included in our successes. Edmonton is a hub for social services for our region and also for Northern Alberta and Canada. Edmonton continues to explore using new technologies and data to meet citizens' challenging, changing expectations. 
This also uh, allows us to further optimize our service, service delivery and infrastructure design ensures Edmonton, all Edmontonians' needs are met. Key messages. In addition to the work we are undertaking as a municipality, Edmonton sees great potential in working with our neighbors. In doing so, we hope to achieve the following priorities. Edmonton remains committed to, in, to collaboration with all of our regional partners, including municipalities, nations, and other stakeholders. Creating a socially inclusive and anti-racist Edmonton metro region that provides social supports, affordable housing, and opportunities for all. In addition, our region will need to collaborate on a safe and effective transit system, uh, as this is critical to many industries having access to the labor force, investments in transit uh, have huge economic benefits to the region. Having transit and housing options will unlock a wide area of employment, education, and recreation opportunities for everyone in the region. Growth and development occur in a manner that's cost effective, facilitated in part by integrated service delivery, and that welcomes energy efficiency and resiliency to climate change. Uh, on climate change, we are taking a large number of steps, uh, including uh, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, as well as the uh, energy transition strategy, and we recently introduced our uh, uh, incentives for citizens to uh, apply for retrofits to their buildings, which will be paid off over the time with property, property taxes. So with that, thank you so much uh, for having us today, and look forward to uh, uh, our ongoing collaboration to build a stronger re uh, region for all of us. Thank you, Mayor Sophie. Thank you. <clears throat> Bill. Hey, Jeff, I think you're next. Bill from the town. Oh, who's going next? We've got Devin on there. Okay, well then let's go with Devin. You guys sat in the wrong order then. I'm really sorry about That's this, okay. folks. I don't off, understand why we have such chaos. I, just a joke. Okay, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> Make sure you're paying attention to that. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you can imagine how I feel. I thought they were honestly saving the best to last. So. <laughs> Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, first thank um, Chief, the Grand Chief George Arcan Jr. Um, I knew that man from my past and he's a wonderful, respected man. Uh, for the MRB, for yourself, Doug, and for the group that are here. I would very much like to introduce uh, two of the councillors that are here. Ben is rather the handsome guy with lots of hair. Brian is the other guy with no hair. And so just so you can tell them apart. Uh, the town of Devon itself is basically, it started off as a model community. We were formed and created out of the uh, municipal affairs desk, and we've been there since, well, it started in the late 40s, early 50s, and we've been growing ever since. We do have some things that we say normally only amongst ourselves, like we refer to Edmonton as the greater Devon area, uh, things like that, but So some of our stats are much different than what you've seen previously. Uh, population of 65, 78, 14.3 uh, square miles. I thought it was interesting. We have a boring capacity list here of 25.1 million, and I think it was Mayor Gamble said they have 100 million left they can spend on, their, on theirs, and I thought, they could buy us. They could just come <laughs> in and buy us. Right? Some of the things that we do have that are important, uh, we are right on the corner of Highway 19 and 60, and that's a major corridor. Um, I find it interesting when we do start to develop on Highway 19 and 60, they'll decide to do construction on both sides of us at the same, same time, making it difficult. But it's one of those things that has to be done. I find it interesting that we're literally 10 minutes from the airport and there's a lot of people in the city of Edmonton don't know where we are. Um, that's a best kept secret that we have to change. Challenges and risks, they're pretty much the same as most people. We may have more pipelines. Uh, that's the way the town was built. It was an imperial center. It was Leduc number one. Um, I'm not sure in the beginning we were ever supposed to last 50, 70, 80 years uh, because it was built basically as a hub. In the story, I've always been told that Leduc number one is the city of uh, Leduc 
did not want the rig pigs coming into the city. And so they formed their own and started camps, and that's how Devon began. And uh, after knowing some of the old guys, well, I don't blame them. You know, if that makes sense. <laughs> so we have uh, the residential growth. We have high competition. We have developed um, an industrial park. But we know we have Atchison on one side, we have Niskiri on the other, we have people developing um, light industrial around us, and it's just, it's hard to, even if you have land with utilities, to make sure that you have the growth that you're looking for. It talks about difficulty in retaining young professionals. It, most of the people in our town work somewhere else. We're fortunate to have a strong what I would refer to as a trade base with our industrial park. We have a professional base in the Coal Research Center. And outside of that, most people are moving off to the EIA or surrounding communities to work. I, <coughs> excuse me. I, I had to smile when Mayor Sohi said he wants to have most of his communities within 15 minutes. And I thought, we're already there. Like, we're... <laughs> 15 minutes from Spruce Grove, 15 minutes from Leduc, 15 minutes from West Edmonton Mall, and they all have pools. So do we really need to? Yeah, we do. But it's one of those things that it's interesting how far, how close we are, yet seemingly how far. Uh, we're committed to capitalizing on opportunities. The next phase is absolutely growth. One of the things that we've done, and actually we've been fairly good at over the years, is uh, reduce red tape. I was interesting. I sat and had a meeting with uh, David from Aldrit, and he, the one point he absolutely made was that I came in, I spoke to the town, we had an issue with one of our developments. He thought, oh my goodness, what's this going to do to what we want to build? He went to Maryland in our office, and he said, can you help? And she said, he, she said, what's the earliest you need it? He said, as soon as possible. She said, is Friday okay? And he said, yes. <laughs> and that's the kind of services that in a small town we really do, I think, uh, do well. Some of the stuff that's happening currently is Devon has had more permitted growth in 2022 in the first quarter, largely than what we had in all of 20 and 21. Keep in mind COVID years. And uh, a lot of people will say, well, it had to do with what was going on in the province. I like to think that it was a, a new council come in and we just made the difference. Everybody here knows that's not really true. We're all fighting to make a better community, right? The River Valley Alliance improvements, um, we have new trails. We have a pedestrian bridge planned for down the road with RVA. Um, some of the things that I, we tend to miss is the fact that we are at least the beginning of the largest urban park in the world, and it starts at our bridge, which is also the bridge where the Trans-Canada Trail comes across. And we don't often put that information out there. We're also amazingly blessed that almost our entire community is on a ravine of some sort. The river runs through, but the way all the ravines come down and into it, um, it's an amazing opportunity to build as long as we can manage the pipelines. It's hard to attract somebody to come into a, a basically a field to develop housing or business or light industrial when you say, well, yeah, right through the middle there's a pipeline, but don't worry, the setback's only 500 meters. It's, it makes for a beautiful green patch, doesn't create a lot of interest in developing, and we're slowly overcoming that. I thought this picture was cute. Uh, the one that shows the river, um, the boat launch area, we were absolutely overwhelmed in the last two years with the amount of people using the sites uh, for boating, river rafting, um, tubing. It didn't matter. Um, I know COVID certainly played a part in that because people were doing a lot more locally, but it was ab absolutely bursting at the seams and a lot of that is carried over. <laughs> the second picture is the one I smiled at because I thought, well, if that's our trail system, we have a lot of people lost down there and we'll get to them at the end of the day. But we do have beautiful trail systems. Some of the other things that uh, we're certainly working at with that, 
is in the Devon existing business park. Uh, we do have some limitations. One of the ones where we were never allowed to continue out on the Highway 19 with our Michigan Street, which where uh, the South Ravines are. We've now will be overcoming that because that road will become internal. We'll finish that road this year. And it's created a new issue because now people that have had a really quiet area in town realize there's going to be traffic. And that's the kind of things you face on council. Uh, you can try as, as much and as well and as well intended and in the end you might still get your butt kicked just a little bit the other one of the other ones that we've certainly spoken about a great deal is doing a, a downtown revitalization just to make sure that it's as attractive as it can be and thanks to Ben uh, we actually have some artistic and market venues that are coming down there um, we've always run a farmers market but this is something that will be dedicated to the downtown thank you Ben So beyond safety, the twinning of Highway 19, um, all the information is on there for roads we've paved. But what I thought was interesting with Highway 19 is I was mayor for the town of Devon 20 years ago. And when I left, Highway 19, we were in the second year of a three-year plan to develop Highway 19. <laughs> I'm back 20 years later, and in my second year, we'll get to open it and utilize the new Highway 19. So not everything happens as quick as you would want it to happen. Expanding of the Devonian Business Park. This is an area I already spoke of briefly. We have uh, six lots, one developed, uh, where it's all paved, all the utilities are in, realizing that out there there's people sitting right out in front that we compete directly with. And uh, we're going to have to be quite creative in order to fill that area, which we're hoping to do. Some of the things that have gone on besides the business park, um, it started with the previous council, uh, building the new business park plus the moving the ball diamonds across. Uh, I would like to say that the grand opening stone, or the park itself started off with a pile of dirt and it is now um, four beautiful slow pitch and one fast pitch um, fastball court or baseball diamond. The grand opening is July 22nd. On July 29th, we have the SPN group coming through. We have 40 different teams coming through for, it'll be the first official for us, slow pitch tournament that's coming through there. And um, I believe we're gonna see the, the benefits of that in town because we've been literally three years without baseball and this is an absolutely refreshing news to me. Some of the other stuff that we have here, I'd just like to mention, we have additional town lines, but there's been things that have gone on in the last couple of years. Uh, we've won the community in Bloom, five uh, blooms. Uh, we won the tree planting program and the green program. Won the, uh, we had an award for their indigenous program. And where's Mitch? Um, absolutely because of that man, uh, for what he's come in and put forward. And I know we've, kind of lend him out like a mule to other people, but I honestly think that he's done such a good job um, recreating the wheel when we've got a man who does it so well. I'd like to see us utilize him where we can. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, the only other thing that I can say is on that you can't really see the green spaces we have but we are a four season community the amount of um a baseball and soccer that we're heading into currently the winter supports the cross country screen the golf course the river valley the trails uh it's a beautiful little community that i want to see become a bigger community and my goal after driving around in this town is to just maybe capitalize on some of the initiatives that some of the other communities have had. So I really uh, appreciate having this opportunity to come up here. The only other thing I have left for you is save the date. We have the EMRB golf tournament in Devon, August 25th. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. And last but not least, but the guy who's keeping us from lunch, Mayor Bill. <laughs> no, sorry. Just,
No, did, carry on. Oh. I'm just, I'm just. Thank joking. you. Sorry. Uh, morning, everybody. Thank you. Uh, also to Simon, our host. Much appreciated, and our guests from the Alexander First Nation. Much appreciated your being here. And the smudging, smudging was it called properly? Uh, very interesting ceremony. I would happily do that as well. And um, I want to say before I start my presentation briefly is that I'm keenly aware that I am the last speaker before your lunch. Uh, I have hanger, and my wife says when I have hanger, I'm unreasonable and owly. I find that very hard to believe, but I am feeling a little hanger. So if I am, I'm sure some of you are as well. So I will, I will be brief, but hopefully informative before we begin our lunch break. So uh, having said that, I want to say one thing about the MRB. I know some of you, have, none of you have had any, any complaints this last year about winter snow removal. We had some in Beaumont, you guys probably didn't. But um, as mayors, we have to deal with uh, citizen concerns, but that's part of the job. But being part of the MRB, I, I am humbled at the responsibility we have with the MRB and for growth plans going into the future and municipal development among ourselves and collaboration. Uh, it's, it's, to me, one of the best parts of the job is being in this room with you and working with the MRB and uh, contributing as Beaumont will and has continued to contribute to the future of EMRB's success. So thank you all for your contribution to the EMRB. So with that, I'll begin my presentation about the city of Beaumont and you may recognize, of course, the landmark red church on the hill that Beaumont's famous for for almost 100 years that that, that church has been there. It's a very exciting landmark for us. So I'll give you an idea that we became a city in 2019 and we are Alberta's newest city. We're very proud of that. We occupy an area of almost 25 square kilometers, and our population right now is almost is over 21,000 people. I moved there in 2006 from Saskatchewan, and we were 9,000 people. Now we're at 21. Give you an idea in our growth that we have in Beaumont. We had 16,500 five years ago. Now we're 21. A 20 percent growth in five years in population. Uh, that has lots of challenges you can well would imagine, um, and we're projected to grow. I think uh, into 45,000 in the next probably 20, 25 years. And I apologize, I remiss to introduce two of my council colleagues, Councilor Kathy Barnhart and also Councilor uh, Stephen Van Newkirk and also C.A. Schwartz and about 10 of our staff are here today, so thank you for coming as well. I forgot to introduce you earlier and I apologize for that oversight. So with the population growth, I wanna give you one statistic as well, is that of our population, 25% is under age 15. 25% under age 15. That is a huge statistic. It is a bubble in the demographics. Most people can't get their head around. I can't some days how many kids there are. And kids have dogs. So it's amazing what our challenges are for recreation. And I'm very proud to let you know that our previous council I was part of, along with Cassie and, and Steve, and the current council, we have uh, constructed our brand new recreation facility, $29 million rec facility that was added onto our pool, opened it 18 months ago to a packed house and it's still packed after COVID is over. We built the first two outdoor rinks in Beaumont since 1992. Uh, we've did that in the last two years and there are, there are capacity already. An outdoor basketball court, we have just finished in the last one year period. We constructed a $3 million artificial turf multi-use field. Uh, we had them to Wildcats last weekend had their training camp in Beaumont and they were thrilled with the quality of the field and I'm very proud of that fact. And we're also opening five ball diamonds in a dog park and, then, and they're opening in the next couple of weeks. We're having our grand opening of both facilities on May 28th at uh, five and six o'clock respectively. Um, looking forward to having some of you there. If you can make it, it will be an invitation will be sent out shortly. And we're very proud of the rec facility we've built in the last couple of years uh, for our residents. Um, that's part of our priority is also schools is a big priority for us as well. And culture is on our radar as well for, for growth for Beaumont. So very exciting times in Beaumont. We have, uh, as I mentioned, operating uh, a very, very fast pace of growth, which has its challenges. Our operating budget is about $48 million, and our capital budget is close to roughly $10 million. And in 2022, our tax increase was 2.4%, uh, which is um, 1.4 for the RCMP, uh, a cost we all bear, but a cost I'm very proud to pay. Our RCMP and Beaumont keep our community probably the safest in Alberta based on RCMP statistics. And I know you're all, you all feel safe too. RCMP do a good job for most of us in this room, and uh, they continue to do a very good job for us in Beaumont. I'm very proud of that. We only took 1% increase in 2022 to operate our city. So we, we try and be lean and mean and offer great services. As uh, Mayor Heron mentioned a moment ago, people are demanding their services, but we try and balance ourselves with great service and reasonable tax increases. And so far, we've done a pretty good job of that, and I'm very proud of that as well, too. If I may go to my next slide, which I believe is there. Thank you very much. 
So growth challenges, investment needs. Well, for Beaumont, diversifying our tax base is our biggest challenge. Uh, Mayor Heron did display a, a, a slide you saw a while ago showing the range in uh, resident, residential to business tax ratio base, and we are 93% residential, seven business, same as Chestermere. So we are at presently the epitome of the bedroom community. However, we are taking major steps to change that because that ratio is simply non, not sustainable. If any mayor wants to change their ratio to mine, if you're interested in negotiating a change, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. I'll be in the foyer. Uh, if you want to talk, I'd be happy to. I'm pretty sure I'll be by myself with that, with that statement, but that's okay. Um, so growth is a big thing for us, and diversifying our tax base is the biggest thing we're working on. So we, we are punching above our waistline, waistline, our weight class, as a waistline's on my mind, been, I'm hunger, sorry, um, above our, our weight class in that we are, we can't continue in Beaumont, in the, as in the past, to build our tax base, one donor place or one pizza place or one liquor store at a time. You just can't do it. And you all know that as mayors and CEOs and our uh, CEOs and so on. So we have been working on a couple of major, uh, major economic investment opportunities, one being our uh, an innovation park and also our 10 gig fiber optic network. Uh, we are looking to have announcements in the next 30 to 45 days on both projects. The 10 gig fiber optic uh, project will put uh, fiber optic into the ground to every house, every business, every library, every school, every church in Beaumont. Uh, I'm not a techie, but my tech friends, and they say 10 gig fiber optic, they're like a five-year-old kid on Christmas morning. They are excited about this opportunity. It means nothing to me. I mean, I can't get my cell phone to work half the time, and maybe you guys can, but I can't. But 10 gig fiber optic will put our little community on the map for a lot of high-tech firms. We have some firms ready to come to Beaumont when we get 10 gig in the ground because they're, they're software, high-tech companies, and that kind of capacity uh, means a lot to them, and uh, we're very excited with that opportunity. Hopefully, we'll have the groundbreaking this summer. Our second big project is our innovation park in the south part of Beaumont. Um, we took an initiative to buy some land, and we are working with a, with a major, major tenant and ancillary companies to come to Beaumont and build an innovation park that's going to be technology-based economy, expansion here in Beaumont, and um, we expect a $250 million investment in our investment in our innovation park in the next couple of years. So my goal, actually people ask, what's your vision as a mayor for Beaumont? My vision is a very simple one. Beaumont's a great place to live. I want Beaumont to be a great place to work. Because right now, people who work outside Beaumont, 9 out of 10, leave Beaumont to go to work. 9 out of 10. So I tell people, what if we got that down to 7 out of 10? How would that affect our local economy? This innovation park will create, hopefully, a number of full-time jobs based in Beaumont, uh, and that'll be good for our neighbors in Leduc County, uh, City of Leduc, uh, as well, even over in Devon, not too far away from us. People may, may work in a smaller community, but work in Beaumont, that's good too. So I think it's going to be a big stimulus to us in Beaumont to have the innovation park up and running, and I'm looking to have our ratio go from 93.7 down to hopefully 85.15 would be great. 80-20 would be fantastic. Is it possible? I believe it is. Uh, we are doing the right things with our administration's assistance and council's vision to work on economic diversification, but um, do it smartly and do it productively and do it in the, right, in the right direction. So we're looking forward to partnering with our major tenants on doing that. If I may go on to the next section, which are risks and opportunities. Implications of growth. Well, the biggest thing about implication of growth is keeping up with infrastructure. Um, our growth patterns are, has, has been kind of crazy, and we are doing our very best to make sure that we are in, growing infrastructure in a timely fashion. At the same time, Beaumont's been around for over 100 years. I've met residents who've been here for 60 years in Beaumont. That's a long time to be a resident of Beaumont. Never left. They were, they were born on a farm nearby, and they remember very clearly, not, even, not that long ago, having dirt, dirt roads in Beaumont and having snowmobiles going up and down the streets and getting around in the wintertime. Um, that wasn't that long, that long ago in Beaumont. But many people who come to Beaumont think it's a great place to live. And I'll share a quick story with you. We just recently did the groundbreaking for a art, uh, affordable housing complex in South Beaumont, 144 units. I was at the groundbreaking. And five people who live in Edmonton came for the groundbreaking ceremony. And they've been to Beaumont before. They simply drove through Beaumont, coming from the north or the west, drove through our city, came to our, the ground, groundbreaking, were talking to me and said, wow, you got a great vibe in Beaumont. I said, where did you stop? Oh, we didn't stop. We just drove right through and came right here. And I thought, wow, if I could bottle that somehow and sell that, you know, the vibe of Beaumont would be great. And I'm very proud of Beaumont, as you can probably tell. 
Um, but implication of growth means we have to be very, very careful in how we grow our subdivisions to make sure we look after the needs of our people, of our residents. Our big thing now too is, is uh, for us, it will be infrastructure, will be our next fire hall. Um, with our expansion in our, in our borders and through annexation and future development of, of subdivision in the north and the west, we need to be looking towards a, a new future fire hall, which would be a capital expense for us, as uh, Mayor Young mentioned, having a third fire hall is a large expense with, uh, with equipment and manpower to, to service that uh, fire hall. So we've got some infrastructure challenges going forward, but we're looking forward to that. Diversification of our economy will help us grow a tax base to sustain those future investments, which will also include a future uh, recreation center sometime down the road as we continue to grow with our population. Opportunities? For us, it's location. It's a double-edged sword. Our location where we are close to our neighbors north in Edmonton and being surrounded by Leduc, Leduc County, we are a few kilometers away from Edmonton, 10 kilometers away from the airport and, and Leduc and all the shopping that Leduc offers. Um, and that is difficult to raise business in Beaumont because they say, well, you're so close to those areas, why should we open business in Beaumont and take that financial risk? I get that. So, but our, our location is our, our advantage. But right now, where we are located, we are, as I mentioned, 10 minutes from the airport. We are two minutes, five minutes away from QE2 Highway, Highway 21 to the east of us, 625 on the south. We are locations is very strategically for economic growth for certain types of industry, like high tech and that's gonna to be to our advantage going forward. Being about Beaumont, we have an identity and a culture. A moment ago I mentioned about how the people have this vibe about Beaumont. We've got a French heritage, it's very, very strong, but we are also a very multicultural city. Um, four years ago, I first ran for council, the second highest or second most common, or third most common spoken language in, uh, in Beaumont was not Punjabi, now it is, four years later. So in the way it's growing in, uh, in Beaumont, I, I think it's a good possibility that Punjabi may surpass French as a second most commonly spoken language in Beaumont. That's, that, that's the way we're going, that's the way it seems to be looking. So we are very aware of our cultural diversity in Beaumont. So this past year, our, our council uh, created a new position for a cultural inclusion coordinator. So when new people come to Beaumont, whether it be a Punjabi, um, Filipino, Asian descent, doesn't matter where they come from. We have people from Lebanon recently too. They come to Beaumont, they'll be, have a resource to come and understand how our city works, how to get services and that sort of thing. So we're very, very proud of that inclusion coordinator being hired this year to make sure that our people of varying multicultures will be welcome in Beaumont. That's a high priority for us. And of course our people as well too. We have in Beaumont a very high average income, but $140,000. Per family, I believe Edmonton is around the 85 to 90 range. So we have a very young, most of our population is under age 40. Many kids, as I mentioned previously, so we have a very young population. In fact, our council reflects that. I think of our council, I think five of them are under age 40. I think Kathy and I are a tad over 40. You and I, Kathy, just a little bit over 40. Um, but our, our, our council reflects our demographics of our city, and we're very proud of that too as a council. So our big job is to take advantage of our, of our people. If I may go to my next slide here. How's my time? Doug, when will come okay? Another minute or two? Okay, I won't be too long. So economic development is, our big, is a big priority. Transportation and transit is, is important to us. The Regional Transit Commission, which many of us in the room are part of, is important to Beaumont, and I believe it's important to all of us as well. Um, as the saying goes, the rising tide raises all ships, and transportation and transit is important to the region. Uh, it's important to Edmonton as our partner as well too, so I think the Regional Transit Commission will be a f a very, very effective for our economic development for our entire community. Also with the 65th Street expansion of the interchange, I was a guest of Mayor Young yesterday at that announcement, and again, Bob, congratulations. It's good for, it's good for Leduc, Leduc County, Devon, Beaumont, it's good for the entire region. Even guys in Spruce Grove, the more fence comes at the airport, it's good for our entire region, so we're very proud to be part of that as well. And our job, my job as a, council, as a leader of our council is to make sure that we contribute to the region economically uh, and we'll do our very best to make sure we have many jobs as possible uh, created in Beaumont to, to uh, benefit all of our municipalities in our area, including Leduc County as well too. So having said that, I'm gonna move <coughs> on to my next slide. I actually kind of said a minute ago about regional collaboration. We wanna make sure that Beaumont is a, is a regional contributor and it's my job to make sure that we do that. And I'm looking forward to continuing that and being a welcoming and inclusive community. And with that, Doug, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you for your attention this morning. Thank you to all of you. <clears throat>
I, I do apologize. I'm going to forego asking you guys a question because we were started about half an hour behind and I know people are hungry and we do need to start at 1.40 with the next panel because we have someone joining us all the way from Sweden. So um, I'm, I'm going to let you guys go for lunch. I just have a couple of announcements to make. First, um, well, not an announcement. You guys are kind of like Baskin and Robbins. I hope you understand that. It, no one would go to Baskin and Robbins if it had vanilla only or chocolate only. You guys, they have, you go there because they have 31 flavors. You guys have 13 flavors, plus your indigenous partnership. And, and that uniqueness makes you stronger together as a region. So I, I really appreciate all of the panelists sharing what makes their community unique, the challenges they face, because it helps us recognize that we're in this together and our success is going to require cooperation, not walls. Um, also, I want you to let you, let you know uh, the EM, RB table is over there with a lot of information you could grab during lunch, staff around to talk to you. There are folders on your table that have fact sheets that the municipalities just presented so you can double check information and take that with you. There is also a, a QR puzzle, QR code for a Wordle puzzle. I don't play Wordle so I have no idea what the hell it is but you know enjoy. Um, and, and I also want to challenge you one more thing before we adjourn for lunch that when you get your lunch, consider going to sit at another table with other people you haven't met yet and, and help build some of those bridges and those connections between communities. Find out their story, find out more about their community, build those connections because that will be what is enduring and make sure this region is prosperous. And we're going to start sort of at the back to go get lunch and move forward. And I know it won't take us very long and we will start promptly at 1.40 again. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Let's bring it back. As I said, please feel free to continue to eat, to grab some dessert, to walk and stretch. Um, I know we had a short lunch break, um, but we are going to be timely because we have an amazing panel that is coming up again. We have so many fantastic speakers that are joining us. So, in order for us to be competitive, to attract new residents and to keep the ones that we have, in order to build and ensure an excellent quality of life for all, as we've discussed, we need to work together. We need to come together around a common vision. We need to make a commitment to do this every single day. It takes time and it takes a lot of hard work, but by doing it, we'll position ourselves competitively and we'll secure a future for the next generations. And frankly, we owe a good future to next generations. Now, we've assembled a panel of experts who are doing or have done what is mentioned above. Each of our panels under, panelists understand the importance of creating a compelling vision, rallying around it, and then executing on that vision. We have asked all of them to bring their perspectives to this panel, so I would like to invite them up one at a time. First, we have Laura Kilcrease. She come up as I introduce her. Before we, she became the CEO of Alberta Innovates, Laura was a venture capitalist and one of the major players in Austin's transformation to become one of the USA's top technology centers and a magnet for investment and talent. She'll speak to the creation of a collective vision and bringing partners together to execute on that vision. She'll also share her perspectives on how the region can establish itself as a serious competitor in attracting and retaining talent and investment. Next up, I have Victor Kui. Uh, Edmonton raised, and he is the new president and CEO of the Edmonton Elks. We're, we're coming back. Yeah, yeah. all right, <laughs> good. Uh, Victor will talk about why he was drawn back to the region after more than two decades abroad as a successful international sports entrepreneur. He'll also speak to the importance of creating a vision, understanding roles and responsibilities of driving that vision forward and creating a brand that attracts people and understanding your competition, which is incredibly important. Next up, we have uh, uh, Chief uh, Ar George Arcan Jr. Uh, Chief of the Alexander First Nation and Grand Chief of the Confederacy of the Treaty of Six and with decades of experience in economic and community development, Chief Arcan has been a dynamic leader among Treaty Six First Nations. As a representative of the newly formed First Nation Capital Investment Partnership, he will speak to the opportunities that exist locally for strength and collaboration between municipalities and First Nations. Okay, I can see you again. You too. 
And finally, joining us online, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about, uh, I mean, all the panels, but this is incredible, uh, Jerry Dubrovny. With more than 30 years of experience in local government, including as a municipal councillor for nine years in the city of New Westminster, and now as commissioner and CAO for the Metro Vancouver region, Jerry will be able to provide examples of what can be achieved through regional collaboration, the value of member municipalities, and the recipe for success when it comes to key initiatives undertaken by Metro Vancouver. Welcome, panelists. So, who's up first? Do we have the presentations? Here is... It's a break. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're going on break again. There, no, sorry. <laughs> oh, there is no presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. See, so many panels. I've got, I'm sorry. You, you may proceed, please. Well, what I can say is, thank God for that. I didn't know I was going to bring a presentation. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Are we having a great day so far? Great. So I'm very pleased to be here, and I was asked specifically to, to talk about Austin, Texas, but I can't help but start by saying, as CEO of Alberta Innovates, I hope you're all seeing some of the things we're doing in, the, in every one of your regions in the technology area, and how that turnaround is really starting to create not just new businesses, but new jobs across the whole province. Uh, specifically in innovation. So let me go back a little bit to the history of Austin, Texas. And I'll use my personal experiences um, because perhaps it might give you some, some parallels uh, you can think about. When I first moved to Austin in the mid 80s from the UK, um, it was in between an oil and gas bust. In the early 80s, many of you would have realized there was an oil and gas bust all over the country. It was a little reprieve for about a year, 18 months, and we went into the second downturn in oil and gas uh, in, in the US and in most parts of the world. For Austin, a, little, uh, a town of about 400,000 people, even though it was the state capital, it remains the state capital, you know, that had a devastating effect. Because while you think about oil and gas being in Houston, it actually, the ripple effect of that wealth actually rippled into Austin. Um, because of that second oil and gas, downturn where, um, this may make some of you smile now, where all went from 30 bucks a barrel to eight. We lost every single banking institution that failed. Our real estate dropped in value to the point that we had a five year supply of houses of any value. And we had a thousand people uh, losing their homes a month because they didn't have jobs to pay the mortgage or the house was now, the mortgage was greater than the worth value of the house. So you can imagine, it was pretty devastating. Um, we in Austin are a big university town, like many of the um, great institutions we have in this province, and we decided we had to do something different. But it was not just the town of Austin. We realized that the whole region was feeling the effects, and that in fact, every part of the region had different attributes. In this case, the, our region is a five-county region that uh, really goes uh, north of Austin about 30, 40 miles, south of Austin uh, about the same. So that five-county region was what was key. And we decided that we would come together with the leadership and create a plan. We'd look at what attributes we had today. You know, what, what were we good at? Where was our labor force? What could we do differently? And from that, we decided we needed to turn it into a tech town. Why? Because we needed more startup companies, we needed to diversify the economy, and we wanted those jobs to be valuable. Valuable in that we wanted them to be more than the minimum wage. We wanted higher wage jobs. So we went about this. We, formed a sur we, we did a study, formed a survey. I won't go into all the stuff that we do. Many of you know that. And then we came out with a report. And what was more important is everyone participated in that. And it was not like I've got here, which is, you know, 100 pages of different information. But it was something that was very readable in, in six or eight pages. And it basically said, here's where we think we can go. Here's the areas of strength. This is what we've got to build on. Do you agree? 
And if you agree, you take this report and then you use that as your, your hymn sheet, your song of what you're going to say when you go out there to anyone who comes, someone in the region, someone out of the region. Austin went from 400,000 people then, um, and we actually really started the work here in 1989. 1989, the 400,000 thousand homes foreclosed a month has turned into uh, a greater MSA area now of 2.2 million, um, and even more within the region. And today is the number one uh, entrepreneurial town in the US for new company starts. It achieved over $2 billion in venture capital investment last year alone. It's having 189 people a day, a day, move to Austin now from California, San Francisco, uh, Chicago, New York, other places like that, a day. And we've been doing that between 150 and 189 people a day for at least the last 10 years. So you can imagine the jobs, uh, we now have 4,000 empty jobs in the town because we can't get people fast enough to fill them. And this is by being very purposeful in the region. Now you would say, now, Laura, you're talking about Austin. And I'd say, yeah, absolutely, I'm talking about Austin. But because of what Austin has just done, it realized that that core town is actually getting too expensive for some businesses. And so those businesses are moving into the five county area. So now, just announced three months ago, um, Samsung's put in a new chip manufacturing plant in a town 17 miles south of Austin in another county. That will be a $17 billion plant. Can you imagine? The housing that's now going up there, the grocery stores that are being increased there, the number of teachers that they're going to need there. Similarly, Amazon put a warehouse in another part of town that's increased. So I'm giving you just a couple of examples, but there's many more examples when the region works together. Because now when they come to Austin and they fly into that airport, we already know what those people want. And we say, you know, Austin's not right for you. You need to go to this place south, this place north. Let us take you there and we all work together. And I would say prior to that time, we would have competed with one another. So I think um, for what it's worth, I've got some st stats here, but it's about the quality of life today, the price of living, the cost for the family, the style of living, and using each other's regional strengths to build upon to actually grow the manner that, that you want to. And I see no reason why you too couldn't do what we did in Austin. And you might say, yeah, Texas is bigger, Laura. Yeah, it's not as big as you think it is. Yes, it's a big territory, but so is a big territory here. It's actually the will of the people, and it does not take that many people to get together and make it happen. And I would tell you there's probably a dozen of us in Austin who started building that infrastructure and started building those connections. And Today, uh, although I haven't been there for a few years as I was recruited here, um, I still have a home there and they call me almost every day for, hey Laura, who should we talk to? What can go on? Could you come back and visit? Can you do something? And my answer is yes, why? Because I want those people to move here now, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And you have to build that trust and that relationship, but when you can all sing from the same hymn sheet, so to speak. <clears throat> I think there's nothing you can't do if you all agree together, so thank you. Brilliant, thank you. <laughs> Victor. Thanks. Uh, I, I can't believe I'm sitting next to Laura because I'm being a little bit of a fanboy right now. If you're in the tech world or you're in the investment world, she has such a phenomenal reputation. We are so lucky in Alberta to have someone with her leadership and experience to come here, so thank you very much, Laura. Um, thank you for the time today, and I know that we have the most difficult slot here right after lunch, so we'll work really hard not to put you to sleep. Uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be here. I'm born and raised in Edmonton, did my first degree here, uh, but I haven't lived in Edmonton for the last 20 years. 
I've had a career in sports for the last 25 to 30 years, worked on everything from, started here with Klondike Days, uh, Commonwealth Games, Sydney Olympics, World Championships in Athletics. I was with the PGA Tour and then ESPN out in Asia for five years. In 2011, I co-founded my own company uh, called One Championship in the space of mixed martial arts, headquartered in Singapore. And over the last decade, very, very fortunate to have a phenomenal board of directors, ranging from Sequoia Capital to Tomasek, the Sovereign Wealth Fund for Singapore. And the company has grown today where we have um, athletes from all around the world, over 700 athletes, um, multiple offices around, around Asia. We're broadcast to 150 countries. Nielsen Research just released their 2021 study of sport properties in the world. And one championship is the number two most watched content in the world after, uh, after NBA. Today, the valuation of my company is a little over a billion dollars, and it's just been an amazing ride. Um, but I decided to move back home and uh, bring my family here. And the crazy thing is, when I tell people I'm coming back to Edmonton, everybody from Edmonton says, the first thing they say to me is, uh, why? <laughs> like, wh wh you're coming back to Edmonton, why? And that, but when I tell that to anybody outside of Edmonton, the first thing they say is, it must feel so great to go back home. It must be great to be around friends and families and people that you've known your whole life. And, and then they ask me, do you get around on snowmobiles in Edmonton? But uh, it, it, it always struck me the difference between this sense of your value when you're in Edmonton versus how other people see home and what the opportunities are. I recently took on um, now four months into the job as a new passion project as the president and CEO for the Edmonton Elks. And if you follow football, we were in last place last year. This is probably quite literally the worst job in the entire world of sports to take on. Um, and because the problem with this role is everybody only asks for the president when things are going bad. The moment that things are going well, it's like, oh, the team and the coaches and everything else. And then when things go bad again, they're like, where's the president? <laughs> But I love that. I love that opportunity. Um, well, what I wanted to share with you today, because I was really thinking about what part of my experience makes sense in this context of everybody here today. And I look at a, at a room of people that have been dedicated to the greater good, to public service. And the word that comes to mind is unreasonable. I look at this room and it looks like it's filled with unreasonable people. Now that sounds negative, but the word unreasonable to me is one of the most powerful words in the world and it's my favorite word. And the reason why I say that is I really learned what the word unreasonable is when I became a father. And I, my children had these unreasonable goals. They wanted to be prime minister. My son wanted to be a professional athlete. My daughter wanted to save the world. And all of these were unreasonable goals to me. Out of love, I was putting barriers in their way of a reasonable life. Um, and people do that throughout, throughout your entire life. Sometimes it's friends. Sometimes it's your teacher that says, oh, you know, have a more reasonable goal. Or sometimes it's your coach that doesn't believe in your aspiration to do what, is what, you want, what it is that you want to do. It's not that they hate you or wish you ill intent. They are reasonable because they want to protect you. And as a parent, I was trying to protect my, my children by putting reasonableness onto them. And I think about my own experience when we started one championship. I had just, my second son had just been born, my second child, my first child is a daughter. And um, I went and I spoke to 72 people in the industry that I respected. Media colleagues, sport industry people, called friends from all around the world. And I said, I'm thinking of leaving my great job, my dream job at ESPN, to start a new company in mixed martial arts. I took notes on every single conversation. All 72 people said, don't do it, without exception. They all told me to be reasonable in their own way. They're like, Victor, why would you leave this great job, great pay? You're, you're on track to be MD of the company. You have the, all this risk, a newborn uh, child, your young family, et cetera, et cetera, to start a company that's in combat sports, will never be on TV, no one loves it. It's, it's a blood sport, no sponsorship, no one will come watch it, et cetera, et cetera. Be reasonable. And I was very fortunate that 
as I took in all of that, I realized that I'm quite an unreasonable guy. And, and challenges are in fixing problems are what motivates me. And um, I, in this unreasonable journey, when I started it, I had the green light from two very important people. One was my co-founder who um, funded, was the initial, initial fundraise. And the second was my wife, who put it all in perspective for me, where she said, like in the worst case scenario, if you fail in five years, are we on the street with no money and, and poor and starving? And I said, no. She's like, can you get another job? I'm like, probably. Maybe not the job I want, but I'm, I think I should be employable. So she's like, well, well then what's the problem? You know, you should go for it. And that was the beginning of that journey. But I share that story with you to kickstart this conversation because the goal and the desire to do greater good, to put yourself in public service, whether it's as a mayor or a counselor, or the goal to say that you want to contribute to the Edmonton metropolitan region, to the greater area with conf conflicting, sometimes conflicting and not aligned interests is an unreasonable proposition. It's an unreasonable proposition to decide that you want to put your family, your life, to public scrutiny to be elected and to be an elected official. And um, what I've found is that this unreasonable path is what leads to the kind of game-changing things that Laura is talking about. I can imagine when, there, when houses are worth less than the mortgage and you start setting forward a plan and a dream of a future of how this city is going to be the mecca for, for innovation sounds like an unreasonable proposal. And today, when we gather everyone in this room, a lot of the thoughts and the, in, and the things that we talk about seem unreasonable. Even today, as I sit next to Chief, when I left here 20 years ago, to, have, to be together on a panel would have been an unreasonable request. And, that, and it's amazing to come today and to see that kind of transformation. So that's just all I wanted to share with you today. I, I look forward to getting a chance to know you better and watching your unreasonable journey. Thank you. Chief Arcant. Um, thank you. I, I, I was just thinking, uh, Victor, uh, if you want to continue to be employable, I, I don't know about the job you have now. It's going to be a, it's going to be some challenges in the next while. <laughs> uh, this morning, uh, Mayor Choi talked about uh, barbed wire, and, and and we can all think about that, you know, in a number of different ways, uh, you know, during during the wars and. Uh, but also uh, the invisible barbed wire that sometimes uh, gets put up, whether it's our region, our, our, our district, our town, um, they get put up. And uh, for many years, uh, the barbed wire has been put up in our uh, First Nation communities. People feel like uh, they... they um, an, an example is uh, just uh, two days ago, I went to gas up at our store and uh, some people who were non-members had stopped in and gassed up and so I was talking to them and I was saying oh yeah it's a, kind of a cold day because I think it was Monday and they told me uh, I, I'm sure happy you you people were able to get an SO on your reserve and I didn't think much about it until I you know was driving away and I was thinking of uh, the challenges that we have as people. And part of that is, uh, first of all, the thought that uh, a, a First Nation couldn't get a gas station, particularly an SO or a Shell or any of those kind of things. But secondly, um, the version of uh, you people and uh, how we need to change that and how we need to uh, start to do things differently to change uh, the you people attitude that that still exists today and and uh, the important the important thing I, I believe is we just need to understand that it exists 
and that in order for us to move ahead and truly build what we call regional economies, uh, we need to be able to put aside some of those, uh, I, I don't want to call them differences, I, I think it's a, a, a view uh, that people have uh, that's just going to take us time to change. And we all just need to figure out how we start to change that. And uh, part of uh, my thinking has always been around the idea that um, First Nation communities, we first of all need to spend some time breaking down our own barriers and feel like that we're welcome outside our communities. And, and in return, uh, people will feel like they're welcome in our communities. In Alexander, we, uh, uh, we have a, a powwow every year, and uh, still today, people continue to ask me, can I come to the powwow? Well, it's not a private event. And, and uh, while I, I continue to invite people to come and watch and see our people celebrate uh, uh, some, some historic cultural activities, uh, there's still a feeling that people need to be invited. And uh, I'm hoping that these types of uh, gatherings where there's been inclusion, uh, that we can start to break down some of those barriers and start to think of uh, the First Nation communities as an asset as opposed to uh, uh, somewhere where, first of all, people don't, don't know what's going on there. And, and I think we need to educate people as to what we do in our communities and that it's not a barbed wire fence and that we need to uh, ensure uh, that people are welcome and, uh, and that in return we get welcome back into uh, uh, what we call mainstream or, or into the economy in the region. Prior to uh, coming home, I, I had the opportunity to, uh, to be the CEO of uh, Fort Mackay Group, Fort Mackay Nation, which under Fort Mackay Nation they had Fort Mackay Group companies. And uh, I used to talk to the leadership about the idea of us uh, uh, promoting Fort Mackay, but promoting it in a way that talked about its impact in the region. So Fort Mackay itself, uh, its group of companies employed, uh, uh, this was uh, two years ago, and I'm not sure what it is today, but uh, had over 2,500 employees. In addition to that, there are uh, two uh, Joint ventures I employed almost uh, 10,000 people. Um, in, in addition to that, they had uh, two more investments, uh, one, one in Edmonton and um, another one in, in the Fort McMurray area, which was uh, doing uh, uh, working on trucks. But it, it employed another uh, just about 7,000 people. So in total, in the region, Fort Mackay was, in, in my view, employing um, just about 20,000 people. And, and when you looked at Syncrude or Suncor, uh, they didn't employ as many people as Fort Mackay. And, and I think uh, uh, Suncor boasts uh, having about 15,000 people on a site at any one time. In addition to that, they uh, provided uh, rooms and, and food for over 30,000 people a day. So when you think of the impact of what uh, they were doing in, in, the, in the area, it was bigger than just helping the community. It was helping uh, the local economy in, in many respects. Fort Mackay had um, I guess the advantage of, of being uh, disadvantaged, depends how you look at it, but being right in the middle of the oil sands. Uh, our communities, like Alexander, we are also uh, part of the economy. We, uh, we employ almost uh, 600 people between uh, Fox Creek and, and the city of Edmonton. Um, 
probably half of those people are not band members. They're, we, they're teachers and doctors and people who are uh, part of the region. And we don't celebrate enough of that, that there's some inclusion and partnerships that happen. I had an opportunity yesterday to talk to uh, Chief Billy Morin from Enoch. They are, uh, were doing a sod turning, I think, yesterday. They're going to be building a medical facility uh, in, in Enoch, uh, which is going to provide uh, additional medical services to the public. So it's not quite a private uh, medical facility, but it's going to be a facility that will be specialized, but will uh, ensure that people have access to a broader range of medical services. This kind of innovation and thinking in First Nation communities uh, allows us to do things a little bit differently. So, so in other words, because we are a, a federal, uh, under the federal responsibility, and we can negotiate different land transactions in terms of taxes and or even the application of uh, a regulatory process. So we could, we could actually negotiate uh, with, with, with a company to create a regulatory process to build a plant on First Nation land. Because that kind of regulatory process does not exist today in, in what we call our land management process. My, my, point, my point is we haven't all, including ourselves, looked at how we can become a bigger and better and preferably a stronger player with all of you in the region. So as we uncover things, as I mentioned this morning, uh, I, I, I don't want to speak for the Samson First Nation, but uh, the Samson First Nation itself um, has almost $2 billion in their trust account and they want to invest. Where they, where they invest becomes the issue and how they invest, but, but essentially because many of the First Nations have felt for many years that they're not equal partners. So we learned one thing. We learned that if we come to the table with money, we become equal partners. And if we can be in the front end of change, it's even better. So Alexander itself is part of the hydrogen hub, which brought us to consider entering into a partnership with four other First Nations in the region to undertake capital investment into uh, doing carbon capture. Nobody nobody would have thought that the four, four First Nations uh, are now going to own 51% of the Enbridge uh, carbon capture project in Wadman or 51% of the Wolf project in the Heartland. In addition to that, we have discussions with Shell for all of the First Nations to get involved. And why we want to do that is because for, for too long, We've let uh, the government and other people tell us how to fix things in our communities because they had the money. But as we start getting our own resources, we will start fixing things because we know the answers. So I, I guess really my, my point is, as <coughs> Victor's talking about in terms of being reasonable, unreasonable, is that uh, we, we think and believe that working with First Nations, using First Nation land and resources uh, is, has been an unreasonable task for many years. And I think, uh, in my view, uh, this group, who's very progressive, I think will start to change that. And I think we will find ways to work together as time goes on. Thank you.
And next up, joining us all the way via the internet from Sweden is Jerry. Oh, thank, well, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to join you and I'm really sorry that it had to be virtually. Um, I only wish I had better memories of Edmonton. Uh, you see, when I, in the early 1980s, I played for the Calgary Stampeders. And so my memories of Edmonton was losing a football game to you guys every, uh, every Labor Day. And uh, so hopefully you can all look past that. Um, I think it scarred me for life. Uh, I wish I wasn't playing during your glory years. Um, so I am the commissioner and CAO of Metro Vancouver. And um, I would normally do a, an acknowledgement to the 10 First Nations on whose land Metro Vancouver exists. Um, but as you heard, I'm joining you from Sweden. So I don't know who's, uh, who to thank. Um, but I did want to acknowledge um, and point out that the acknowledgement and the gratitude is a core value for us at Metro Vancouver. So I thought I would start by maybe just telling you a little bit about Metro Vancouver. There's, there's some real similarities and some differences uh, between your organization and ours. Um, we're smaller, we're about 3,000 um, square kilometers. I think you guys are about three times as big. Um, we've got about almost double the population. We're about 2.8 million uh, people. Um, and, and we're a, a large portion of the province of BC. We're more than half the population, more than 60% of the GDP. And, uh, and I understand we're both experiencing growth and expecting projecting lots of growth over the next decades. Um, Metro is expected to add about a million residents um, between now and 2050. Uh, we provide a, a wide range of services uh, through our regional government, and that's uh, some of them are common uh, with, with your organization and some are different. We provide uh, drinking water through uh, three mountain watersheds and five dams. We provide uh, liquid waste uh, through three or five sewage treatment plants and solid waste uh, throughout the region. Um, we have affordable housing, about 10,000 residents in about 49 different sites. Uh, parks and greenways and, uh, and ecological areas, uh, Metro Vancouver is responsible for about 25% of the land base, about 25% of that 3,000 uh, square kilometers. Um, we're also the regulatory agency for air quality and, and for climate change. Um, but we share a lot of the uh, uh, duties that you have around, as I understand it, around regional planning and, uh, and also economic uh, prosperity. And, uh, and I, I point out that of all those services that I mentioned, um, the ones that we share, I think, are maybe the most difficult ones. Uh, I know that the land use um, role can be uh, uh, quite a difficult uh, challenge for our elected officials. Um, if there's time and if there's interest, I can talk about some of our strategies around um, an urban containment boundary and, and concentration of growth uh, in key areas. Um, our board um, operates with 40 elected officials, uh, the 21 mayors uh, plus 19 councillors, uh, a, a chief from the Treaty First Nation, uh, Chief Baird from the Squamish Nation. Um, our elected officials have a weighted vote, which sometimes uh, uh, can create some tensions around the group. And uh, it's a collaborative form of government and, um, and I, I sometimes describe that as when it works, uh, we can coordinate and do some just amazing things. Um, when the collaboration doesn't work, uh, we have some very, very long days. And, uh, and it really is key uh, for us as an, as an organization and as a board uh, for our directors to you know, take off their mayoral hat and, and put on their regional hat. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, regional issues at the regional table. And, uh, and we know that that's very difficult to do. Uh, their electorate is, is keenly um, interested in their, um, you know, their cities, their municipalities, uh, their areas. Um, but regional thinking really is uh, critical to solve some of the really complex challenges and, and, and rapidly changing environment that we're all dealing with. Um, my God, in the last 12 months, you know, we've gone from, um, you know, climate emergencies with, uh, with uh, um, uh, rainstorms that cut us off from the rest of Canada uh, through flooding through the um, uh, Fraser Valley. We had wildfires and smoke. And, uh, and I know, uh, you know, we've all been experiencing these challenges. Um, you know, the, the impact on our, our global supply chains, um, have not, not just from uh, uh, the issues, 
um, in Ukraine, but uh, before that, even with COVID um, uh, in China and Asia, um, you know, we found just how um, how fragile our, our our economic systems, our our, our supply chains, and and as we look around the world, even how fragile civil society can be. And so it's more important than ever that we um, uh, work collaboratively um, as a team, as you've, you've heard, um, and, when, and try to establish a feeling in our, in our boardroom where if one member um, you know, is facing a challenge and needs help, then the other members um, want to step up and, uh, and, and be part of the solution. Uh, we find that um, working as a federation, uh, you know, we all play different roles. And uh, and we can be much stronger in those in those uh, uh, situations. So, for example, the city of Vancouver, which is you know our largest municipality, um, they get their water from the North Shore Mountains, which are in the district of North Vancouver, a different city. Um, their sewer goes to Richmond uh, into a large treatment plant, which is a different city. Uh, their solid waste goes to a landfill in Delta, um, and so you know we all rely on each other um, to provide. Um, efficient, effective services across the region. And, and with that, we can generate some real economies of scale. Um, and we provide uh, um, really effective value in terms of pricing when we're, when we're sharing um, resources as a region. Um, economic development is a new initiative for us. We've been looking at Edmonton Global and at others and learning from you. Um, Invest Vancouver is the, our, our economic development uh, team. Uh, they've only been in place a little over a year now. Um, they sometimes say that, that hunting as a pack uh, gives them a lot more effectiveness. And, uh, and it's a combination of, you know, uh, finding areas where we collaborate and work together. And then also areas where there's some healthy competition between the, the municipalities. Um, but certainly when, when businesses are looking to um, uh, considering, um, you know, establishing themselves in a region, they, they don't want to get into the details of which one of our 23, you know, uh, areas uh, uh, do they want to locate. They think about coming to the Metro Vancouver region. And then we work with them, as you heard from some of the other speakers, we work with them to find where the best matches are and where the best advantages would be. And we do that by sharing resources, sharing leads and, uh, and sharing strategy. And, and like you, um, you know, I think we all are looking at the world and, and opportunities uh, for economic development. And, uh, I was very interested to listen about carbon capture. Uh, you know, we've got a large waste energy uh, facility in our in our system as well, and we're looking to to learn and and, and borrow some of that technology uh, that that uh, um, really is is being um, led in in Alberta, and and bring that into BC uh, to help us reduce our our GHGs. Um, I mean, the last thing I would say is uh, the, the really strong link between, you know, the city building that you're all responsible for and, and what I think are the, the real opportunities economically um, in, um, in, in, you know, clean tech and in, in, uh, in medical research and, and the areas of gaming and, and filming and post-production and um, all, all of those tech areas and green jobs and, and and the reason we focus on those isn't because they, they help us with our climate uh, commitments. It's because those are the areas of the economy that are growing at two or three times the rate of some of the other areas. That's, that's where we see the most potential. And, and what we're hearing from those companies is the biggest challenge they have is getting the best and the brightest um, employees from around the world uh, to want to join. And, and we find that through um, effective city planning and, and building, um, uh, cities that are that are walkable, that are beautiful, that bring the residents close to nature. Uh, we're building an environment that those brightest and best employees want to live in, and so there's a, a tremendous link between the uh, the planning work that we all do and and the economic development work, and 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 some of those greatest opportunities I think in the in the global um, sphere right now around business. So with that, maybe I'll, I'll stop and I look forward. To discussion and the questions and I'm happy to uh, talk about anything and, and as you heard in the intro I was a, an elected official for, for nine years um, as well as being a, a bureaucrat for 34 and so it is interesting to uh, sit on either side of the table 
and uh, and understand the challenges uh, that both both the staff and the elected officials are facing because uh, the challenges are formidable. Um, but uh, I know that both in Metro Vancouver and in the uh, your metropolitan region um, will be successful. So thank you. Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> All right, I have a million questions to frame up and ask, but what, what I think a good one to ask all four of you um, is, uh, how do I phrase this? Success is, is a team sport. That's what this panel is called. It doesn't matter whether you're working on innovation and pulling the region together. It doesn't matter whether you're building a team and a sports franchise or, or, or working internationally in sports businesses or cross-cultural opportunities or specifically dealing with regions. It, it's, a, it's a team sport and you have to pull people together. Now, you all talked about how success, what it looks like and that you need to work together. I, I venture to say that we all know that. We, it's important. The bigger question is, how do you overcome Come those those day by day, minute to minute struggles where elected officials are being tugged at, or, or we're all being tugged at by the people we represent, and we we're being pulled back to focus on ourselves and our own region, our own group, our own um, collective inter or personal interests, and missing the, the value of that collective cooperation. Can you can you like I know each of you will have um, examples of challenges you faced. I, I'm curious about how you overcome some of those challenges where where people are so focused on themselves that they don't want to work together. Any of you can go in any order. That's a super tough Two. question. Yeah. So you go first. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, well, well the, there's a couple of things. I, first of all, I, I, I really believe in uh, uh, this morning we we had a uh, smudge, and the idea um, of the smudge is, is not only a, a idea, an idea from our historic uh, past in terms of waking up in the morning and and, and um, having a clear mind about things. Um, we in in many of our First Nation communities we also use it to. Uh, consider respect and trust and honesty so that when you have the discussions you're bringing those values and principles to the table and and part of our uh, idea is that at, at some point in time we got to be able to trust people the same way you do in business you got to be able to, to say okay I, I, I we're going to invest but but we also need to be able to trust what we're investing in and uh, I, I think if we can always understand the principles of, of how we're going to entertain the discussion, it always makes things a little bit, a little bit easier. Uh, at the end of the day, there's always still negotiation on the technical stuff, whether it's how much and who's going to put in what and so forth. But uh, again, you go back to your principles and revisit those principles around trust and respect and honesty. And, and if you continue to do that, then eventually you get to, to some result. Right. <clears throat> so I, I can't agree more. Trust and respect is, the, is uh, the base of what you need. Then I think you have to draw a communal picture of where the goal is, because the goal is way out there somewhere. And the thing is, most people can't see way out there. They can see in the next year, two years, three years, but if you talked about 10 years or 15 or 50 years, many can't imagine that, right? But they need to, because they need to imagine it for their children and their children's children. So I think you have to break that long-term vision into what can be demonstrated within the next, typically three years or less. And I remember once um, when I launched the very first uh, business incubator to grow new businesses in Austin in the environment I described of mass unemployment. I said, we're, you know, if we're successful in 10 years, we'll fill all those empty towers downtown, million and a half square feet. We'll fill them all and it'll be filled with people with jobs. And I said, in three years, if we do really, really well, will create 200 jobs that will get us to that 
million and a half square feet and those thousands of jobs, tens of thousands of jobs. And it was interesting because when I said that, I actually said it to someone like the chief. And I said, chief, would you say that for me? Because I'm going to stand at the back of the room behind all of you and I'm going to see what people's heads do. Because you know we tend to do this or we tend to go, hmm, right? Yeah. And it was fascinating because everyone thought 200 jobs in three years was easy. But a million and a half square feet and tens of thousands of jobs were hard. And you could see them do this. And the truth is, it's the other way around. Those first 200 jobs were hard. In fact, we got to 325 jobs. And after that point, people said, well, I don't quite understand the next thing you're doing, but I believe in you because you've shown me what you can do. So I think building on what the chief said, we have to show little steps of what we can do to get to those big steps. But if we don't know where those big steps are in the future, we'll never quite get there. And agreeing amongst us of who takes which steps along that journey and how we help one another is so incredibly important. Mm. I don't know what else I'm supposed to say after that. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give two, two sport analogies. Because um, as Laura's talking about that, I'm thinking about Someone explained to me once the difference between what they thought a great leader and a superb leader was. And a great leader, when they pull back the arrow to aim at the target, they can see the bullseye. And that's very, very clear to everybody around what you're aiming at. But the superb leader has this arrow that shoots up into the sky, and it looks like he's going to completely miss that target. But that's because their target is behind that. It's a, a further target down the line that only a few people can see. So to the most people that are looking at that first target, it looks like they're going to completely miss it. So I, I definitely in your, in your term of your vision and, and, and um, being able to motivate people to understand a goal that's practical, that's the analogy that came to mind. At, at a more personal level today with the Edmonton Elks, we just recently anon, an, launched a new initiative for our preseason game on June 3rd, which is a fundraiser for Stand With Ukraine where well, we've created a whole new $15 ticket. I've got the city and Ticketmaster to waive their fees. All net proceeds are going to stand with Ukraine. Um, thank you. Uh, it was a bit difficult to set that target, particularly because the board had hired me to raise revenue. And the very first game, I said, we're going to give it all away. <laughs> and, but to your point about your vision and your values, this is what I think a community-owned team has to do. It has to be clear on what is important to it. And it has to be clear on being able to execute its vision in a practical way that everybody can understand. There's only one team in this entire, entire region that can bring 56, actually one team in all of Canada, that can bring 56,000 people together under one moment, under one area, under one cause, under one opportunity of awareness and fundraising and if we get it right as a community that's what we can do if you're clear on on that vision but had I stayed true to my immediate tactical opportunities it would have been keep the tickets prices high sell what we can get that revenue get the the butts in the seats excellent Jerry do you have any uh, additional comments yeah, well, I certainly agree with what's been said. Um, maybe I'll give you a couple of examples. I mean, I think, uh, first of all, you know, at a board level, relationships are so important. And we recently built a new building, um, our office tower. And, and in the design, it was very deliberate to um, build facilities, especially on the, the uh, board level, the board floor, that um, helped to cultivate and develop those relationships. So our, next to our boardroom is a director's lounge. Um, you know, we have meals uh, we borrowed from some of the First Nations traditions. We have, you know, a meal before uh, either breakfast or lunch before our meetings. Um, how many times have you gone to an event and you said, you know, the most important thing was the coffee you had with somebody before or after? 
where you connect it and, and you know, establish those relationships or maintain them. So, this, so that's the first thing I, I think it is so key. And obviously the last two years, the pandemic has really thrown all that out the window and with Zoom as well. And, and I've literally been watching um, the degradation of the relationships across, as I said, a 40 person board over the past two years from being on Zoom, from being remote, from not sitting next to each other, from not uh, chatting with each other face to face and in person. We're just starting to get that back and it's going to be so important for us to uh, build those relationships. Um, and also the planning, I'll just, uh, you know, we, we work on a four year election cycle and so we start as you start right at the beginning by developing our strategic plan. What is it we want hope to achieve? What are our values, uh, you know, as a new board for the next four years? We do a two year check in. Um, our financial planning is, is longer term, but our strategic planning in terms of what we you know why we're there and what we want to accomplish is, is very deliberate and very specific. And, uh, and, and I should say it's, it's, a, it's a difficult process because we've got an awful lot of diversity on our board in terms of, of uh, gender and ages and, and backgrounds. And so we've had a huge range of different values uh, within our board members. And so um, we have some pretty tough, crunchy discussion to work through what our, what our purpose is and what we want to achieve. Um, but it's much better to do that um, early on and and set that target um uh, then try to you know try to figure it out as you're as you're moving forward thank you thank you w one more quick observation and you can all you can tie it into some closing comments if, if you like but um i think sometimes the reason why we we fall apart in our collaboration is because we fail to understand who the real competition is i mean in in Austin, I could see how some jurisdictions would say, well, well, how come we're not getting the tech firm or, or why is it going to that community? On sports teams, we've seen athletes compete against their own teammates because they get more accolades or because they're more famous and yet the competition is the team you're playing against. We've seen indigenous communities and, and, and European communities use the phrases us versus them when, when really we need to work to collaborate. I mean, every single one of you has experienced some of that. How do you keep the focus on who the competition really is. I would say that, I mean, that's a very good point, but I would say that the competition actually starts internally with your ability to and desire to want to innovate and want to make those changes. Because quite often, we stop there. <laughs> you know, like we just, and that is the biggest hurdle. Once actually you, you get past that, you're just on this mission that you can unite other people. So, and I'll, get, I'll just go back again to the June 3rd initiative. I, I stood in front of the stadium and I brought the whole company together. And I said, I see at a preseason game, which typically we get 4,000 people to, that nobody cares about, the product on the field is poor because it's um, players that are trying to make the team. I said, I see a preseason game of 56,000 people in the stadium. And everyone in my staff looked at me like, oh my God, Victor, crazy new boss. You know, and they couldn't get past themselves of what it was. They're like, that's impossible. We've never done that in the entire history of the Edmonton Elks. Even when we had five in a row Grey Cup champions, we don't get a stadium full for a preseason game. And then I, I, said, I said, I gave them my proposal about the $15 ticket. I said, well, what if we do this? And all of a sudden, everybody stepped out of their own political <coughs> barriers and, and said, that makes perfect sense. We can do it. And they were thinking about how do they motivate their contacts and their network to, to make it happen. So that, that's where I'd say the first, the first biggest obstacle is. Excellent. I would say the responsibility fill, uh, falls on everyone in this room. Because the enemy is the one on the outside, not the one on the inside. And I think so much we, in areas of limited resources, we think the enemy is on the inside because we have to compete for that resource. When in fact, if we work together, we actually will get more resource. It's not one and one is two, it's one and one is three, and et cetera. And I think we have an abundance of resources amongst all of us, whether that's an hour of my time, a dollar of your money, your 
experience and expertise, your tool that I don't have but I need, it doesn't matter what your contribution is, we have an abundance of it here. In fact, I said when I came here, as many people ask me, well, why did I leave Austin, Texas? I just spent 20 years building it. Why did I leave? I said, because I was here on a board for seven and a half years, and you kept competing with one another and not getting on with what you needed to do. So perhaps I have to roll up my sleeves and tell, show us how we don't compete with one another. And, and it's easy to compete. We always want a little bit more. But I tell you, you have an abundance of opportunities if we can only come together. And in coming together, you'll be absolutely amazed at what be, could be done. The carbon capture, the new hydrogen plant, we've just put a $50 million hydrogen center of excellence to get more businesses here. The style of living, to have something for your families, to go see sports events and do good at the same time. So my challenge to you is, in this abundance, that we take for granted. Think about how you can do good, why you do well, because together there is no competition. You will beat them flat, hands down. And I don't have to be in just Edmonton or in Alberta to say, I'm competing with the world. I'm not competing with Edmonton. I'm not competing with Calgary. I'm not competing with Morinville. We, together, are competing with the outside, with the world. And that's what I truly believe. Excellent. Yes, sir. Um, a long time ago, and maybe not all that long ago, depends how we look at it, but we used to uh, send scouts to go see what people were doing and bring back information about our enemy, about people we were uh, um, going to uh, negotiate with or have discussions, uh, but primarily about what we considered our enemy and in, in our words, the white people, go go scout and go check it. And then people would sometimes would be gone for a long time and they'd, they'd come home and tell us what's happening. My grandfathers um, talk about uh, many of those discussions that were passed down to them. But today, we send our people to get educated. And I like to believe it's our, our new vision of our scouts and uh, uh, we have many people who, who now come home and, and they're lawyers and doctors and engineers and uh, they're challenging our old ways of doing things and, and what it's brought to me and some of our council and, and, and people who think about these things is that our, our biggest enemy is ourselves. And our biggest challenge is to make change and understand change. And it's those people that have those new visions, and they're scary people. I mean, people thinking about 15 and 20 years ahead, you think, what the hell have you been doing last night? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried about, you know, what's going to happen with the Oilers tomorrow night. You know, that's <laughs> all I got in my mind. But, but people are like that. And, and, um, I'm sure in the innovators, uh, people like Laura who, who push us to think differently are going to be the ones who are uh, going to create the change and those educated people who are going to push our communities um, will start to understand the only challenge and the only battles we have is with ourselves. And we've got to be able to, if we're going to continue to progress, uh, we've got we to get past ourselves. And, and, and start to think about what's best for everyone. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Brilliant. Jerry, any uh, closing thoughts? Yeah, I thought I'd just build on what you just heard. I mean, I think um, it's important that we remember why we're all here and why we're all in public service. And you, everybody in, in your room, you know, you have one and a half million people depending on you to collaborate and to be successful and to move your region forward. Sometimes I think when we start disagreeing and bickering, um, it's because we're thinking about ourselves, we're thinking about our personal needs and not thinking about the 1.5 million people, the residents that are relying on us to uh, deliver. And so uh, um, 
that's what I would uh, close with is, is we're all in public service and that means something. And, uh, and I think that allows us to look beyond ourselves as you just heard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the panel. That was absolutely amazing. Victor, did you get a chance to invite elected officials to, you're gonna invite elected officials June 3rd? They're invited, yes. Okay. <laughs> it's a good cause, um, June 3rd, uh, let's all go, okay? Yes, if I may. please. So we're also holding a conference um, called Inventures, and it is in Calgary, I will say. And it's about innovation, ventures, and capital. And the last time we held it live, which was two years ago, we had, it's about business. It's about what I call positive collisions, meeting people you don't know, reacquainting yourselves with friends, doing business. We brought in people from 36 countries, did 100 panels in two and a half wow. days, and it resulted in $246 million of business here with wow. people they had never met before. I invite you and, and uh, my colleagues with me, we're gonna leave some cards on the table or we'll give them. Um, I just invite you there. If there's anyone in your communities who want to come, Please don't see there's a, bar a barrier for buying a ticket. Call me and we'll make sure they can be there. Because this is about bringing the world to us while we try and support the world as it goes out with things like Victor's doing. So inventures, thank you. Thank you. I would like to invite uh, Mayors Troy and Burisma up to uh, present some uh, tokens of appreciation. And then we'll go on a break. One more thank you to the panel. And uh, we'll be back at 3 o'clock. You bet. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to make some introduction of our panel members uh, and our moderator for this session. First up, um, and in no particular order, because they're all amazing, so this isn't like I like the first one best or the last one best. I love them all. Um, first up, we have Gail Kutcher, first elected to the city of, yes, that's right, first elected to the city of Fort Saskatchewan Council in 2007 and the longest serving EMRB member. Mayor Katcher has seen the region's growth plan from infancy. She also served as chair of the Integrated Regional Transportation Master Plan Force and is currently the chair of the Governance and Human Resources Committee and a member of the Growth Plan Five-Year Interim Review Task Force. That is a mouthful. Yeah. Next up, uh, Kathy Heron, first elected to the City of St. Albert Council in 2010. Mayor Heron served as the 2014 Growth Plan Task Force uh, on the 2014 task force. Mayor Heron also served as a vice chair of the Shared Investment for Shared Benefit Task Force during the last term of the board and is currently a member of the Growth Plan Five-Year Interim <laughs> Review Task Force. You guys just love long names to these, don't you? Next up, we have uh, Tani DeBlanco, first elected to Leduc County Council in 2013. Mayor DeBlanco brings a strong rural voice to the table. She also served as the Regional Agriculture Master Plan Task Force and is continuing her role from last term as the Chair of the Board Audit and Finance Committee. And finally, Mayor William Choi, first elected... <laughs> you owe a lot of people a little e-transfer, don't you? <laughs> First elected to the Town of Stony Point Council in 2007, Mayor Choi began, became a board member in 2013. Mayor Choi has served on the Metropolitan Region Servicing Plan Task Force, was vice chair of the board for almost three years, and has served as chair of the board since September 2020. That is your panel. And we have uh, the moderator who, uh, there we go. Uh, we have newly elected uh, municipal um, from the region, Alan Gamble, Mayor of Parkland County, and the EMRB's Vice Chair. This is going to be an interesting session because we're taking a new member to council and to the board to, to ask some challenging questions and gather some background and interesting insights from some very experienced members, young, experienced members um, of the board. Brian, I turn it over to you. 
Thank you, MC Griffith. It's a pleasure to be here today. First of all, I don't do anything, the term moderator, I don't do anything in moderation, but I was told to be very quick today, that's what she said, and I will not go past the time, as I do have Mr. Cuff sitting right behind me watching over me, so I will not go beyond the time frame. So. Very happy to be participating in this panel session this afternoon. It will be a great opportunity for all of us to hear from the veterans who have been around the EMRB table and before that the CRB table for one or more terms. There's no better way to learn about the board and its work than through the members who can provide different perspectives and insights and share successes and challenges that the board faces together. Over the next 40 minutes, I hope that through a discussion of the board's work and the experiences of our board members, we can learn more about this legacy work and why it matters so much. The core of our mandate and the heart of our work is related to our growth plan, and it is an award-winning plan. Mayor Heron, I'm going to start with you. Can you tell me a bit more about the significance of this plan? what it was like to sit around the table, and what were some of the lessons learned from your experience? I, I absolutely can. I'll start with, um, <clears throat> I was just a counselor when I sat on the growth plan, and the, my mayor, Mayor Nolan Kroos, trusted me with, with that um, honor, and, along with Gil Ketcher, former mayor of Mournville. Lisa Holmes was on that task force as well, so it's nice to have her in the room. Uh, so a lot of the mayors in this room have heard this story but so for the councillors in this room, I think it's important for you to actually, if given the opportunity, like Reed and Kristen had today, to step up and get on committees and, and or task force, because it was really, it was a good learning experience and good mentoring for my future role as mayor. And the growth plan, uh, I th you might remember Gail, or maybe, is Sue still here? I'm not sure. <coughs> the first growth plan was, in, in my understanding, was actually just a bunch of mayors standing around a map throwing, throwing colors on it, and it was not well planned. <laughs> and so we decided we needed a new growth plan. And one of the most important things is that we wanted the entire region to feel that they were um, equally represented in that growth plan. So that was a big sense of responsibility. And I think the other really uh, important part of the work that we did for that was we had the planning team sitting with us at the table. It wasn't just elected officials. It was myself, a city planner from another municipality, Gail, a city planner from another. It was a good representation of all municipalities and elected with their positions, but the planners who really knew how to do land use planning. So uh, as Doug said, it's award winning and we're very, very proud of it. The biggest thing for me in the entire growth plan experience was the conversation around agriculture land and how, and I forget the exact numbers, but in X number of years, Canada and most likely Alberta being a big part of that will be one of a very few countries, one of seven countries that will be, was it 2030? Thank you. We can all speak, I think. Just, 2030 will be one of seven countries that can actually export food to feed our globe. It, you know, we'll be at 10 billion people. Someone's got to feed the, those people. It will be Alberta, it, and that will probably overtake as a natural resource oil and gas. So we cannot um, build parking lots over top of that ag land. So the responsibility is on all of us, those in the counties to, to make sure that it is preserved and, and farmed, and those in the municipalities to grow up, grow in, and uh, if we have to grow out, do it very responsibly and try to densify. So those are my opening comments on the growth plan. Thank you, Mayor Heron. Also, what we will do is just open it up for anyone in the crowd who has a question. If you just raise your hand, uh, MC Griffith will bring you up front or provide a microphone so that we can have your question addressed as well. Thank you very much. Uh, no doubt things like density targets were controversial. Mayor Heron, can you share a bit more about how the board navigated through some of these difficult conversations? You're up again. I'm going to lean on Gail a bit too because this was a c controversial topic and the, the original targets were higher than we actually settled on. Um, those of us sitting around the table learning the process understood the value of densification but then of course you have to take it back to your council and try to explain what we have learned in months and months and months of education and then of course the public um, doesn't always understand <coughs> zero lot lines and, and r building up. So it, there would be some in the region, I'm sure, that thought we went too far. 
and some that thought we didn't go far enough. But the important part is we actually got to a, a place that we can actually um, strive to achieve. And in my opinion, I would have liked to have the infill not aspirational. I thought it should have been a hard target, but uh, that was a compromise I made. So, you know, it was it was because of the working relationships of the mayors around the table. Well, I wasn't a mayor, I was a councillor. <laughs> around the table and the trust that we built through the process that we came to the good decisions that we did. Great, thank you, Mayor Heron. Mayor Catcher, to provide her perspective. Uh, you were also a member of the Growth Plan Task Force. What sticks out foremost in your mind about the experience on the Growth Plan Task Force? Thank you, and just before I begin, I just want to thank my cheering section, uh, Councillors Blizzard and Councillor <laughs> Noyan. Uh, we're here in small group, but thank you for those cheers. Much appreciate it. <laughs> looking at my council, like, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> so really what sticks out in my mind, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the veteran uh, that's, that's uh, left. I'm, I'm the longest serving one. But, you know, we, we figured out that uh, the growth plan needed to be fixed. So we said, you know what, we can do a minor, minor tweaks to it, or we can actually sit down and make it something worthwhile. And we actually started pulling it apart. But I think for everybody in this room, you have to remember when we started this growth plan, there was 24 of us sitting at the table. So if you think it's tough to get consensus with 13, it's even tougher to get consensus with 24. And uh, you know, it, it just really always stood out in my mind that you know, the process that we had to go through to get people involved, the stakeholders that we had to get involved, and, and we, we embraced and, and we talked with businesses, chambers, industry, um, the Indigenous community. You know, we, we wanted to make sure that, that we were going to get it right this time. And, you know, when it came to the vote at the very end, um, the words were said. Okay, not everybody agrees with what is in this growth plan, but if we're equally unhappy, then we have done our job. <laughs> and, and those words could not be truer said, because as mayor sitting around there, it's very difficult for you to go back to your councils and say, well, I had to vote for that because maybe your council didn't support it, but you have to sit at this board with your regional hat on. You know, this growth plan that we, we Create it was a real game changer. And I have to give a shout out to Sharon Shuya over here. That's her baby. <laughs> she walked us through that. And she gave 30 years, or 30, not 30 years, 30 months, 30 months to help create this. And it was about the interlocking parts of this to have the agriculture, to have the biodiversity areas, to have the land use, to have each one of these areas and you know what for me because it's so interconnected now I really believe this document is historical and it was life-changing for all of us in the region but I really I, I always go back to Sharon because every time there was a problem she got it fixed so She's thank you cry. Yeah. great <laughs> thank you and I concur with my early tensure on the work that Sharon does so commendation to you as well Mayor DeBlanco you joined the board last term after the growth plan had had been approved. For all of us who are new to this, can you share what has struck you most about the growth plan and how you would suggest new board members and councillors can best learn about the plan and what it means for all of us? Um, th thanks for that question. Um, a, a couple of things. I mean, I, I want to start and be, be absolutely transparent here. Leduc County did not support the growth plan. Uh, I think we were the only municipality who did not, and we did not because we believed it needed to have more of a focus on agriculture and agricultural land and agricultural land use in it, which from that we came up with RAMP and was pleased to work on that. So I, I think what's important about the growth plan, and if I was a new councillor and I was giving advice to someone out here going, oh my word, it's too long, it's too... Take a look about what it says for your municipality type. So if you're a rural, take a look about what it says. If you're a city or a town, take a look. Understand 
The intention was to preserve, and I don't have the number in front of me, um, hundreds of quarter sections of land. By growing responsibly and agreeing on density targets, we were actually going to be saving uh, prime ag land. So I would say, you know, take a look at those pieces of it, and then, and because I do like planners, sit down with one of the planners in your organization and say, what does this mean for us? And I think that's actually done better on a one-on-one -on -one or you know two or three people. But take an example. We're doing this new subdivision and this is why it's going to do that. I'm a former teacher, Mayor Gamble, and I think that the best way to learn something is actually to go through the action of doing it. And so if it's, we've now approved this subdivision and this is why it's this way, and here's how it fits with the growth plan, that's the best way to do it. You need to be in real world. Uh, I'm not somebody who could actually read the MGA and remember anything in it, but if I need something out of the MGA, I can find it and use it. So that would be my advice for understanding the growth plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor DeBlanco. That is tremendous advice. Walk the walk and, and put your feet in the boots, and, and uh, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I'll turn it over to Mr. Choi, Mayor Choi, the individual who got the biggest applause at the beginning. Is there anything you would like to add regarding your thoughts on the growth plan? I think one of the easiest way to sell us to <coughs> residents and new members of council is just take a step back. Okay. So far, there's only one earth. That is right now, and probably in the foreseeable future, there's only one planet that we can inhabit and live on. So what does that mean? That means we have to be very good stewards of what we have. There's no more land being created, but there is more population each and every year. To be good stewards of that, that means there is places for, to build homes, to raise cows, to grow grains, to feed our the population, our world, and our country. That's what we need to look at. So that's one of the biggest things that I've always supported, the, in, in, the increased densities, because we only have one plant to, to live on right now, and we have to take care of it. Did you not watch E.T.? <laughs> I did, and as I mentioned before, I'm still looking to get beamed away, Mr. Scotty. Awesome. So thank you, Mayor Choi. Before we move on to the IRTMP, I'll just look out to the audience if there are any questions to be addressed from the group out there. It is quiet. We're going to move right on. I understand that once the province approved the plan back in 2017, the focus of the board then shifted to implementation, which included things like the development of an integrated regional transportation master plan, IRTMP. Mayor Katcher, you were the chair of the IRTMP task force. Could you share with us your perspective in shifting from developing the growth plan to its implementation? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, and the reason there's no questions, everybody wants the reception and to have a drink, so um, kudos to you. So yes, I was the chair of the IRTMP for the ERM, Edmonton Region Metropolitan Region Board. We have so many acronyms, but um, you know, you have to think about it. Back in 2011, we actually had a task force that dealt with the transportation component of that, and we had Ed Gibbons, who was chair. And we actually started the first parts of, of creating this, this transportation plan with these priorities. But uh, then we found, you know, like it, it wasn't enough. But as the growth plan was approved, what we said is one of the, one of the pillars within that was to talk about our transportation uh, and how it ties to land use. And I think that that's one thing that was really important because we continue to talk, to talk about, you know, we're competitive and, and everybody wants new roads and, you know, the multimodal part of this. And we said, you know what, as part of getting into developing the IRTMP and implementing it, it's really about having these priorities. And for those who are listening to the um, to the workshop yesterday, Stephen Power said it really, really, really well yesterday. You know, the IRT brings us together, and when it comes to the priorities, we now have a model. So when we're talking about uh, uh, Sturgeon needs a road or Leduc needs a road, this model actually shows where those priorities are, and they're not ranked. 
they're, they're within a group grouping, so they can go up and they can go down depending on where they are as far as if they're ready for construction or if they're just in planning and design. And the biggest message that I think I can give out of this for the implementation of this is we want to be working with the provincial government when it comes to having them taking these priorities and saying, okay, we're going to take these and these will be included in our budgets. And I know it's really hard for every one of us as an individual municipality or a member of council not to be out there lobbying for our own projects, but sometimes that can be detrimental because then the province can come back to us and say, you really aren't working together. If you're truly working together, these priorities that are established and these priorities are coming out of everybody's uh, transportation plans. And that's something that's really important for every one of you to remember. So if you have a question of that, why yours isn't in the priority or where it is, go back to your transportation master plan for your municipality and then you can peel the onion back and figure out where it fits in in there. So, you know, it's really about saying we need to support the priorities that are in this plan and each time one of them comes off, we've done our job. And so like the 65th Avenue one for Leduc, that will serve that part of the region, just think about that. 13 of us, because it was in our priority list, were able to sign that letter because it was supported in the plan. And that's how we get things done. Thank you, Mayor Ketcher. I'd like to ask Mayor Heron to comment on the value of the technical working group members and their engagement at the task force level, whether it be the previous growth plan task force or the ramp task force? Sure, I'll be really fast on this one, it's pretty simple. Uh, I know there's a lot of pressure and stress put on each municipality asking for staff to sit on these, these technical working groups. But as I said, you wouldn't want the mayors making these plans because we don't have the expertise. It, it's simple as that. Um, for the region to grow, we need to lean on our administration and I know, I know nothing about um, transportation planning or solid waste. So it, it's simple, it's just they need to be there uh, without them. Uh, and so every one of us needs to, you know, give that message to your city manager that this is important, that, the, that we have staff sitting on these committees and, uh, and then thank them when they're done. Can I make an extra comment? Yeah. Certainly you may. Thank you, Mayor Heron. Move back to Mayor Catcher. Sorry, if I can just make an extra comment on that. So as the uh, chair of the IRT, uh, MP, it was really important. Uh, we had the working group that was going out and doing their work and then they would come to the meetings and I think the first meeting we had, we had the mayor sitting at the table and the working group behind us and every time there was a presentation we continued to look behind us for the answers and I said, that's garbage. Yeah. I said, they need to be sitting here at the table with us and even though they don't have a vote, they can, you know, rather than repeating this all the time, they can help guide us, mentor us, and actually we were able to move faster because they actually sat at the table with us. And I think that's a model that I would like to see at any of our, our committees and, that we have because we send them away and then, and, then, and then we need them to explain everything. So let's just let them do it at the table. <laughs> Great, thank you, Mayor Catcher. Moving on to something that's near and dear to the heart of Parkland County, I'll turn it to um, Mayor DeBlanco and uh, moving on to the ramp. I'd like to turn to Mayor DeBlanco to get your perspective as a ramp task force member that led to the development of our first regional agricultural plan or ramp. Um, thanks, and, and again, near and dear is, is uh, absolutely true. And as I said earlier, it, it's interesting because Leduc County chose not to support the growth plan because it didn't have enough about agriculture. So it was added in that we would go ahead and create this regional agricultural master plan. And uh, it was a, a, a lot of work for four years. What we did is we saw that the land that was going to be encompassed by the growth plan, 85% of that land was being used for agriculture. And yet the, the, the document itself didn't direct 
adequately address agriculture. We also knew that 30% of that 85%, you can do the math, was prime <laughs> agricultural land and needed to be looked at more specifically. And so we began a very hard process. And I will say that very honestly, because I think when we started the discussions, um, it was clearly two camps. There was the rural camp, which is um, no more conversion of agricultural land for urban growth. And there was the urbans going, yes, but we have a right to grow. And the growth plan says we have a right to grow. And if that's the only place we can grow, then that's where we're going to grow. And we had many, many, many difficult conversations about how to move through. And what was interesting, and, and again, this is me being a teacher, so forgive me, the, every single time we had a meeting and we had a conversation and we even had disagreements, and, and I will be honest and say they weren't, they weren't really polite, sometimes disagreements, we understood each other's position a little bit better. And we started to do what we call an education, which is make meaning together. And we had to understand each other's perspectives. And so as we worked through it, a couple of things came out of it. First off, it had to be a realization from the rural perspective that we're not going to save every acre of land. That, that that's, not a, that's not a possibility in an ever-changing world, in a growing area, that we're not going to change. And so then it became, so how do we determine what to save? How do we determine what we're going to earmark as being prime educational land? And we started a process um, with something called LISA, which is a land evaluation site assessment tool. Uh, we had somebody come up from the United States, talk about their model, and we created our old model that looked at the quality of land, it looked at where the land was located, it looked at how, fragment, how, fragment, how fragmented, fragmented, how fragmented <laughs> the land was, um, what, were there any other pressures around it so that we could start to look at that piece of uh, land in a different way. And um, so we were able to create that. We also had an opportunity then to use the, the agricultural strategy documents that were brought forth by individual rural municipalities to look at things like, and, and we were guilty for wasting land too, for looking at things like uh, conversion that we were doing rurally um, and fragmentation that we were doing rurally to try and come up with something that made sense. And that was really our hardest uh, discussion because it had to be, I have to say no, as, as somebody, uh, a mayor and a councillor and working on my subdivision board to my neighbor who wants to cut off seven acres because he thinks his kid might want to live there one day, but really I know he's just going to sell it because he knows he can. Right? So we all had to compromise, as, as Mayor Catcher said, we all had to move through, but now we have the first ever, and I will go back again, at a time when we know that Canada will be one of five net exporters of food, do you know what one of the other countries is? The Ukraine. So now we're down to four countries that can net export food. We need to be mindful. I heard somebody talking about when you have plenty, it was somebody in this, that you forget that it could be scarce, even though you think you have a lot of it, and that's how we are with agricultural land. So it was great. It was a great experience. It was a frustrating experience. Again, thanks to Sharon, uh, the patience of Job there, to, to work through and always come back with the next iteration and push us just far enough. So um, that's my piece. Can I tell a quick little story about uh, the transportation master plan? You are going to tell that so story. So I, I am. So. <clears throat> We're sitting in council meeting one day or at the end of council and our uh, engineer who works on the, the group comes in and he's, he's in flustered. You know, he's just, he's in a fluster. What's wrong? They're not going to support the, the list. They're not going to support the list. I said, who's not going to support what list? Well, the, the transportation master plan, they, they're, they're just not going to support it because they're not, you know, so-and-so isn't going to support it because they're not on top. And it was like, calm down. Calm down, right? Because we're talking about an engineer, so there's right, there's wrong, follow the rules. We know how engineers are, love them dearly, but they are like that. They are not politicians. So, so then we take a look at it, and uh, we, go, we go to the board meeting, and I happen to be sitting in for our former mayor, John Whaley, at the time, and the list comes out, and I can't remember who it was. Well, this, this is wrong. This is wrong because this should be on the front. And no, yeah, no, this is wrong because this should be. And so I put up my hand, and I said, did we see the criteria? 
I mean, oh yeah. Did everybody support their criteria? I was like, oh yeah. And I said, well then we need to get out of the way and let the criteria made by the people that we agreed to drive the decision because not everybody can be on the top of the priority list. Because sometimes that's a shock. Sometimes there's that bit of, that's my story. And Des has recovered now and we're okay. <laughs> it was a good story, but it wasn't that short. <laughs> they, they never are, Mayor Gamble, they never are. Thank you, Mayor DeBlanco. Let's shift gears a bit and turn to Mayor Choi, my best friend. Mayor Choi has been around the board table since 2013, and he is now serving as our board chair. I'm sure you've seen a lot of change. Part of that change was the addition to our mandate to develop a Metropolitan Region Servicing Plan, or MRSP, another acronym. You served as a member of that task force. Can you tell us a little bit more about the MRSP and how it fits in with the growth plan? Sure, thank you. And definitely uh, jump in if I just say something wrong, because I usually do. I have three female parents here that'll <laughs> make sure that I stay in line here. <laughs> definitely, in terms of the MRSP, it's about looking what's best for the region. Uh, we've adopted and we approved the growth plan. We have IRTMP. The next step was regionally, how do we provide those services to the next million people that come into our communities? We know dollars are finite. Both the provincial and federal governments were downloading and they're also cutting our funding. Well, we can't keep on going to the tax base and increasing taxes to pay for those services. The servicing plan allows us, as 13 municipalities, to look at areas where we can think we can save money, provide better services for our residents at a lower cost. It's not about losing the control or not providing the services, is looking at where we can find the synergies to provide them together. Sometimes it's gonna be at a sub-regional level, and sometimes it will be at a regional level. But that's the conversation around the table, and that's why we should continue to pursue the MRSP. Thank you, Mayor Choi. Any questions about any of the task forces that we've discussed this afternoon from the audience? We'll now move to final comments, and I'll start with Mayor Katcher. Great. Thank you very much. Um, you know, for me, it's been uh, a real honor to sit on the um, first the Capital Region Board and then the Edmonton Metropolitan Board. And when I was elected in 2010 and got to sit at the big table for the very first time, I was skeptical. I had lots of questions. And I asked lots of questions, and, and I had lots of doubt, and I, I sometimes think I was the devil's advocate. But, you know, what I learned over time with everything that we do at the Edmonton Metropolitan is that we are working for this region. Um, you know, we didn't talk about it today, but, you know, you think about it. The Transit Commission was incubated out of the EMRB. And uh, when I sat on there in 2007 for, and, and um, it was Councillor Iveson at the time was on the committee with me. And we finally got to a point of saying, you know what, we're not making any progress. So finally Edmonton and, and St. Albert said, you know what, we're gonna take the lead on this. And we have got something wonderful happening. You know, the other one that we didn't talk about today either was we talked about economic development around the table and, and we talked about shared investment for shared benefit. But what came out of that was Edmonton Global. So in many instances, we will do a one-off from the mandate, but what comes out of it is something just incredible. And so with that, we have got two entities that were, were born from the, from the EMRB, and you know, they're just taking us further into the future. You know, the hardest thing you can do is to sit on, sit on this board sometimes because you do wear two hats. And it's, your council's not always gonna be pleasant with you, but you always have to remember the regional perspective. And when we do our votes, that's how we vote. And uh, you know, when it came to the growth plan, it was really about putting our egos aside 
and it was learning that we really are speaking the same language because the mayor of Wabam and, and I, we kept coming to, to blows with one another and we finally sat down and, and he says, well, you can't do more, you, you can't split this agriculture land. And I said, well, I absolutely agree with you. I said, my kids are farmers and they hate it when somebody goes out and puts a, a house and builds an acreage out there. And he says, that's what I'm talking about. And I go, oh my God, we're talking the same language, just, just in different languages. So, you know, um, it, it's about learning and it's about coming out to these events. It's, it's just opening your mind to the possibilities. So I will leave with that because uh, we've got three more and some of that. Thank you, Mayor Catcher. <laughs> We're going to take one minute for each of the three mayors because I'm going to give you five minutes back for a break and you can always say Mayor Gamble gave us that break. So it's going to be a good thing. <laughs> Not yet. Mayor Heron. I'll tell you a story. On um, Wednesday, we had, or Tuesday, I can't remember, we had a business breakfast in St. Albert, and uh, Beaumont was there, and Mournville was there. So I've got the entire spectrum of the region that comes to support me in my own St. Albert initiative. And I sat with uh, Minister MacGyver at the breakfast. And a lot of the messaging throughout the whole breakfast was about regional collaboration and, and the collaborative economic development and, and transit and how that's going to drive our economy. It was all about the region. And Minister Begaira leaned over to me and said, I should have brought all the Calgary mayors up here to hear this speech. And he's absolutely right. We, as, as diverse in our opinions, we, we can have. We're not Calgary. <laughs> We're much better than Calgary. Our growth plan is award-winning, and we, we somehow, through that division, find common ground all the time, and, it, and an event like this is exactly the reason why. And I've sat around the table as a counselor, just observing, because I found it fascinating, and now as mayor, and I can honestly say some of my best friendships are um, the mayor's uh, former and present in this, in this region. So as you are new counselors or returning counselors, I really encourage you to take as much advantage of any regional opportunity, whether it's here or it's Alberta municipalities or even FCM, uh, getting to know your colleagues that are elected is a good way to um, relieve the stress, which we're going to do in about a half an hour over some beers. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mayor Heron. Mayor DeBlanco. Um, just looking at the title, there's no uh, winning without hard work and understanding. I, I would encourage every council to have an opportunity once a month to review what's happened at EMRB. And be it in an in-camera session or a whatever session, a workshop session, you need to do that. You need to understand what your mayor is voting on when they go and represent you and your residents at the EMRB table. I would encourage some acronym bingo but for drinks, but that's just <laughs> my own personal bugaboo because I think we're right full of acronyms. But, but you need to do that. It's not good enough to say the mayor knows your residents count on you to know what's happening there. And one of the things we do is once a month, we actually just review all, those, all what's happened at the meetings. If there's a decision point, I'll ask for advice on the decision point. And, and my, my council doesn't understand it to the same level I do, but I know that they understand what we're doing. So ask questions, make sure you understand it. I know it's extra on your plate, but it's a critical part of where you spend money and what your residents expect you to know. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Chair Choi. Okay. Thank you, and I just have to just kind of tag on with Mayor DeBlanco about the headline. There is no winning without hard work. Right? And I always want to bring you guys to the vision. If you can see two words above us, and those two words are politics and governance. Politics is easy. We can sit there, we can lay blame, we can complain about other people, we can, whatever we can do. That's politics. Governance is what we do here at the MRB and most of our councils. That's the hard work. That's laying the foundations for future generations. Those that are just newly elected probably don't see any of your fingerprints on what's happening in the community today. But you will. But that's the future. Those that have been re-elected many times, we can see the fingerprints and the thumbprints that we've worked on through our community. That's the difference. The hard work is actually doing the governance and not succumbing to the rhetoric, the opinions, and the politicking. Focus on governance. 
Thank you, Chair and Mayor Troy, and to all of the mayors and colleagues. I'll now turn it back over to MC Griffith. Thank, thank you, you very all. much. So, uh, thank you to the panel members. <laughs> and I very much appreciate Mayor Gamble's um, nobility in giving you a five minute break, but five minutes isn't enough. And if we do the last session, then you can have five extra minutes at the end of the bar. So, we're going to go straight into the next session. I really appreciate that, uh, folks. Now, the, the last presenter, uh, I mean, it, it, it kind of goes without saying he know, needs no introduction, but I get the pleasure of introducing him. And it's because he is so well known around the province. He is so well known across Western Canada. And in some of the places I've been to in the U.S. where we've worked with communities, his name carries there too. He, he is an expert in his field. He's done over 700 seminars, over 400 studies. He has got video learning classes to teach you roles and responsibilities and governance, as Mayor Choi indicated. He does live sessions. And I mean, his expertise is in municipal leadership and governance. And he, he, I consider him a colleague, I consider him a friend, and frankly, ladies and gentlemen, if I achieve a third of what this man has achieved in his life, I will consider it a success. I'd like to welcome and introduce George Cuff. Thank you very much, good well, words, thank you. You're welcome, that's right there. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Griffith. I appreciate the introduction, I appreciate the comments from all. And I appreciate, of course, the fact that we spent a very good day, and I was here for 90% of that, but very good day, I thought, listening to presentations from people that are passionate, that care about the area, care about the region, uh, are informed on what they do. I think uh, and you couldn't sit here without being impressed by the caliber of the speakers nor by the caliber of the material presented. It gave us all a really good cross-section of what goes on in the Edmonton region. And I think for that, uh, all of the speakers, including your guest speakers, uh, ought to be commended. So this is, uh, you know, it's a really good snapshot. I'm not sure everybody realizes that, but I don't know where else you could go to get the kind of snapshot that we've just had uh, of the Edmonton region and how important it is for all of us. I have a fair bit of material that I thought I was supposed to be covering, except by and large, most of it's been said as the argument goes. Um, Mayor Heron should know that this picture was taken in the macaroon shop in downtown St. Albert uh, not too long ago, and I think it was, um, the problem was I had a previous picture to that uh, with me with dark hair and a dark beard, so I thought it was time to introduce the, the new look. Uh, anyway, the caption simply says that uh, he's old, he's been around for a while, uh, he's studied most organizations, uh, he's caused some angst for some, and probably patted on the back for several others. I spoke to all of your administrators at the uh, Kananaskas conference two days ago, and uh, came back home, and I was doing a webinar for ICMA, which is all the municipal managers across the U.S. and internationally, and it's to go for all of their elected officials. So they asked me to do six components of an elected official uh, series, and I did that, and I was doing now component number three, I think it was, and I had about 30 seconds before I had to go on live, and I thought, I can't stand the noise that's outside my back door. And uh, so I raced up the stairs. Well, I went up two at a time. I think I got through the first two, and I felt something pop in the back of my left leg. And I managed to stumble back to the webinar and carried on for two hours preaching. Uh, while my leg was absolutely in pain, and it still is, but in any case, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to head over to a hospital right after this is over to find out, was this just a sprain or was it something more significant? Anyway, I've been attended to uh, by a very fine person in your audience, uh, Heather, who's uh, been kind enough to make sure I had some uh, Advil and a few other things, so I'm being well looked after, and I appreciate that. The MRB is a, a long-standing uh, background in terms of where from, uh, but it has an actually fairly short career. Uh, 13 municipalities mandated by the government to sit around the table. All of them are a population of over 5,000. Board members appointed under Section 708.4 of the MGA, which is known somewhat historically as the uh, Bible for Municipalities. Uh, it says essentially, according to the regulation, that the representatives are expected to represent the perspectives of the region 
and recognizing that they are coming from individual municipalities, but they are still expected to speak to what's in the best interest of the region, all of which, of course, is very, very difficult, and most of you that have been on the board have figured that out by now. Um, let me just move myself forward to where I thought I was, and uh, we'll be there in a moment. Legislation and regulation is covered by 708.2. It's only one of two growth management boards. I think based on what I've heard to date, it's made more progress than that which has been achieved so far by the Calgary Metropolitan Region Board. Uh, it's not an extension, which is, I think, a very fundamental point, uh, which I don't think was absolutely clear at the outset. It's not another order of government. Uh, it's not a provincially designated agency, which uh, it may have paralleled at one time. It's a provincial corporate board that's set up since 2013 as a growth management board. All of the members have a duty to act in the best interests of the region when sitting at the table. The mandate is uh, specified in the regulation, which says the board should strive toward consensus regarding matters that are affecting the board, promoting long-term sustainability, which we've heard about today uh, in, in a fair bit of detail, ensure environmentally responsible land use planning, growth management, develop policies, promote economic well-being, and develop policies that engage the public on the growth plan. And then in fulfilling the mandate, the board should further prepare a growth plan, prepare a servicing plan, which I believe is underway, and also is to advise and make recommendations to the minister with regard to the implementation of those plans and develop policies with regard to uh, the cost sharing of the costs of this regional business. Principles of good governance are basic good principles for all municipalities and also for a board such as the regional board uh, here that we're talking about today. Principles say that the decisions are future focused and intended to serve the region well and people will 20 years from now look back on this event, look back on this board and say, did it in fact uh, achieve what it set out to do? Did the decisions, were they forward thinking? Did they look down the road? And we heard about that today uh, several times about uh, individual speakers having commented about it. Are you talking about things that are right in front of you or are you talking about things further down the road? The decisions that you make here, uh, you will, like I have, look back on and say, uh, boy, those decisions contributed too. So that when I go to the July 1st day in Spruce Grove at uh, the Heritage Park, I look at that and I look at the number of people, the number of kiosks, the number of volunteers, I look at all of it and I know that I was at the table negotiating with a developer to get us 60 acres of clear free land in those days free land that we would dedicate to a regional park for Spruce Grove in the area. And, and years later, this, this park has come to fruition over a series of councils. Was it my council? No, it wasn't. But somebody, you see, had to initiate. Somebody had to get the idea in their heads to say, this could be a fantastic feature for the community. We were being advised to give it up because the developer was going broke and so on. We said, no, we're hanging on to this one piece of our development agreement. It's really proved to be a good decision in the longer term, but when you look at it on a short-term basis, you think, will anybody know? When I drive down roads in my community or roads in your communities, I think somebody planned this. The, the mayor before me was, a, was the head of regional planning for the Alberta transportation. Our roadway is excellent. The roads make sense, they, they, they follow a good pattern and so on, and the expansion is already built into the roads, which not everybody would have done back in those days. You need to have an ethical table where people can speak their minds in truth about what they see happening and what they see that they think should happen. And I think this whole issue of ethical behavior at a board table is absolutely uh, fundamental to how well your board is gonna function. If you can't have an ethical discussion, you're gonna end up on front page somewhere saying that somebody has walked away from their, their uh, ethical basis, uh, from what they said they would contribute, from what they said they would do, and they've decided to turn their back on the whole enterprise. Has that happened? Absolutely. There's all kinds of examples across Canada, and in fact, places where I've been called in to review uh, where people's ethical uh, wavering has caused them all kinds of problems, in turning, including their own reputation. 
You need adherence to a consensus building model. I mean, I was quite impressed actually by what I heard today because this is a, a process that's evolving as we hear it being spoken by people like Mayor Gamble uh, and others around the table who are fairly new to the, this role and yet are speaking what I think is absolute wisdom around what are we trying to do as a region? How are we looking beyond our own particular borders? How are we seeing the broader picture when in actual fact we get elected under a, either a ward basis, a division basis, or a smaller municipality basis, we come to a larger region and now we're asked to talk about what's in the best interest of the whole. And to me that's a huge challenge. The very few communities across Canada would have that challenge put in front of them. And in fact, many have a hard time managing their own council or their own small region. And we're talking about a region the size of the Edmonton metropolitan region. To me, this is a, a massive undertaking. It's similar to what the Metro Vancouver went through, a GVRD at one time now called Metro Vancouver. Uh, a similar kind of process and similar uh, status that we have here today. Primacy of the region, we've talked about that. Open meeting says that whatever happens, that people should be able to look in and say, is this good governance in action? And it should be. You should be able to stand up and say, you know, we've got good decision-making process. We've got good advice coming to us from our CEO and, and from the regional CAOs. Uh, are we getting the right kind of information at the table? Are we getting briefed in advance of meetings? All of that should be a part of good governance and I hope is what's happening at the EMRB table. Regular and transparent reporting, that to me says that this information is available to go back to your constituent members, that's important. An apolitical administration, the last thing you want is somebody who's trying to be one of you on the board side of the table, they aren't. Their job is to be your principal advisor or advisors. Uh, their job is not to replicate you, which is a problem with many municipalities that you, as you would know across this province and around Canada. We need people that understand role clarity. They need people that understand that regardless of how smart I am administratively, that's not my role. I'm now a board member. My role is to look at it from a much broader lens called what's in the best interests of this region. And a big, system, big systems view simply says that. It says that we're gonna look at the community and the organization from a broader perspective rather than from an individual one. The principles also include Board oversight, which says that the board is responsible and as a result of that will monitor what's going on in the organization. All members will be participating. There'll be a respect for your administration, which unfortunately I don't find in a whole lot of organizations. I find administrations being trodden down by their elected officials. That's not to be happening at a regional table. It shouldn't happen at your local table because you see these as people that are quality people. Board chair is your spokesperson. You've elected a good board chair in William Choi. Uh, I think Mayor Choi has uh, been an excellent choice and he's a person that's passionate about the region. And for that reason, he's able to speak it and live it. And by the way, has a good Chinese food restaurant. <laughs> board chair is spokesperson. We have a good neighbor policy. You know, I hear some of the comments being made today. I was absolutely impressed by the degree of camaraderie around these tables. And I think the fact that there is such camaraderie is going to really speak well for, the, for this region as a whole. It's self-regulating the principle of, you know, that you have to be able to look at your own organization and say, do we have the proper bylaws? Do we have the proper code of conduct? Do we have the proper policies? All of which are useful in regulating the, the uh, board. And in this case, the board is also accountable for its actions and for its oversight of the region. The roadblocks, and I'm going to spend very little time on some of these, but I, you'll know them. Road clarity is a roadblock to any good organization. If it wasn't for those two words, I'd have been unemployed 42 years ago. But I haven't been, because people have a hard time understanding who has what role. It's a fundamental principle of good governance, who has what role. Gaps in understanding each other's local perspectives. I mean, one of the beauties of today was to get a better handle on what are the individual communities doing, regardless of whether or not it's Edmonton, which I find fascinating, or it's a community that, the size of Devon, which I also find fascinating and drive through on a regular basis. I want to know something about these communities. I want to know, what are you proud of? What would attract me to come back to? If I wanted to go and see a really interesting farmer's market, where would I drive to on a Saturday? That, I was just waiting for that to be said, by the way. 
And you do have a good one, Mayor Heron. So you need to understand each other's perspective. That's a roadblock. It can be a board's focus. When board starts to focus internally, which happened by the historically in the days when I was on a regional board, it, to me it's sad when all of the discussions around are, do we have the right administration? If that's the issue, you're not, talking, you're not looking outward to say, are we serving our clientele? Board members not united in all this focus on internal management rather than good governance. The outcome should be best interests of the region. We should value the mayor, councillor, CAO, EMRB relationship. I think, you know, if you can come to the table and be genuinely interested in seeing each other, you've got a first class organization. If you can come to your board table or your council table back home and you're absolutely interested in what each other has to say, regardless of the fact that we don't agree fundamentally on particular issues, I think you've got the makings of a good organization. You don't have to be unanimous. I think good governance is never unanimous. I think good governance says we allow people to speak up we allow people to express a point of view, and at the end of it, you might come together in a consensus model around what do we believe is important. In terms of good board governance, it will reflect members committed to the mandate of the region. It will reflect members who believe in your own regional goals, members respecting the board roles and treating them seriously, that you're not walking into a board meeting at the last minute uh, looking at your agenda package and saying, oh yeah, I'm a such... I'm on such and such a committee, I probably should be looking at what I need to talk about today. In the old days, we would see people who did that because they would carry their brown envelope in with them under their arm, and then they'd start to open it when they got to the meeting. Now, electronically, you can have people that open it on their, on their drive, and then they take a, a quick peek at it, they scan down it, they think, yeah, I know all about that, and they go off to a meeting. I think it's absolutely atrocious, by the way, people who are not fundamentally prepared. You've hired quality people to put material together, and you don't have the time or the energy or the authenticity uh, to sit down and say, my job is to review this so I can help make good corporate decisions. Uh, that, to me, is, uh, can be very sad. Members sharing in the workload, members maintaining confidences, and members saying that regardless of whether I like or dislike, I recognize that if we win, we win as a group. We're not looking at trying to win individually. In terms of board roles, and again, I'll just single out a couple of the significant ones. I think this whole issue of being the eyes and ears and voice of the region, if, we, if I can go to a meeting and hear uh, the Mayor Spruce Grove speak well of what's happening in Fort Saskatchewan or what's happening in Beaumont, I think the, the, your challenge is a whole lot less than what it was originally. If I can hear people talk about the fact that they visited on the weekend to the parade day in such and such a community and they enjoyed their time and they enjoyed the camaraderie and the fellowship in Morinville being offered today by Mayor Borsma, I just think that all of that bodes well for the future of a region. What doesn't bode well is this whole notion of putting up our Berlin Wall around our own communities and looking only inwardly. That doesn't help any of us. You get good ideas when you travel across this country. You focus on what other people are doing, what other municipalities are doing. That's a good part of building a regional perspective rather than building an internal anal looking perspective which doesn't get you anywhere uh, other than a focus on detail. I don't think that that's particularly healthy locally. I don't think it's healthy from a regional perspective either. You need to understand the legislative umbrella obviously. You need to understand what your legislation says I've just been retained by the government to do an inspection of another municipality in this province, and one of the things that I look at is how well do they adhere to the legislation that is supposed to impact all of us. That's well, interesting. I mean, that's a fairly easy starting point. Now, does the mayor do what the mayor is expected to do according to legislation? Uh, does council stick to its roles? Uh, are decisions made in the council chambers, or are they made outside? Well, the same thing applies here. Are you following the roles that you're expected to follow as a, as a board? Are you following good board governance policy? Are you working together to support one another? Are you listening carefully to what each other says? Uh, are you supporting the chair of the board wherever you go? Are you making sure that the board gets a good reception at your chambers when they come around to make regular visits? All of that's a reflection in my mind about whether or not boards are functioning as they ought to be in, be, in terms of being accountable for their behavior. 
Your role as leaders on the board, the MRB is a distinct entity. When you're at this table as a board member, you represent the best interests of the board. And I said to people, it's like walking into a room and you're wearing your city hat or your town hat or your county hat. You take that off and you drop it at the door. And then you walk into the room and you put on a hat that says regional board member. And you take this perspective that says, my job now is to see beyond. And it's a challenge. My job is to think what's in the best interest of our region. That's the challenge of being a regional board member. And it's not a simple one because you're thinking to yourself, what got me to the dance and what brought me to the dance is the folks back home that elected me as mayor. Now I'm asked to set aside that particular individual perspective and look at this from a much broader regional perspective. That's a huge challenge. I don't want to be anybody in this room that has that role at a board table. You're asked to look broader than yourself. You're asked to set aside all the stuff that you campaigned on, all the particular single issues at the community level and to take a broader regional level because you believe it's in the best interest of the region as a whole. I think that's fundamental to whether or not you're gonna be successful at the end of the day. Board members have to act in the best interest of the overall body. You gotta reflect the best the region has to offer. You need to understand that there is a reality to role distinctions. And that role is a, a distinction includes a distinction around board table, but it also includes the distinction between board members uh, and your CEO, board members and the regional CAOs. I met with some of them and you know, they're committed to helping. They're giving free service in many ways and I know they're taking time from their own tasks to donate it into the region to say, we're here to try to make the region better. And I think you've got absolute quality CAOs around the region that have been participating together. I've seen it happen at a regional table uh, with Karen chairing a, a regional meeting and people there that are trying to participate and add value. To me, that's quality service uh, by some of your own people. You need to understand the reality of role distinctions. And then you come to this whole issue of who does one serve. And Interestingly enough, if I, look at an, if I look far enough into the materials that I've written, some of them go back quite a ways, and in this case, 17 years, I wrote an article called The Representation Riddle, Got Conflicting Demands on a Municipal Councillor. It's still a good article. I've re recently reread it. I wrote it with a couple of professors, uh, David Siegel and, and Professor Tyndall, both of whom have written extensively and are well-qualified people. It's interesting, the challenge of being, in their case, a, a, a town councillor versus a regional councillor, in your case being a, a particular local community mayor versus that of being a regional board member. Some very basic fundamental principles can be found when you look up the history of regional governance across Canada. This whole principle of who does one serve really talks about are people leaders of a community or are they instructed delegates? And so the leader concept is one that elected officials are supposed to listen carefully to the electorate, but feel in the final analysis they have an obligation to follow their own conscience and judgment. A leader will face challenges where the clear interests of a larger regional body conflict with those of the local jurisdiction. Such a leader would always support the interests of the broader jurisdiction, even when those conflicted with their local interests. That's a leader style of governance. An instructed delegate sees their role as trying to exactly reflect what they've been told to say when they go off to the regional board meeting. It's a significantly different perspective. They're asked to comment on what they feel that their council wants regardless of their personal views, regardless of what they hear at the table, regardless of what they think is in the best interest of the region, and they're therefore reluctant to think about anything other than what they were told to vote on when they left home. You know, it's a completely different style of governance that I think is not gonna serve this region well if you have those kind of folks at the table. You need leaders at the table, people that are prepared to say, Regardless of something that I see locally, if I'm looking at it from a regional perspective, uh, am I looking at it from the right eyes as a regional board member, what's in the best interest of all of us because surely what's in the best interest of all of us is gonna trickle down to the rest of us at the same time. Is this particular project, this particular decision gonna serve me tomorrow? No, but maybe the day after that it does. And that's somebody that comes at this from a leader point of view rather than being an instructed delegate. Some of this is based on a fellow by the name of Edmund Burke. 
And again, you can look this up, and I think this material is made available to you, but Edmund Burke was an 18th century British statesman and political philosopher, and he said that the, the individual should look at their, not only their wishes, he says the wishes of the community should have a great weight with him, their opinion high respect, their business unremitted attention. It is his duty to sacrifice his repose, his pleasures, his satisfaction to theirs, to prefer their interests to his own. But his unbiased opinion, his mature judgment, his enlightened conscience, he ought not to sacrifice to you, to any person, to any set of people living. These he does not derive from your pleasure, nor from the law, nor from the Constitution. They are trust from providence, for the abuse of which he is deeply answerable. It's an interesting perspective, but written into law, and it's what guides this whole law of what's a fiduciary duty uh, to a particular organization. So you talk about who does one serve, you go back to the statements by Edmund Burke, you look at Burke's views, which I think have really been served well over the time, and say, uh, do they apply to us? And the answer is they do, full bore. They apply to you as a regional board table. And I told this once before at a regional board meeting with the MRB, but I'll say this again. There's a story, perhaps apocryphal, of the wily politician who, when asked his position on a particularly controversial local issue, responded as follows. Well, some of my friends are very much in favor of this matter. Some of my friends are strongly opposed, but I stand with my friends. That's somebody that's trying to walk down the middle of the road and not uh, be impacted, but as Margaret Thatcher once said, the problem with standing in the middle of the road is you get hit from both sides, and that will often happen when you're trying to dance as opposed to take a particularly principled stance. Common law concept of fiduciary duty holds that those in a position of trust must act honestly and in good faith with a view to the best interests of the body on which they serve. They must act in the best interests of the body as a whole and not with a view to the interests of a particular group. Fiduciary duty requires mayors or councillors when serving on a board to act in the best interests of that board. And by the way, this applies, these principles. If you're coming from a local council to serve on your library board, same principle applies. Do I try to understand what's in the best interests of that board at home? But what do I do when I come into the council chambers? Then you're putting on your mayor's hat. It's a different perspective. Building blocks we talked about, uh, we, and I had a couple of really good discussions with uh, both Karen and Cindy and Bill Choi and others, but you know, you're past this, are we in or are we out? Uh, to me, that's by the by, we've gone past that point. Uh, the model may not be perfect, there may be growing pains, but people are starting to understand, as we heard today, the real value of belonging to a region. Foundational plans are completed, more members are coming to your table prepared, Greater dialogue, improved understanding of the diverse perspectives are happening. CAO relationships have been developed. They're a good, useful support system. I commented on that earlier. Your solid committee structure, administration, updated plans, governance policies, governance mechanisms. And the power of thoughtfulness and reflection. EMRB is your instrument for good in the region. Whether or not it is depends on you and your ability to govern wisely, pragmatically, Reality suggests that this is a region. History says it's not always been easy to govern. Each community, each sub-region must see the region through a, different, a, a distinct lens, sometimes differently. Mandate is intentionally broad, and key issues will not be viewed in isolation. Like municipalities, these issues are all interrelated. I'm going to move past a couple of these. Focus on value added. I'm going to come to the... Next page, which is some summary reflections. It's a great quote that says, we live in an age of transition, but that's what Adams might have said to Eve on their way to the garden, uh, and ever since we've been living in an age of transition. Contrary to popular belief, I wasn't around when oil was struck back in Leduc County in 1947. I was close, but I wasn't there. But I have seen a lot of changes since, which in thinking about, they helped me lead to the present day, possibly the future, I recall waking up in the city of Edmonton's West End, 151st Street, 99th Avenue, and looking and playing at the gumbo 
uh, the mud that nobody could remove from their boots without great effort by the time you finished playing. This was a tough area to live in and a tough area to walk in. I went to school six blocks away, which no longer exists. It was replaced by a college which no longer exists. In fact, the, to the town no longer exists because we annexed Edmonton in 1964, or perhaps it was the reverse. Edmonton, as you know, in 64, grew immeasurably by annexing both Jasper Place and the then town of Beverly. Jasper Place being at the time the largest community other than cities in Canada. I remember back in those days delivering newspapers in the West End along the McKinnon Ravine, home to the most expensive walkway in the region, because the underground piping was built there to allow construction of a freeway which doesn't exist. I became mayor of a town in, it, in the region in 1977, which needed water services in order to grow, but no one agreed that the tap from Edmonton should be turned on. The region was in turmoil as most communities saw their hopes and dreams stymied due to the absence of an assured and effective, uh, cost-effective water and sewage system. Multitude of meetings and fractious conversations later, we had a provincial government uh, then led by a youngish lawyer elected in 1971 by the name of Peter Lougheed, who listened to the argument, saw that growth was not going to happen, and certainly not in a planned way without provincial funding, provincial leadership. These were all kinds of meetings that went on, a lot of tension in the rooms. This was not easy times. Each of the sub-regional communities were affected. All of us were at the table, many meetings at government house. Many could see what was needed. Few could agree on how and who would have what roles in the overall scheme of things. Regional structure were needed. Arguments arose over who would have how many seats. I don't know how many of you remember the issue around the Edmonton Regional Planning Commission where Edmonton was accorded nine seats, everybody else won. I made the argument that that meant that Edmonton had won because they typically voted 5-4 on most issues, so it was a one vote. But anyway, not everybody got my sense of humor, I don't think. Would we go with a regional water and later sewage board or would we go with one larger entity? How much would we have to pay? How far would the line extend around Edmonton, which, as you know, now I think goes out to Lloyd Minster. Can you imagine the discussions wondering whether or not we would get a line to Spruce Grove and we've now got a line out as far as Lloyd Minster out of the same system? None of that would have happened had the province in those days not as been as generous-hearted as they were, and I say that in credit to the province. We didn't have the money. None of us had. Uh, but the province stepped up to the plate because they had the resources at least then to do so, and the vision then to do so. Structures were developed, city and province agreed on funding, regional communities benefited. There were average people at the table, some were quite young. I started at the age of 29, I mean I was probably at this table by the age of 30. Likely impatient, likely immature, which would have been me. There were other elected leaders like Les Miller, Lawrence Decor, Warren Thomas, Iris Evans, Muriel Abdurman, Reg Koch, William Letty, Oscar Clack, Norm Bittner, Fred Roloff, leaders of Devon, leaders of Beaumont, all of us at the table in a variety of mixtures of age from very young to considerably older, then we were all there fighting for our own individual community. It made for a very interesting time. There were intermunicipal arguments around annexation, perceived funding grabs around the issue of the International Airport, the issue of Refinery Row, which was very much on the table, Joint revenue sharing was a topic, which the topic of which had not been known before it came, came up during these discussions. So what's changed? Well, the government finally said enough was enough, proclaimed the law into law, the fact that cooperation wasn't necessarily only a good, good concept, it was also essential. It created the EMRB, appointed under Section 708.4, Pursuant to the regulation, representatives were expected to represent the perspectives of their municipality, but to have a duty to act in the best interests of the board. How can you do both? How can you focus on your own municipality and on your own region at the same time? Focus on a very narrow perspective was limited by your borders, still committed to what all saw as the region to survive. So what's the overall core message? These issues took leadership and vision. They would not have been resolved without leaders who could see beyond, the person that could see down the road. These issues required a spirit of compromise which was, to be candid, often in short supply, not easily found. We need that at least today. We have a host of good, generally younger leaders, 
We have goodwill evident at the table. We know that there will be difficulties because you're embarking on a brand new thing. And as Machiavelli said, there's nothing more difficult in life than to be in charge of establishing a new order. You need to serve the public will. What's the public will? I've cited this before, but there's a great quote by Walter Lippmann, American author, who said, the public will is what leaders will choose if they saw clearly, thought rationally, and acted benevolently. That's the public will. We should all be so fortunate as to serve some of that. So the where to from here, quo vadis. Reflect from time to time on the past challenges. Where have we been as a region? Where did this start? What steps did we go through? They help you see progress even when the times are quite difficult. You recognize that some folks will never get past what's in this for me, for my community. If they could see broadly, they'd see it. If you look parochially, you won't. You need to reach beyond to see a more positive horizon and then some, you need to represent us all and you need to resist the temptation to think small, which confronts again all of us. I'm gonna leave you with a couple examples. Not in my notes, a couple examples as I listen to the speakers today. One's the example of uh, Wanham, Alberta, which is, most people would not be able to find it on a map. It's up in the Peace River District, very small community. They knew that they needed a recreation facility, but they didn't have the money to do anything about it. The recreation committee was stymied in its efforts. What are we gonna do? We can't fight, get the funding for this recreation complex that we need, an arena ice, indoor ice surface. But they realized that the local ag society had funding from the province each year, $50,000 grant. And so they went to the ag society and they said, we need funding for this new arena. And after much cajoling and coercing back and forth, they finally got the Ag Society to agree to loan them the 50,000 to get the project underway. Well, the project got underway, the project got built, and ironically, a, a few months later, there was a meeting in the same recreation complex in the Agra room, and the, the recreation committee was sitting there talking about, isn't this sad, you know, we've got uh, we're doing all we can to do our fundraising. We're doing bake sales and library book sales and a whole bunch of other sales. And we're trying to raise money to pay back the Egg Society, but they're always on our case. You can't bump into them without getting hammered away about why don't we pay them back. Anyway, that discussion went on around the table for a fair while. And an hour later, they finished. And ironically, within five minutes, the next meeting was held at the same room and it was the Ag Society. And the Ag Society got together and they said, isn't this sad that the Arena Committee had borrowed those funds from us, owe us the 50,000 bucks, haven't done anything, I don't think, other than the odd bake, bake sale to get us paid back, and we're waiting for the 50,000. And it was again a discussion around the table for about an hour. Now the meeting ended. Somebody observed that between the first meeting and the second meeting, nobody came and nobody left. It was the same audience. They just changed hats. The president became the secretary treasurer and so on. It was the same audience, the same group. Somebody said we need to change what we're doing and realize we could actually do more of this if we work together. And they formed something called COCO, the, Commun the, the Committee of Cooperating Organizations. And they ended up having the Wanham Days uh, horse polling contest drew all kinds of people. They had the zone contest, horse pulling, drew all kinds of people. The provincial contest, another huge load of people, more horses than they had people in the community. They ended up doing the national competition in Wanham and the international competition all in Wanham. Why? Because they put their resources together and quit looking internally at each other instead of looking up beyond and saying what's beyond. The same thing could be said in the community on Vancouver Island that was going broke had nothing in terms of perspective ahead of it. Uh, everything was bleak. Uh, businesses were being closed. Stores were being boarded up. And finally, a school teacher said, you know those stores that are bo boarded up? Why don't we at least paint them? We'll make them look lively. And so they commissioned students with the permission of the business owners, and they painted all these boards. And eventually, some real nice pictures, similar to Stony Plains murals, came about. Somebody noticed that there was a bus coming down the road from Victoria. It stopped at the front gate, and everybody got out and took pictures of these murals. 
They then got back on the bus and drove away. This happened for a, little, a short period of time, and one of the businesses that used to be there thought, you know something, I'm gonna reopen my business, and they did. And somebody else thought, you'd be great if we had a women's shoe store because every wife like mine stops to look at shoes. And so they opened a shoe store and that got everybody off the bus and buying things. And somebody else opened the ice cream store and lo and behold, people were buying the ice cream cones. What happened is the whole community turned around because they looked beyond. And that was the community of Shemanus in BC, still apparent today. The question to me is when I'm listening to this group today is do we see do we really see what we have? When you travel as much as I do, or as much as uh, Doug Griffith does, you get a chance to see a whole other slice of Canada, and North America, and the world, and you think to yourself when you get back home, I wonder if one of our problems is that we don't see well. And I think about that fairly frequently. Do, do we understand what we have here? My wife and I have an apartment in Abbotsford. We were supposed to be going on Sunday. I think it's now off for a week or two. But in any case, we go out there and enjoy the time. But we look at each other and say, do you want to go into Vancouver? No. Why not? Regional traffic. You have to leave by 2.30 to get home by 6. Do we really want to do that? No. Do we want to go out to somewhere else? No, we kind of like it here. Why is that? Because we like our surroundings. Can you, should we go back home? Yeah, I really enjoy being home. And here we are back home in the 30 below, and I'm not talking about racing out to Abbotsford. Why? Because I like home. I like the community. I like the good leadership that we've just elected. I like the regional leadership that we have through Mr. Gamble and Mr. Choi and their councils. Our church prays for them every Sunday by name. I think that's impressive. I think that's important. I think it's important that all of us reflect on what do we have here and how do we maximize what's here. You do that at your own tables, I understand that, and I think that's wonderful in terms of local democracy. The question is, are you capable of doing that on a broader scale? Are you capable of looking beyond? And I'll just close with one last thought, and that's the example of John Landy. I've used this before, but it's such a good concept most people don't know the name John Landy, but if I said Roger Bannister, they'd perk up because they know that name, and they think he's the guy that broke the first four-minute mile. That was a huge mark in 1954. Nobody had broken the four-minute mile, but Roger Bannister did, and he was a hero around the world. Well, these two guys were going to be slated to run against each other at the British Empire Games, which was then called, now Commonwealth Games, in Vancouver's Empire Stadium. 1954, they raced against each other. But what had happened between Bannister winning and breaking the mile and that event had been John Landy broke Roger Bannister's record. So now you've got the two fastest milers in the world going head to head. There's a great classic picture of them coming around the last turn in the quarter miles, uh, four of those that you run for the mile, and the last turn coming at the final 300 meters to home, and a picture of John Landy who's leading. But for some reason, he's in the second lane. And you got to know when you're running a mile or 1,500 nowadays, you get the inside lane on two principles. One is the shortest distance, and number two, nobody can pass you on the left. Well, Landy was in the second lane, and as he's racing for the finish line, he's looking over his left shoulder because he can hear the footsteps, thinking Bannister's right there. Well, he was. He passed him on the right shoulder and beat him by 0.7 of a second. It's a question you see of where are you looking. Landy's looking behind, which we ought to do every now and again in the rearview mirror. You ought to look behind to see what's there. I didn't, and I ran it to the only post in Switzerland. But in any case, it's when you're leaving here, you're looking at a mirror, that's, a windshield that looks like this, and you're saying, what's ahead of me? And the answer is, it's the future, folks. That's what's ahead of all of us as communities around this region. The future has been entrusted to you. I want to know that you folks step up to the plate, that you do the absolute best you can, not only locally, but you realize we live in a broader region, a broader community. I pray that God guides you, that leads you, and that you folks make good quality first-class decisions. And if that's the case, we'll all be well served. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I will now call up Mayor Choi to say some closing comments. Right, thank you, Doug, and a special thank 
Thank you to our panelists that were here earlier, Laura, Victor, Jerry, and the Grand Chief Arcand, and also to our special presentation from uh, Mr. Kaf Solt. Thank you. I hope everyone had the opportunity to uh, take some takeaways today. And remember, it's always a learning process. We're not going to get it right the first time, but we'll continue to work at it to get to the right place. Okay. Uh, regional prosperity is really high for us. That's how we're going to succeed. Right? Together, we can leverage all our strengths. We saw the, the reality is each municipality, we have different strengths, different weaknesses. We need to work those together to unlock our future. Right? This is our region. Right? This is our future. We are the artists of this masterpiece. And if your political careers don't go right, you can, in 20 years, you can sell an NFT for a billion dollars. So make sure you take some good pictures. On behalf of the board, I just want to make sure we thank our, our staff, especially Cindy, Barb, and Chelsea for doing all the heavy lifting, so thank you. And I just want to also bring uh, regrets from our CEO, Karen Wechuk. Uh She is sick. She caught uh, COVID a few days ago, and so she's dealing with it. But uh, we wish her well. And if you have her um, cell phone number, send her a text, because it's, it's, it's also her birthday. So let's flood her line with that. Yes. And definitely want to thank uh, Mayor Brosma for, for, for hosting us. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, come out here to have coffee with the mayor. And he drove me around, and he, I saw how he interacted with uh, quite a few of his uh, residents. So all I can say is that he's a half-decent guy. I don't know what, he, what the other half is yet, but he is still half-decent. And thank you to Morning Mill Council. Can you stand up, please? Just want to give you guys recognition for, for hosting us. Thank you. And now I'll let you know where they're, where they're sitting. They're handing out these lovely Morningville socks. So please go over there and get us a pair of socks from them. <laughs> and with that, thank you very much for your time. I look forward to building a strong region with everyone. Take care. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mayor Choi. Thank you, George, for an amazing presentation. Thank you very much to all of the panelists and everyone who helped make this day amazing. I know I'd also like to say thank you to the administration, um, to Karen, to Cindy. To I had lunch with a bunch of the team, and they're absolutely remarkable. It just reminds me from my days in government that we're only as good as the, the people that make us look good. And especially thank you to all the elected officials for your participation and making this region we live in absolutely amazing. There is a cash bar out there, and there are cups on the table full of, full of suckers and candy and stuff. They are yours to take. Um, as you have a drink and celebrate and socialize, please make sure you drive home safe and everyone have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.